Hey there, heroes. Welcome back to the channel. It's your pal, Kronos. Now, you've all been asking for this one, a mind-bending twist on our beloved Deku. What if he had light powers? I've got the popcorn ready, and I know you do too because today, we're diving deep into. What if Deku had light powers? The movie final part. And to all you out there, if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and let's brighten up this channel with some serious light power. Now, let the adventure begin. Mountain Training Ground Day 2 Grand Torino kept his eyes on the form of Izuku who was in a meditative position. It was today morning that Izuku's quirk finally synchronized, leading to some changes. It seemed as though he retained the ability to use them separately, much like Todoroki's quirk. And when using them together Izuku is capable of boosting his power immensely. While still in his trial phase there was great progress. When Izuku launched one of his light swords at a tree by using just his magic, the sword was a translucent gold and only cut halfway through the tree. When he used his quirk and synchronicity, the sword was a solid gold and the power it exuded was staggering. And it cut through two trees before stopping after it cut halfway through a rock. But there were drawbacks. It seemed as though his overall control was shot to hell. He was back to 10% of one for all which of course was stronger than his previous 18%, but the strain on his body had caused him to relearn the basics. Izuku had explained that when using both his ether and one for all together it felt as though he was driving with the Nas on every time. They had also found that his aura changed, the passive effect of his presence now exuded a peace and calm along with a sense of power. It also seemed his magic became much denser as even though his control was shot to hell Izuku was capable of launching devastating attacks that seemed far more potent than before. There were telltale signs of his powers though, like when he uses just his ether eye it was a faint glow in his eyes, but with one for all, his eyes shift to a mystifying gold. Then was his physical powers, when using just one for all his body seemed to have specks of green lightning, but together it was golden lightning. Gran Torino remembered Izuka's face when he found that he had to retrain to get his majestic attire under control. The majestic attire was Izuka's link to using both his magic and one for all simultaneously for supercharging both physical and magic attacks. While he was able to enter, Guardian, mode easily enough there were problems holding back. The eyes were what made the form so intimidating. The golden eyes would release an otherworldly gold that seemed to strike fear into his enemies. A bright glow from the center made Gran Torino pause in his assessment. It seems he finally got it under wraps. He thought as he saw Izuka float above the ground a faint golden aura coating his entire body. While it wasn't perfect as seen from the look of intense concentration and the sweat forming on his head there was progress. Izuka opened his eyes while trying to control his position in air. This was the first major breakthrough as prior to this he always shot up and then fell face down or he would simply waste all his energy glowing like a flashlight. He tried to stand on air as he got out of the meditation pose. Gran Torino walked up to him and looked on as he stared to move a bit to and fro in the air. Izuka's learning curve never ceased to amaze him. It was downright ridiculous most of the times. But considering his future, it was good he possessed such potential. He thought back to the fights he had in his prime where crime was found in every nook and corner. But even still... It was Izuka's destiny to fight all for one. Izuka dropped to the floor, his black sleeveless body armor stuck to his body and his face was covered in sweat. While he was capable of small-scale flight, at least he hoped he was, the amount of energy lost was too much. He thought about how much of progress he would have to make to hold a candle to all might. While Gran Torino said that he would become stronger, it wasn't fast enough for him. Torino-sensei, how did Tashinori-sensei get so strong? I mean, while potentially I could be stronger than him. I'm still a novice at controlling my power. Even my 10% strains my body to the maximum. Without my healing I would have probably been crippled. Gran Torino was quiet. He had seen the development in the boy. But it seems as though he still had self-doubt. But then again what was the aim Izuku had to get stronger? Before I answer that question Izuku, I ask this. Why do you want to get stronger? Where is it do you think true strength comes from? Izuka paused at that. Well, I want to become stronger so that Tashinori Sensei can rest easy. I mean Sensei still tries so hard even through his injury. I've been working in a hospital long enough to understand the repercussions for pushing his body to his limits, 
and so I've been working hard to up my healing arts so that I could heal him. But the problem is that I can't regrow entire organs, the slightest mistake and I may actually make it worse. Gran Torino's expression was one of understanding, he had always wondered what Izuka worked on whenever both of them retire for the day after training even before the sports festival. And true strength. I'm not really sure, I guess it's from hard work. Gran Torino remembered his past with the seventh successor and Tashinori. No. True strength. It comes from a desire. And as for your aims, let me tell you about the seventh successor to one for all, Tashinori's predecessor. Shimura Nana. She was a close friend of mine. It her who gave Tashinori. One for all. As well as some advice that he still lives by. When you have to save someone, they're usually in a scary situation. A true hero saves not only their lives, but also their spirits. That's what I believe. So no matter how scary things get, give him a smile, as if to say, I'm a-okay. The people in this world who can smile are always the strongest. But that's not the only thing. Izuku, you didn't just inherit the power of one for all. You inherited an ideal. You inherited the ideals of eight people, all of which stems from the need to protect. And as for true strength, well, that's actually something you subconsciously know the answer to. It's an answer that surprises everyone and you showed it at the USJ and during the entrance exam. When people want to protect something truly precious to them, they truly can become as strong as they need to be. The truest aspect of a hero, the spirit of self-sacrifice. You Azuka have both in spades, that is why we trust you inexplicably. And it's not just me and Tashinori I'm talking about, even the staff and the students trust you. Izuku's eyes teared up at the honest praise he received from Gran Torino. He thought back to the USJ incident, the power he unleashed to protect them, even though it burned his very skin. It helped him save everyone. Gran Torino saw in Izuku's eyes, the missing piece was finally in place. With this Izuku will truly become strong. He walked away to the cabin. From the corner of his eyes he saw that Izuku was now floating above the ground, a bit unsteady but that the determination in his eyes were clear to him with Ida. Ida walked around the city of Hosa with the Prohero Manual. It was relatively quiet, nothing worth mentioning. But Ida knew that Stain would be back. Each time Stain had appeared there was at least four attacks. And so the next time he came, Ida would deliver justice with his own two fists. With Tashinori. Tashinori sighed as he reached the limit of one for all for the day. It was a boon that he could use his hero form for at least three hours. But the consequences were still visible. He wouldn't be able to keep this up for long. The fleeting embers of one for all were going out. Soon the era of all might would come to an end. He only hoped that Izuka would be strong enough to hold the weight of being his successor. He took out his cell phone. He had to swallow his pride. And so he called his former sidekick. Time skip fifth day training ground. Izuka let out a deep breath as the guardian attire faded away from sight. He had finally made sure that he previous powers and abilities were under control. It would be of no use if he couldn't use them without repercussions. The only new things he learnt was flight, some advanced healing and two-three attacks as well as tactics to use his powers. He stared at his arm as he channeled his combined quirk towards it. His hand was enveloped in a solid gold layer of energy. Partial activation of his guardian attire worked wonders but the control in that department was shoddy. He was thankful that he had this much time to get back into shape and that Ida hadn't done anything stupid, yet. He sighed as he thought about Ida. He knew why he chose to be in Hosu. He shared the details with Gran Torino, but without proof they couldn't drag him away. But seeing as there were now news reports and the fact that Ida responded to his messages calmed him down. He had also found a lot about Gran Torino. I'm altering his character a bit. He was a hero when the world had a staggering crime rate and with villains in every corner. He had taught Izuka not just the way in which his power could be used, he taught Izuka the ideals which he and Nana Shimura lived by. Though they differed they both had the same end game. To be a hero one can depend on. If anyone has the right to be called a hero, it's not the one who took up the blade. It's not the one who raised his shield, nor the one who healed the wounded. Only one who truly risks his life may be called a hero. That was just one of the things that stuck with Izuku during his time with Gran Torino. He felt that Gran Torino had helped shape him to become a hero. An actual hero. Izuku walked to center of the training ground and started going through his katas. He had learned them during his time in his karate club. 
and now Gran Torino had helped him further refine it to suit it to his fighting style. His mind focused into his reserves of energy, slowly letting a trickle seep into his body he could feel the change. His senses becoming sharper, his strikes becoming faster, stronger, and then finally letting a line of energy connect to link his body to his reserves he crouched, after which he built up energy, slowly golden fumes of energy began to wrap around Izuka's frame, and then he shot to the sky. The feeling of the air rush against his face was quickly becoming one of Izuka's favorites, he reached a height wherein he floated there stationary, he let his ether have free reign, he could feel the link with life. He had found his energy had a link with all of life, even the air he breathed, he ground he walked on. He had never delved into the possibilities, but he had researched, he had researched everything about quirks, and yet none of them came close to the complexity of his. His time at the hospital as an intern had given him access to research his quirk, even document it, the doctor was glad to assist him. Even though his research with quirks came to a dead end, he turned to lore, and there he found a legend. The celestial element. There was not much data to go on, mere myths and rumors of its capabilities was all Azuka had to go on. He had experimented with his powers while not much of fruit was received he still had time to continue, he slowly let his body drift to the breeze slowly basking in feeling of freedom. Finally, he dived to the ground speeding past the birds and just before he crashed to the ground he flipped to his feet and ether flowed out of his being and let his descent slow down to a mere fraction of what it was before. In the cabin a few minutes before, Gran Torino watched with a small smile playing on his face as Azuka took to the air, the kid was beyond extraordinary. A sponge that could soak in information and at the same time humble and kind. Izuka was a special kid, a few of the good souls that truly wanted to better the world yet asked nothing in return. It was a character that he felt from staying with Izuka the past few days, he had poured as much knowledge into Izuka as he could, while they had met and trained before they had never been more than acquaintances but now, he could feel the bond he had with the child. One he would give his to protect, Izuka much like his quirk was a light that was worth protecting and he would do so to the best of his abilities to help Izuku. As Izuka made his flashy descent, Gran Torino walked out of the cabin and made his way to Izuku. Izuka's quirk had always left him flabbergasted, the diversity, the power of it stretched the boundaries of impossible. He knew that with time Izuka would become more proficient and more powerful, he had hoped that it would be enough. He hoped that it would deter any crime to take place, even though he knew it was just a fool's dream. And so he had made up his mind to give Izuku all the tools for his journey in life. League of Villains Shirigaraki nursed his partially healed wounds he stared at the screen which was replaying the clash between the two prodigies that are Izuku and Todoroki. He couldn't believe the amount of power being thrown around in the stadium, it annoyed him to no end. While he was recuperating from his wounds and planning to kill the boss, his enemies were grinding and getting stronger. He scratched his neck, to think that his most powerful Numa was captured by the heroes and he wasn't even able to injure All Might. His thoughts were interrupted by the voice of his sensei. You should not worry about them for now, they are all but minor inconveniences at most. Except that one child Midoriya Izuku, he is capable of many feats that interests me. I am almost certain that he will be the one you shall face in the end Shirigaraki. So, what shall you do? Shirigaraki stared at the static image of Izuku in his, guardian attire. Meteor smash! He felt anger raise at what had happened at the USJ, that Brad had ruined his plan to win against All Might. But he would deal with the pest soon enough, after all he had sent Kurojiri to fetch the best person for the job. He felt the telltale sound of Kurojiri's warp, Shirigaraki turned his head to see the person who accompanied Kurojiri. The great senpai, of all criminals stain. Welcome to humble abode of the League of Villains, Hero Killer Stain. I hope our dealings will go off without a hitch. Stain looked at the person who spoke. So you're the people who broke into you, eh? Yes, we would like you to join us, and help us reform the world in our image. And silence some pests while at it. Shirigaraki said as he showed a picture of Class 1A and a picture of just Izuku at the front. Stain scared as he reached for his swords. I knew it was ill-advised to be interested. You just want me to partake in your temper tantrums. And you, he pointed at Shirigaraki, are the type of people I hate the most. Your bloodlust has no cause. Kurojiri discreetly asked Sensei on their next move as the meeting was about to go south, but Sensei simply told him to let the scene proceed. 
back with Izuku. Izuku made final adjustments on his hero costume. His body armor was a tight fit after the intense regiment he had been following ever since the USJ. His cloak fluttered past him as he stood up. Gran Torino had decided that it would be best if he gained some experience fighting villains, and so they decided to go to Shibuya. He received word from Todoroki that he and Endeavor would arrive at Hosa today, and he had promised to check up on Ida. Both of them exited the training ground with little difficulty considering their physical capabilities. They reached the train station and boarded a train heading to their designated location. Both Gran Torino and Izuka talked about the reason for his practical experience that he'd get with encounters with villains, before the train suddenly stopped and an announcement came. Izuka was listening to the announcement when suddenly he felt bogies come in within his passive sensory field. Which was proven true as the walls of the train compartment immediately broke open as a hero crashed through and a Numa accompanied him. Gran Torino wasted no time a ring as he crashed into the Numa sending him flying. Izuka rushed to the downed hero and started to heal him. He thought back to the Numa lookalike, which meant that if it possessed even a fraction of the power the one at the USJ had, this city was he tried to figure out where they were, an announcement came in telling them they were at Hosu. But why would a Numa appear here, especially since All Might was still at UA? Then it hit him, hard. Stain SHIT. As soon as he had healed the hero to his best he informed the policeman of the hero's condition and immediately expanded his sensory field it stretched around and gave him the conditions of his fellow passengers. After noting that everything was alright Izuku immediately focused ether to augment his body for flight and immediately shot off through the opening made by the Numu ignoring the protests of the officer. Izuku rushed towards where he felt a high concentration of bloodlust. He flew down to an alley and ran towards the destruction as Anumu unlike the other was fighting with pros. He knew that he couldn't waste time here so he immediately activated Enkindu to restrain the villain. The chain sealed the Numu's movements for just a moment, but it was enough for the pros to land some devastating attacks into its form. The pros saw his form for a moment before he augmented his body with 7% OFA and blurred past them, before they could question him. He went around town searching every alleyway he could and helping heroes and civilians alike before suddenly he felt it. Izuku activated ether and fueled his sensory field to check where Ida was, and finally he found Ida's signature. But it wasn't moving and there was also a lot of bloodlust coming from there, sending a mass message of his location to everyone he activated OFA and rushed into the sight of Stain about to pierce and immobilized Ida. Not even waiting for his mind to finish processing the scene Izuku rushed forward with a full call punch that connected with the hero killer. Izuku stood in front of the immobilized Ida and let his ether scan the area, coming back with another signature which he turned to see another hero. Ida, we are gonna have a talk about recklessness later on. But I'm guessing you can't move, which means he has an immobilization quirk. Ida raised his head to look at Izuku whose cloak fluttered from the residual air wall and was looking at the injured pro. Ida felt a wave of emotions, guilt, shame, anger. Midoriya, don't get involved in this. I took up the name of Ingenium, so as to bring justice to this murderer with my own two hands. Izuku didn't bother with a reply as Stain had gotten up from the blow. Izuku rushed forward OFA flowing in tandem with Aether. He ducked an overhead swing of Stain's sword and responded with a left uppercut which partially connected with the hero killer's jaw and lifted him to the air. Izuku immediately moved out of the way of a sword and rushed to the downed hero, while sending blasts of ether to the hero killer, and announced to Ida. Ida, if revenge is called justice, then that justice breeds yet more revenge and it becomes a chain of hatred. Three pairs of eyes widened at those words, but the one who was vocal was Stain. You, you are worth keeping alive! To think one so young would show one of the truest ideals of becoming a hero, leave now Midoriya I have no quarrels with you. It is my duty to deal with these fakes that tarnish the meaning of the word hero. Izuku was confused at what the hero killer had meant by those words, but he couldn't even bother with the words of a murderer. He needed to protect both of them and buy time for backup to arrive. Izuku raised the shield of light to cover both Ida and the hero who he had deposited alongside Ida he suddenly moved out of the way where a knife just flew by. Izuku was again forced to dodge when the hero killer moved to his space. As a testament to his training Izuka forced the hero killer to part by using an explosive wave of ether. Yes, you have the power to back your ideology. You are truly worth keeping alive. But I must immobilize you, for these fakes are not worthy to live in this world. 
Stain said as he rushed towards Izuku who simply stood his ground until he jumped up to reveal a blast OF fire. Stain dodged to the side but was met with a spear of ice and had to evade backwards. He looked up to see the son of Endeavor in all his glory his fire, and ice eagerly awaiting his command. He stood side by side with Izuku guarding the injured who Izuku placed carefully behind them. Shoto then spoke. Midoriya, for things like this please make sure to send more information rather than just your location. Izuku smirked as he gave a nod to Todoroki, whom he noted was using both his fire and ice powers. How long do you think we'll have to hold him off till the pros hit the scene? And anything I should know about him? Five more minutes, watch for the swords. His quirk is what's immobilized both of them, and also he's playing with us. Stain's grin widened at Izuku's deduction, and the way Shoto acted, it seemed as though the next generation had hope. Which means that he should try even harder to remove the fakes so that they can grow unrestricted. He threw his sword faster than before bypassing both of their reflexes and in a moment, he closed the distance between him Shoto. Shoto's eyes widened at the speed displayed by the villain, just before the hero killer could lick his blood. He ignited his fire to fend him off. Izuka reacted at the same pace by trying to restrict his movements, but the hero killer seemed to be serious now as he evaded the chains with ease. Izuka scared at the fact he couldn't use his more destructive moves as either the hero killer would evade and attack him, or he would cause too much damage to surroundings which may cause loss of lives to the civilians. It was then Todoroki spoke. You don't use swords to seal movements, you use the blood as the catalyst instead. That's why you rushed in with the sword. Izuku we should avoid close combat with him until the pros arrive. Izuku agreed with the assessment, and while he wanted nothing more than to escape with the two heroes he was sure that Stain would take the opportunity to finish them off with his inhuman reaction speed. It was then that Ida spoke. P please both of why you stop this. I should be the one to defeat him. I am the one who inherited the name of Ingenium. It was Shoto who spoke while Izuka sent blasts of energy and multiple constructs of light at the villain. That's funny, I don't remember the Ingenium I saw ever make a face like that. Ida stopped struggling almost as though he was struck, while Todoroki raised a wall of ice to cut the view of the hero killer, and immediately Izuka charged a blast of ether ready to attack. As they expected, in a few moments the wall was sliced to pieces by the sword and just when Stain was about to advance he evaded the blast of ether but it grazed by his arm inciting a scream of pain as it burnt the skin. Ida thought back to all the times he had with his brother, and the final push was given by a yell from Todoroki. You want us to stop? Then stand up. Set your eyes on the man you want to be. And fight. Ingenium, a pro hero who prizes the rules and guides the people. Ida watched as Shoto released a giant spear of ice at Stain the moment he landed but it was cut through by a sword. He is my brother! Izuka launched a ball of light into the air as Shoto distracted Stain allowing the ball to explode in the sky as a flare. Why did you want to be a hero, brother? Well, it's just that I want to help anyone who needs it no matter the consequences. And since you admire me, Tenya, I guess I'm doing something right. Ingenium, Tenya could you take up that name? Ida's head was filled with these thoughts, he pushed against the imposing quirk. He saw both Izuku and Todoroki struggle against Stain as they were out of their element. Recipro burst. Ida blitzed through the opening created by Todoroki, and landed a devastating roundhouse kick on the hero killer's ribs. His engine shut down as the hero killer crashed against the wall. I'm truly sorry for getting both of you involved in my selfish desires, but while both of you are leagues above me, what he said was right. I don't deserve to be a hero, but I will not let the name of Ingenium die here. Stain nursed his ribs as didn't expect the faker to strike him, and that too with a haymaker like that. He couldn't let off now, as they knew the secret to his quirk the shine in the eyes of Midoriya and Endeavor's son gave it away. He rushed in to end this as quickly as possible not bothering to hold back. Izuku immediately responded with a volley of ether blasts each of which was evaded or sliced. A blast of flames went to strike the hero killer but that too was evaded by jumping to the air. When Stain was just a few meters away from them Izuku's body erupted with streaks of golden lightning and met the charge head on. Izuku engaged Stain in close combat before finally Izuku landed a haymaker inside the hero killer's guard but was immediately slashed in the leg. It was then that Ida stood up, his legs covered in ice, and then yelled out. Recipro extend! 
Ida's engine roared as his speed increased by multiple folds. Shockwaves formed when Ida blitzed into form against Stain who couldn't lick Izuka's blood yet with a flurry of kicks. While Stain was able to dodge the strikes barely, then the inevitable happened. A slip of his feet granted Ida the moment to capitalize on as he landed a devastating rising kick. Before he could regain his senses he immediately came face to face with Izuka midway through a punch. Meteor smash! Stain could feel the entire force of the punch spread through his body before he sent flying and crashed into a wall of ice. All three of them tensed for a counter from the hero killer, but was surprised when they found he didn't move. We must have gotten lucky and knocked him unconscious. The three of them let out a breath and Izuka bound him with Enkindu, just in case. They helped the pro up who was finally capable of moving. As they entered the main street they met up with Gran Torino, who immediately berated them for rushing into danger, but Izuka could tell it was half-hearted. As they were checked on by Endeavor's team Izuka sent out a pulse of energy to give him an idea of the situation. A sudden intrusion in his boundary field alerted him, but it was too late as he was whisked away by a flying Numu, causing the binds around Stain to fade. Izuka was about to retaliate when suddenly he saw movement and another intrusion in his sensory field. The others watched as Stain rushed past them and jumped onto the Numu who suddenly froze and then brutally stabbed it in the head. He then stood and stared at the oncoming form of Endeavor. Everyone was surprised at what had occurred but immediately went on guard as Stain spoke, his voice menacing. The phonies who have overrun society and the villains who sprinkle their power. They are my targets for the purge. All of this for a just world. As Stain turned to Endeavor who was running towards him, Stain released so much killing intent that it made Endeavor pause in his tracks and everyone else to their knees. The fakes must be killed, someone, no. I will stain myself in their blood. The word hero will be restored. The only one allowed to kill me is All Might. Immediately after those words were uttered the killing intent faded and Stain stopped moving. It was Endeavor who spoke. He, he lost consciousness. It was at that moment Izuka saw it, Stain, who struck through to his ideals even unconscious refused to fall, while the others including himself were down on the ground. This was the strength of an ideal. And so what was his? Next morning, Ida who had sustained injuries was brought to hospital. Izuku had healed both Shoto's and his own minor injuries. He attempted to heal Ida's injuries but Ida refused as he wanted this to be a reminder of when he let his anger get the better of him. Both Izuku and Shoto were told to stay the night for the doctors to run checkups on. They continued to talk about their encounter with Stain and how it was considerably different from the cannon fodder they faced at USJ. The door opened to reveal All Might, Gran Torino, and the chief of police Tsurigami. Ah, so the problem childs are awake, eh? Gran Torino grunted out. The students tried to get up but was stopped by Tsurigami, as he said that they deserve their rest, but then he continued to speak. Now, I believe I should inform you pups on what has happened after the incident, now relating to the hero killer he is undergoing treatment for multiple broken bones and burns. Then this brings me to the real reason I am here. From the beginning of the phenomenon of quirks, it was emphasized that individuals should not weaponize their quirks. When heroes emerged they adhered to the laws and morals very strictly. But you kids are not heroes yet, which means use of quirks in public is forbidden without authorization from their superiors. Meaning you kids in the Pro Heroes Manual, Gran Torino and Endeavor should be handed for impartial punishment even if the opponent was the hero killer. But if we hadn't interfered then Mr. Native would be in a body bag right now. Are you saying that we should have followed the rules and let him die? It's a hero's job to save people. SCR dash. Before Shoto could continue All Might stopped him. Young Todoroki, I understand how that sounded but please let the man finish. Yes, I understand why they call you eggs. Now, because of the incident at the USJ as well as your talents shown at the festival. Izuku, Shoto and Katsuki have been nominated as part-time apprentices of the number one hero, All Might and Golden Age hero Gran Torino. Thus you three were to meet up at Hosa City. But young Katsuki couldn't make it and a situation arose, where finally Endeavor dealt the final blow to the hero killer with your assistance. And as such you shall not be prosecuted as your principal had gained the authorization from the higher-ups. Both Izuku's and Shoto's eyes widened at the meaning they could participate in day-to-day -day heroics, without repercussions. And this team could expand based on the skills displayed by your fellow students. 
the chief said as he looked at Tenya. Well, I shall prepare for a public announcement which will hopefully go as I planned. But don't think you'll be scot-free, there will be factions which will oppose this. It is your duty to prove that this choice was the correct decision. Well, goodbye pups and thank you for your time all might sir and Gran Torino. I hope you guys liked the chapter. I didn't actually have a good idea on how to introduce the concept of teams. But hey roll with the punches right? There are gonna be problems for Izuku and his team as there will be opposition but presently considering what had happened at the USJ as well as their performance at the festival it is necessary for their potential to flourish thus the public will accept this, for now. Izuku sighed as he answered another one of his classmates' questions. With the alibi given to them by the principal they were able to escape being prosecuted by the police. When the news report came out, as they expected, there was some resistance regarding the three of them becoming apprentices of All Might and Gran Torino. Ida was also offered the choice but declined stating that he had to first live up to what he had placed as a goal for himself. But seeing as they were given facts out what happened at the USJ and the potential in them the resistance quickly died down. He turned to Katsuki who was answering questions like him and Shoto. Katsuki was understandably angry when he found that he had missed the fight with Stain. He had proceeded to wreak havoc at a training field all while cursing jeans and threads. They had spent another week on the streets with all might to show the public of the new strategy by busting small crimes and helping civilians. They had made a schedule where they are to report for duty with all might every weekend. Of course this cut into their schedules but no one complained as they understood the opportunity presented to them. They had even had joint training sessions which mostly consisted of teamwork exercises and combination attacks and tactics. Most of classmates were surprised they were taken as apprentices, but considering that were indeed more powerful than the norm as well as the frequent villain attacks they understood their position. And to Izuku's surprise no one was actually angered at the special treatment, which was what Izuku was afraid of, but instead took it as a goal to reach their level so as to not drag them down. Izuku was great fun for having such great friends, especially with what was coming up. He had been worrying about the confrontation All Might was sure to have with All for One. Izuku turned to the door as Aizawa-sensei walked in. They greeted their teacher, who immediately told them that they'll be having a test. Training Ground Omega The class entered in their hero uniforms. Izuku had received a new set which was made after Gran Torino had sent a request to the UA. He was in front of the class and by his side was Momo who was his deputy class rep. He had found that after the festival that all of his classmates had improved greatly, but also that they looked up to him, Shoto and Katsuki. Well, whenever Katsuki wasn't threatening anyone. All Might stared at Izuku who now exuded confidence which in turn raised the entire level of his class. He seemed to have his costume modeled after Nana Shimura, no doubt Gran Torino's doing. He had also found that in the past week that the three of them had a natural teamwork with each other, a bit shaky but it was there. He had built it up so that they would trust each other without fail and he was happy that there was progress. But he also wanted them to not be alienated or to be put on much of a pedestal yet. It would cause them to feel the pressure of the top position would give them. He decided it would be ideal if they interacted with their classmates more, he would have to consult Aizawa with this. Shaking away his thoughts he prepared to get the rescue training started. Now then, it has been a while since our last hero class. And I'm sure all of you have grown leaps and bounds over the past few weeks and to test that we'll have a small test. All might move slightly to show them the training ground, possessing a rather large building in the middle. The aim is for the participants to once again fight through the multitude of robots you faced against in the entrance exam. This serves to see for yourself the progress you have undoubtedly made since your introduction to the course. As they walked to the entrance of the grounds they saw the massive robot behemoths they faced time and time again. They also appeared to be offline, that is until All Might spoke. As you most surely noticed, the Zero Pointers will be patrolling the area and will automatically detect you as intruders once they are activated, although it's unwise to refer to them as Zero Pointers, as their values have been increased to five points. Many students blanched at the fact that multiple behemoths would be present in the field, while the others like Kaminari and Mina let out an excited cheer as they could use their quirks without restriction. All Might once again spoke to relay the final information the students needed to hear. It should also be brought to your notice that the robots will no longer be the small fry you had dealt with before, they have been upgraded to give you a challenge. The students looked at a passing five-pointer and noticed the improvements such as the armor looking a dark green with multiple weapons on its hull and shoulders. 
I will be at the top of the main building along with several other pros to keep an eye on you all. So be sure to show us your best, you'll begin once the sirens ring. So once again, good luck and give us your best. With those words All Might blasted off towards the middle tower leaving the students to discuss with each other. The conversations involved mostly around the idea of finding out how much better they've become along with the competitive urge to stack themselves compared to their friends. They all took their positions in a row, and around a minute later they heard the bellow of the siren. Not a second later they rushed into the soon-to-be battlefield, those with quirks that augmented their speed like Ida got a head start. Bakugo immediately demonstrated his sway to flight using explosions and bursts to a three-pointer and vanished off to find his next victim. Uraraka touched a particular one-pointer and used her quirk to throw it at a group of robots repeating so down a lane, near parallel to her Momo moved with a grace that was mesmerizing as she used a spear she had affectionately dubbed, Evil Annihilation, Google it, while it was a work in progress. It had proven to be one of her most powerful creations. Ida immediately put his head start to good use barreling through a robot in his way before augmenting his legs with a series of thrusts as it buried itself into another robot. He wasted no time as he rushed to the nearest opponent like a man possessed. Bakugo eliminated bot after bot with negligible effort, not even wasting a single movement. Each movement was calculated for causing the maximum amount of destruction, and in doing so destroying the robots in one blow. It was a small time later that he understood that he was slowly being encircled by the remaining robots. On the other side of the ground far away from any of the others was an area encased in ice. The entire world seemed to stand still as the ice captured every detail in vivid fashion. But then came the heat, bursting from the ground melting through the ice and metal as if they were made from mere paper mache. And in the middle sat Todoroki, one hand on the ground viewing the entire scene with a frown. I'm still not close. Meanwhile, Izuku had already showcased his proficiency at Ether Burst, which landed him at the top of a building allowing him to oversee most of the ground, he watched as all of his friends and allies fought against the robots. A small smile lit up on his face. I guess I'm not the only one who's gotten stronger. He closed his eyes and sent a pulse of ether showing him a rough sketch of the entire area. Without opening his eyes he stood on the ledge and dropped forward. He relished the rush of air to the face before opening his eyes and landed a devastating axe kick on a three-pointer below him. Not even wasting a moment he rushed against the nearest robot who was broken in two by a sword construct held by Izuku. He turned in a 180 arc and burst into the guard of another robot, while throwing his sword onto another oncoming robot, which immediately lodged itself in and exploded in an array of sparks. Izuku seemed to be in a deadlock with the robot in front of him until he roared as one for all spread through his veins enabling to crush the robot in front of him, and through the dust cloud Izuku raised the flow of OFA to a high and brought his arm back which had racing streaks of golden lighting. Then to everything in the immediate vicinity, Izuku blurred from sight and immediately appeared next to a robot with his arm buried inside its hull. And as if realizing the event that had occurred, Slowly the robot lifted and shot backwards as the force of the blow finally registered. Tower The rest of the pros watched on as the students fought against the invading legion of robots each of them clearly impressed with what they were seeing. They felt as though each of them had come a long way from the beginning. The principal was looking at the showcasing of power with a calculating look, same with Aizawa. Both of them breaking down each and every move to their basic components and finding out ways to improve them. All Might watched on seeing his two students and successor rack and point after point all while experimenting their limits and new moves. But he couldn't help notice the destructive force each of them are producing. He recalled how much of a problem it was back when he himself had to learn the finer points of restraint. He need to revise it in their upcoming session. He watched as Azuka continued to demolish robot after robot, each of his moves and tactics slowly shaping up with finesse and understanding. He was proud of his successor's achievements. He wondered if this was what his own teachers felt when training him. His attention was brought back when he heard the principal give the command for the five-pointers to attack the students. He was a bit against this, if only because he knew that these robots were in fact much stronger than the zero-pointers they had faced before. Training Ground The first thing that told the students that shit was about to go down was the sudden retreat of all the smaller robots as they immediately retreated once they heard an alarm blare through the multitude of speakers present throughout the city. The second being the sun blocked out by something. As they all tuned to the source of these developments, they saw a sight that would forever be engraved in their minds and memories. 
a class of three behemoths advancing their way towards what appears to be the largest cluster of students in the grounds, paying no need to the destruction caused simply by just their own movements, buildings bending and breaking down as they gave way to the giant robots. The class of twenty each from their own vantage point stared at the raw amount of destruction caused by their appearance. The speakers once again crackled to life with the sound of Principal Nisa's voice. Now, as all of you have seen, this will be the final portion of this test of ours. The robots you see before you are top of the line training machines, they are made to take in copious amounts of damage and are equipped to dish them right back. In this situation, please do what is right and also what is required, set aside all you do not need, and fight. With those words the speakers once again returned to silence, and almost immediately afterwards the behemoths that stayed still all the while during the principal's address burst to life, the shoulder opening to show multiple rockets targeting various areas, and after a short standoff, they opened fire. Izuka stared as a rocket that had been aimed way over his area. His mind quickened and began processing the new information, the world slowed to a crawl as his brain worked faster and faster creating and discarding various plans and protocols faster than a blink of an eye, finally as the missile reached the halfway point. Ether flowed in his open palm filling into the form of an intricate sphere that shone with barely restrained power. Izuka then further loaded it with more energy to the point wherein it looked as if it was merely a moment away from breaking. At this point the missile had already crossed the halfway point, and in a few more seconds would reach the level of one of the buildings and so with OFA and Ether working in tandem an eruption of golden lightning the sphere burst forward from his hands. Battle Arts, Holy Smite! It traveled at speeds far surpassing the norm and clashed directly into the missile and exploded. The resulting shockwave was omnidirectional and caused more than a few windows to break. But what surprised the Zuku was the fact that his spear was not able to punch through the missile even with him overloading it. It was then Izuka's mind flashed back to All Might's warning. It should also be brought to your notice that the robots will no longer be the small fry you had dealt with before. They have been upgraded to give you a challenge. Izuku augmented his physique with OFA and shot to the sky. He looked around and assessed the situation. It seemed as though Kaminari and Uraraka had also been able to destroy a missile as he saw multiple three-pointers floating and remains of electricity going up. He then turned his focus onto the area where the final missile was able to hit. It looked like a scene from a movie... Fire and destruction were most abundant. Hell. It seemed to be the best word to describe the scene he was looking at. Almost immediately his danger senses flared and urged him to drop down. On doing so, he saw a rubber projectile the size of an elephant pass where he had been. Turning to its origin point, he found one the giant's arm extended to his position. Putting two and two together he understood the situation. The behemoths had received a daunting few upgrades and it would be impossible for them to win against them. Unless they were to combine their powers. Izuka landed on a building and bit even wasting a moment ran to the direction where he saw the destruction. He needed to group up with all the others as well as see if no one was caught in the damage caused by the missile. His mind continued to assess the situation. It was a training exercise hence he was sure that the staff wouldn't equip the robots with anything that dangerous, and if so would make sure that there was no lasting damage to the students. This exercise was meant to show us the reality of a foe we can never hope to defeat alone. It might also be see how we'll react to the fear and confusion. As he reached the affected area he pushed Ether to the air around him letting him set up a temporary sensory field to see if there was anyone here, as he received negative feedback. He turned around to head towards Todoroki when he heard the telltale sounds of Ida rushing. After a few moments he came face to face with Ida along with Momo who tagged along, Momo rushed towards him and checked him for any injuries and started fussing over him. Ida walked towards him a serious air around him. Izuku, you figured it out too, right? The real motive behind this test? Momo stopped and looked at Izuku and nodded at the end of Ida's statement. Izuku looked at both of them and answered. We won't win against them individually. We'll have to attack as a single unit. And in doing so, we can hopefully defeat them. Ida and Momo nodded at the assessment. Izuka grinned at them both and extended his fist. Ida looked surprised at the gesture before reciprocating with a smirk. Momo simply glomped both in a hug. With Uraraka and Kaminari. Uraraka sighed as she dragged Kaminari to cover. He had expended a lot of his power to help her destroy the missile. She shivered as she remembered how it tore through the machines she floated as barricades like paper. 
If not for Kaminari, she was sure that the missile would have made contact with the building and exploded. She noticed how the missiles weren't actually aimed at them, but in fact near their general area. It also came to her notice that it would be impossible for anyone alone to win against one of those iron giants, let alone three. She looked sideways to see Kaminari in his thumbs-up face, she sweat dropped at the scene. Suddenly she heard the telltale signs of Todoroki coming near them, she ran to the streets, and waved Todoroki towards them. He went ahead to explain the situation, as well as his analysis of the predicament therein. Almost as soon as they finished their discussion, they felt the robots move to different areas at a slow pace. Todoroki stared at the giants, multiple plans flashed through his mind yet all of them had only a minor possibility of success. As his mind ran through these scenarios it slowly became more and more obvious, they weren't meant to win alone. This was a villain they needed to fight together against. Looking over to Urarika, he saw the same look of enlightenment. Just as they were about to move, they heard the telltale signs of Ida coming towards them. Moments later Izuka landed beside them, a blushing Momo in his arms as he carried her in his arms to save time. Urarika puffed her her cheeks at the scene but focused on the situation they were in. Izuka was about to begin explaining the entire scenario to them, but Todoroki cut him off and merely stated that they also understood the test and was pretty sure that Bakugo also understood and might actually be waiting for them to find him. Izuku agreed with the verdict and moved to Kaminari to heal him. He let the ether seep into Kaminari's body letting it soak up before directing it to let it heal up the body from the inside out. He was startled when Kaminari opened his eyes, a small sheen of gold surrounded his body and seemed to actually stay active. Izuka felt the ether actually augment Kaminari's body much like his, except to a much lesser extent. His friends noticed the same and were about to question on it, when Kaminari himself beat them to it. Whoa, Izuka, dude, what the hell did you give me? I feel like a million yen. And as if to prove his words lightning raced across his body, Izuka stared at him with a look of intense interest and formulated multiple theories and explanations as to the phenomenon and was about to explain, but a pout from Urarika was enough for him to drop the subject. He put his hand on Kaminari and absorbed back the remnant ether present inside, the glow subsided along with the lightning, but Kaminari was still at his top. Kaminari felt a bit deflated at the loss of the energy drink-like feel, but suddenly felt a multitude of eyes on him. He looked up to find the most capable students of his class looking at him. It was Ida who broke the silence. Kaminari, I'm not sure if you've understood the meaning of the test, but all of us feel that we shouldn't be working alone instead work like a team to take this villain down. We've done it before, with USJ and Stain, and we need your help too if we we hope to defeat this villain. Kaminari processed the information and looked Ida directly in the eye and for a moment Ida could see something behind Kaminari's eyes, an emotion he had seen in himself at one time, the feeling that he was lacking. Lacking in strength, intellect or even the raw determination that seemed to spill out from his friends. He interrupted Kaminari before he could even speak, simply extending an arm to help him lift himself from the ground. Kaminari looked surprised at the extended limb, but the looks on Ida's face made him trust himself. As Kaminari took the arm he felt himself lifted up. After dusting himself off he looked to the rest of the people surrounding him. Each of them looking at him expectantly. With a nod from Izuku, he felt a grin slip on his face before giving them a thumbs up. With Bakugo. Bakugo stared at the retreating form of the robots, even with his most powerful release of explosions would hardly dent that armor. In fact, he was pretty sure only Izuku could do that. That too would cause him to injure himself below combat effectiveness. He looked to his right where Kirishima was staring at the robot as well. They had started a small competition before the appearance of the behemoths and had stuck together after the initial assault. He was sure that this might be a team event, but it still ticked him off that he couldn't handle this alone. But he guessed it wouldn't be that bad, as he saw everyone had grown by a good margin, even Great Boy was better now. He stayed rooted to the spot before opening a palm, building up an explosion he grabbed Kirishima's arm before he could complain. When he released the built-up energy, it propelled them to a nearby rooftop where he saw the carnage caused by a lone missile. He went through all the different tactics they could employ to defeat them, each one coming short of defeating them. He looked sideways to the central tower, his eyes calculating what exactly his teachers planned on achieving with this. Izuka walked up to Bakugo, who didn't even turn to face him. He looked at the central tower as well, the same look of contemplation mirrored their faces. 
Todoroki arrived merely a few moments later, standing right beside Izuku. The three of them focused their attention onto the behemoths. It felt like they were back at the USJ. A daunting foe, with what felt like everything was at stake and this time they didn't have Aizawa-sensei to fall back on. They were broken out of their musings when they heard a voice from behind them. So, what's the plan? It was Kaminari that spoke, along with him were Ida, Momo, Uraraka, and Kurishima. It might be true that they didn't have their sensei, but that didn't mean they didn't have people they trusted. And this time, they'll prove that they can win against even against these behemoths. Izuku took the lead as war tactics were his area of expertise. The plan is simple and straightforward this time. Group up with as many people as possible. We need to get Aoyama ASAP. Since, all of the people with vast destructive capabilities are here except him, we'll need him along with us to cause the most amount of damage possible to the robots. After we get him, we'll evacuate everyone from the battle zone and target a single robot at a time. With the amount of firepower we're packing we'll finish them off in a few minutes with a continuous assault. Izuka finished explaining the plan and looked at each of them for feedback. It was Bakugo who voiced the counter. That's all well and done, but what proof is there that the other ten pointers will just let us destroy one of their own while they stare and gape at us? If the other two launch an attack while we're focused on one bot, we'll be goners. Izuku was wide-eyed at that possibility. He was actually surprised he didn't take it into consideration. It was Ida who spoke next. If I may, I believe it'll be a good strategy for the rest of us to actually guard the people with quirks that can actually destroy the robots. That way we can cause damage as well as not be blindsided by a counterattack. Everyone agreed to the added changes to the plan. Ida immediately left to find the rest of their classmates along with Todoroki. Izuka stayed behind and healed the exhaustion of their friends the best he could without expending too much energy. They waited for the signal and a few moments later they saw a small eruption of fire in an alleyway, which went unnoticed by the robots, who actually were not actually doing much except for causing a few buildings to get knocked down. In fact it almost looked as if they were waiting for something. The group wasted no time in rushing towards the designated position of their allies each of them traveling on a large platform made of ether. The site they landed to was actually a rather weird scene. Mineta seemed to be struggling to say something but was blocked from doing so by Siro's tapes while Todoroki seemed to be a bit annoyed at the great colored hero in training. Izuku turned to Todoroki with a questioning look, who answered with a deadpan. He was very reluctant in going through with your plan, as it would require all of us to be in close proximity with the ten pointers, and was going on criticizing the plan with no solid basis, hence I asked Siro to tape him up, and he was very enthusiastic in doing so. Izuka's sweat dropped and turned to the people they could gather. Uraraka and Momo were already discussing the plan with Tsuyu and Mina, while Kurishima and Kaminari were explaining it to Aoyama and Shoji. He watched as his friends interacted with each other. He then heard the revving of an engine signifying the arrival of Ida. He walked up to Ida, who looked at him and gave a small nod and explained to him and the others that he was able to assemble a few of the other students. Time skip. Izuka stared at the first target. This particular robot was farther away from its brethren. Izuka could feel the adrenaline coursing through his veins, the comforting warmth of ether and OFA beneath his skin. He took a deep breath and let it out slowly, forcing his breathing to remain normal. He looked to one of the buildings where Shoji and Siro were staying as lookouts. Shoji would be their eyes and ears, making sure that they were covered from any attacks from their blindsides. Siro would react accordingly and take the slower people away while the rest would be helped by the faster ones. They were all waiting for a signal, a signal which was to be given by Todoroki. A giant glacier of ice that will hopefully trap the robot to a place and incapacitate both of its arms for at least the first few minutes letting them land the first few attacks with no restrictions. The moment the behemoth turned to the side, Todoroki saw his chance. A giant glacier of ice erupted from his front and raced through the body of the robot. This ice was denser and more sturdy than what he usually makes, and hence for strength he sacrificed the area it could cover. The ice blanketed the entirety of the robot's leg seizing its movement before the ice slowly crawled up the sides to encase both fists. The ten-pointer sensing the threat tried to pree its arms out, but was immediately met with a cannonball to the head. It turned to the direction where the cannonball seemed to originate from, to see Momo beside a cannon. Its attention was then brought to one Katsuki Bakugo who had one tape tied on his waist and being catapulted towards said robot's face by Shoji with Uraraka in the background with her quirk activated on Bakugo. 
The ten pointer sensing the threat increased its struggle against its ice prison which bore fruit as it was able to free one of its arms. It immediately tried to swat Bakugo from the air but was stopped from doing so by a multitude of golden chains surrounding its newly freed arm coming from Midoriya who had arcs of golden lightning around him. By the time it had registered the new predicament, Bakugo was racing up its arm, restraining and compressing the massive explosions on both of his arms. With a massive jump Bakugo was in front of its face arms outstretched and bellowed. Grenade burst. All the explosive power he struggled to hold back finally having an outlet burst onto the face of the ten-pointer in vivid fashion. The heat was felt even by Izuku who was far away from the source still restraining the arm of the robot. Katsuki let out a long but tired laugh as he was sent flying by the recoil of his own doing, only to be pulled back Shoji and Siro. Yurarika released her quirk once it seemed Katsuki was in safe distance. They all held their breaths as they waited for the smoke cloud to dissipate, as soon it did showing them the fruit of their labors. The area where the head was located was now merely a vacant area of space as Katsuki's explosion seemingly destroyed the head to bits. The students let out a yell of joy as they defeated their first enemy. Izuku allowed the chains to dissipate a few moments after the arm went lax. He felt Todoroki walk up to him along with the rest of the 1A students whom they weren't able to find slowly filter in and were updated regarding the situation. An explosion brought them to attention as they saw the other two robots rushing in full speed to converge at their area. Izuku looked grim at the scene. He gave Todoroki a nod before rushing to intercept the robots. Todoroki immediately took reins of the operation and barked out orders making sure that everyone without quirks capable of raw destruction were to be support groups and stay away from the fight until needed. He called out to Kaminari and Aoyuma, who immediately followed him to a place where they'd be able to strike the ten-pointers at relatively safe distances. He saw Bakugo and Momo were also moving with them towards the same locations. He eyed Bakugo who looked a bit worn out. He guessed it was to be expected— even with the grenades that store his explosions, to create an explosion of that scale would still take a huge amount of concentration as well as cause a large amount of fatigue. He himself felt a bit winded, but he was sure he'd be able to assist everyone with the assault. He looked to the robots who seemed to fixate it on Izuku, who was proving to be a much bigger threat than he appeared to be. With Izuku. Izuku blurred through the streets, Wafe flowing through his body. Twenty percent was his upper limit. It was barely enough to be of any use against these behemoths. Yet, it became much more when linked with ether. The raw power that flows through him during that time was almost intoxicating. The feeling of being capable of doing anything, but at the same time incapable of putting an output lower than anything other than an anti-army attack was a concern of his. Izuku scaled up the building to try and get the attention of the robots. It was only when he was on a rooftop did he finally understand how outclassed he was. A rocket blurred past him, his reflexes forcing him to turn sideways so as to avoid the armament of death. The explosion rocketed him forwards, but he regained footing a few feet away from the edge of the rooftop. Izuka glared at the two robots, he had to distract them until his friends were able to assemble a counterattack. He focused inwards, and immersed himself in the golden energy that symbolized his ether, but then then channeled OFA throughout his body. Majestic attire, guardian of the heavens, on the outside wisps of energy rose from his body, after which an eruption of light shone where he stood. A pressure descended seemingly from the heavens themselves. Izuku stood bathed in an otherworldly gold, oozing both power and a regalness. He blurred from his position and reappeared mid-flight to reach the one of the robot's head and then a fist encased in golden ether with of arcs of lightning made contact with the head. Meteor Smash the resounding strike was hard enough to turn the robot's head sideways and stun the behemoth for a moment. Yet, in the split second where Izuku focused on the stunned, the other one mercilessly raised its arm to strike him where he was. Izuku's ether encased body, while many times more durable than it was before, doubted it could continue to fight after getting hit by that. And so Izuku decided to unveil Gran Torino's final teachings before the apprenticeship finished. Izuku unleashed ether burst to drive himself out of harm's way and floated in the air in front of the robots preparing to stall them for at least a few more moments. The ten-pointer stared at the new anomaly and prepared multiple plans of action before executing the one with the highest chance of success. One of the robots, with deceptive speed compared to its size, launched a fist directly at the floating Izuku. Moments before the fist made contact, Izuku shot upwards to evade and almost as if they were expecting him to do just that, 
a gigantic ball of rubber was racing towards him. He doubted he could dodge it in time. His mind immediately went into overdrive. He couldn't afford to take a serious injury at this stage, but with the speed at which it was coming at he wouldn't be able to dodge it. None of his higher-end shields and barriers could be manifested in such a short time. He searched for an answer, and it seemed as if Ether thumbed in response. He raised his fist OFA and Ether in tandem raced in his veins. A burst of ether from his feet put him a bit away from the center of the ball. He didn't to dodge it, his mind concluded. He just needed to deflect it. And with a ferocious scream, he punched. Sismamish. The ball for a moment didn't seem to give in the blow, but after a moment it changed its direction towards a hopefully abandoned section of the city. The ten pointers stared at him in contemplation. It seemed as though they expected that maneuver to finish him off. His stared at his arm for a moment. It felt numb he must have lost control for a moment during his adrenaline-filled punch. He wasted no time in disengaging, bombarding them both with hastily created constructs of light, merely suited for diversions as they explode in a bright flash. Izuka flew towards where he could sense Todoroki. Having spent days fighting alongside him and Bakugo he had come to know their own signatures as well as his own. He dropped down and cradled his arm, before stretching it and working out the kinks. He looked to everywhere he could sense people, each of them seemed to be in position for their final assault. He himself was the at the tip of the spear along with all the other long-range specialists, like Todoroki, Momo, Kaminari and Aoyama, each of them on a separate section of a building with people like Kaminari, Todoroki and Izuka on separate buildings. They would be the ones keeping the ten-pointers' attention on themselves while others like Bakugo, Mina, Mineta, Shoji and Kirishima implemented hit and run tactics on the lower parts of the robots. While the rest like Ida, Siro made sure to help in escaping and to defend those close to the robot with their quirks. While a few like Jiro, Koda and Sato stayed with the others at the top of the buildings to guard them against any unprecedented attack. He prayed to any deity that would listen to help him through this. He saw that the robots had got back to their senses. With a nod to everyone in front of him, he increased his power output the entire area bathed in a golden overflow, before he began to condense it into a spear. If his swords were the fastest constructs he could create, then this spear was the attack that could cause significant damage once it left his hand. The drawback of overloading a construct with this much power was the large amount of time it took to condense it into such a form. Slowly but surely the ether flowed, dense and viscous as it seemed to be. The pole was the first to form, intricate designs formed on the pole a darker gold than it was before. During the process, Todoroki had taken charge and made everyone launch attacks onto the robots. An ice wall as tall as a building sprouted forth, a laser beam traveled into the arms of one ten-pointer weakening the armor bit by bit. Momo breathed heavily as she stood behind five cannons each of them firing at once and striking the chest of the robot causing a huge amount of damage. Kaminari hesitated for more than a few moments, still not sure if he could live up to the expectations placed on him. Yet as he saw Izuki giving his all he sat firm on one thing. He at least had to try. A chain of lightning raced across the area stunning both robots for the briefest of moments. Izuka could feel the sweat pouring down from his forehead. The amount of concentration required for this was much more than what he expected especially considering this was what he had to initially undergo to get Ro AIAs under control, and that was by linking his very body to the divine construct. Finally the spear formed an intricate spear that looked as if it had been forged in the core of a sun, it possessed a thin shaft upon which a web of intricate design seemed to have been ingrained onto its very being, a spearhead that was elongated and seemed to in fact stem form the shaft itself. Manifest, Rangaminiat. With OFA bursting from his body augmenting him to superhuman levels, he threw the spear causing a small windstorm on the building he was on. The spear flew like a strategic missile and buried itself in the left shoulder of one of the ten pointers. No longer having the concentration to keep the majestic attire activated it dissipated as he knelt to his knees, his breathing heavy. With barely a 100 m between them, Izuka hoped they could come out without injuries. The moment the spear lodged itself inside, the robot seemed to notice a small glowing needle. It's small compared to the behemoth. It reached towards it to examine the item in close range. That was a mistake. The moment the arm was close enough the spear exploded, the entire upper portion of the robot seemed to be engulfed by a sun that originated from the spear, its heat melting much of its supposedly impregnable armor. When the light finally died down, they were able to see the damage caused. The shoulder was barely hanging on, 
the head area and everything surrounding the area of impact was partially melted. In fact it seemed as though the ten-pointer was malfunctioning by the results of the continuous assault. Bakugo wasted no time in attacking even as tired as he was. He needed to make a statement. He had a savage smile on his face. While Izuku was the best at causing long-range damage only challenged by Todoroki, in close range he was the one to give Izuku competition. Concentrating a buildup of explosive power on a single palm, he ran up the sides of Robot the moment he reached the chest area of the robot he maneuvered himself to the open chest wound and released the explosion with an open palm strike. Like a puppet with its strings cut the robot toppled over onto a side. Bakugo completely exhausted was to be caught by Tsuyu who gave him to Ida where he transported him to safety. Izuku smiled as his plan worked, but he was disappointed that he couldn't make the Rangaminiad like he wanted to be. It was supposed to be capable of ignoring the armor, and at least be capable of destroying the upper portion of the robot. Rangaminiad was an attack he had tried to imbue the aspect of Pierce, into, yet it seemed he'd have to keep practicing that it was a good idea they had kept Bakugo to finish off the robot. But now Bakugo was completely out of commission, and he himself had around maybe a quarter of his entire reserves left. He looked to Todoroki and Momo. Todoroki was breathing heavily, but he didn't have much fight left in him, while Momo was barely holding on to consciousness. The entire ordeal from the beginning had been quite taxing on her. He would have loved nothing more than ask her to rest, but like everyone around him, she embodied the school motto, plus ultra. Tower The teachers in assembly watched the screens wide-eyed. It was a first time that almost the entire class seemed to know that they couldn't beat the behemoth alone. The coordination between them, while not perfect, was miles ahead of what they expected. They weren't surprised when the first robot was defeated, no, they expected that. But when the second one fell, they were surprised. They wanted this exercise to show them a threat they couldn't hope to defeat. While there was no real way they could be harmed, the robots were designed not to harm the contestants more than knocking them out. The screen flickered to Ida who was carrying an unconscious Bakugo to safety. They had to admire at how Ida had started to prioritize the rescue of an individual rather than getting a shot in at the villain. It was a far cry from the reports they had read at Hosu. And they also considered the raw power Bakugo was able to generate at a moment's notice. He had also mellowed out quite a bit. They had great expectations from him. No doubt he was top pro hero material. Tashinori watched as the screen flickered to show Todoroki and Izuku. He was extremely proud at how all three of his students fought against these almost unbeatable odds. The more he saw, the more proud he became what they were able to do required so much talent and hard work. They were leagues ahead of their previous generations, even when he was at their age he could say he didn't have the same drive that they possessed. The principal's voice cut through the chatter, his tone proud yet serious. While it is true they have been able to defeat two of ten pointers, we mustn't forget that there is one more left and having watched its brethren die, it will now be much more dangerous than the other two. With Izuku. Izuku dropped down to Momo's building running to where she was. Momo turned to him with a smile feeling a bit lightheaded. They just had one robot left. Izuku caught Momo before she fell. He checked to see if she was unconscious but found that she was just tired. Before Izuku could talk, his danger senses flared. The robot had already raised its arm to launch a missile. Its aim was directly at their cluster of buildings. The ice wall collapsed as the robot broke free from the confines. Izuka freezed in his spot. There was no way all of them could escape. The only way to survive was to block the missile head on. Izuka rushed to the front of the building ether bursting from his body to his arms. He focused on the aspect of protect. He envisioned the seven petal shield and was about to bring it to existence, but was knocked towards Momo by Todoroki whose entire left side was encased in white hot flames. An ice dome encased both both Izuku and Momo. The last day image they saw of Todoroki was him glaring at the missile and bellowing. Chaos Flames A huge explosion rocked the fake city as Todoroki's flames caused the missile to detonate prematurely. The heat melted the ice dome that protected Izuku and Momo. While Momo finally slipped into unconscious, Izuku pushed the remains of the ice dome away to find Todoroki. But to his surprise he saw him at the same place before except he was mildly burned and stood stock still. Izuku didn't know how but the next thing he knew was him cradling Todoroki a healing spell on his lips. Heaven's Light, White Art of Heal But before he could finish the incantation, he was stopped by a semi-conscious Todoroki, who struggled to speak but finally choked out the word no. Todoroki then coughed out. 
Just heal me a bit. I'm all right. I've had severe burns in training than this. Don't use your entire reserves for me. I knocked you away for a reason. The rest of them need you to guide them, and it's no use if you need protection yourself. With that Todoroki finally rested, Izuka stared at Todoroki then to an unconscious Momo. He sensed Kaminari, Oyama, and the others rushed to their location, and he could see that his classmates nearest to the robot were still attacking. He looked back at Todoroki and let his ether flow into him. It slowly healed all the new burns and took the pain away. Kaminari was the first to reach. He looked as if had already raised exceed his limit but was fighting against the backlash of his quirk. Aoyama was struggling to stand, while Jiro, Koda and Sato looked better than before. He quickly assessed the final stretch of this exercise. All of his classmates including himself were on their last legs. It'd be useless unless they did a kamikaze attack or the heavy hitters just let loose all they had. The last option was the only logical choice. The rest could protect them while unconscious, and Izuka asked both Koda and Jiro to look after Momo, Todoroki and Aoyama while he, Sato and Kaminari left for the finale. The scene they arrived at was the ten-pointer savagely attacking the ground, while Ida employed hit-and-run tactics, Kirishima and Shoji throwing projectiles lightened by Uraraka, along with the others getting in a strike whenever and wherever they could. He shouted over the pandemonium. Everyone get away from here we can't let loose with everyone surrounding us. Grab the injured and run toward the farthest buildings. Me and Kaminari will bring this win home. At this everyone hesitated a but Ida and Sato rushed towards the cluster and grabbed the injured and carried them away sparing just a moment to nod to Izuku and shouting at everyone to follow them. They escaped slower than Izuku wanted them to but it helped him explain the plan to Kaminari who he dragged along. Now, I know the situation looks bad. But I need you to trust me. I'm gonna strike the robot with everything I have and once I give you the signal I need you to launch your most powerful shock. You can't be afraid, Kaminari. I need you to let loose completely or else we won't win. All of this would be for nothing. Kaminari's eyes, which once showed fear, slowly drained away. Now golden orbs shone with determination. He nodded to Izuku and was about to leave when he suddenly felt all of his fatigue disappear and slowly became supercharged. His eyes traced back to Izuku whose eyes didn't leave the ten-pointers but spoke to him. That's most of, of my energy, it'll help you control that large amount of power you're gonna be channeling. You're gonna be our ace in the hole, I need you to cause as much damage as you can. I'll land the finishing blow if need be, but I need you to strike it with all you have and hopefully that should be enough. Kaminari gave a final nod and ran into position. Izuku breathed heavily once he sensed Kaminari go out of range. While he acted tough, he had given all of his remaining ether to Kaminari. He did so because he didn't want him to get hurt, which left Izuku with barely enough energy in his body. But he didn't regret it. A hero must always go beyond. That was what his teachers had taught him, and he was gonna live by it. OFA coursed through his body, strengthening it, pushing away the fatigue. He had a job to do and he'd be damned if he let his friends down, especially after they had placed their hopes on him. His eyes shone once again as he channeled the few drops of ether to give him the final boost. With a roar he jumped. He marveled the similarities of what he was doing with what happened in his entrance exam. He closed his eyes and channeled the undiluted power of OFA to his right fist. The robot faster than he expected it to had raised its arm to meet the punch head on. Without missing a beat Izuku roared as he met the robotic fist. Meteor Smash Izuku bit back a scream as his arm broke under recoil of his own attack losing power in the process yet it served its purpose. The robot's fist was no match against the explosive force of Izuku's punch. It shattered along with the hull being damaged by the wind wall accompanied by the punch. Izuku in a moment clarity through his pain-addled mind used the last ember of ether to push himself towards a building as he screamed to Kaminari. Do it now! Kaminari was brought back to his senses from the raw power he just witnessed. He had been charging as much energy as he could for a long time and now given the signal he let his electricity focus onto a target, the arcs of lightning burst from his body. The entire block was drowned in a golden light as his electricity enhanced by ether was called forth. He focused as hard as he could and screamed. Heavenly lightning! A fork of lightning struck the behemoth. The entire robot bombarded with the discharge could do nothing as Kaminari continued to barrage the robot with electricity. The entire student population could not believe the raw power that Kaminari unleashed. Izuka grinned as Kaminari continued his assault on the robot. 
It continued for a few more seconds until Kaminari finally reached his limit. He stared at the robot who seemed black as ash after his assault. He smiled and was about to let go of the concentration he had been keeping to hold back the side effects of his quirk. Until he heard creaking, he stared back at the robot who against all reason was pointing its cannon at him. He had nothing left after that attack. Dropping to his knees he waited for the projectile to strike. Until he felt the sensation of someone grabbing him and running. He opened his two Siazuka carrying him on his shoulders. But he lost control of his quirk and immediately sensed his brain short circuit. Yay! Izuku would have laughed as he saw Kaminari enter his, yay mode. But for now he had bigger fish to fry, laying Kaminari near of the buildings he looked at the robot. It seemed to be too damaged to move, in fact it was reloading the rocket launcher on its remaining shoulder. He had to stop it before the rocket launched, or if could cross the distance between them, if he went 100%. He shivered as he cradled his right arm close to his chest, the pain was mind-boggling especially without his ether. He wasn't sure if he could handle the aftermath of 100%, asterisk, especially since he'd have to concentrate long enough to strike the machine. But he had to win. He had promised everyone that he would. Todoroki and Bakugo, his teammates, had used everything they had and trusted him enough to leave the rest to him. Izuku's mind kept chanting his promise in his mind. His resolve hardened. He prepared himself to throw everything he had at the robot. Regardless of all consequences, he had to win. Everyone else trusted it all to him. And from the depths of his soul, a speck of light, struggling to grow, it couldn't or rather it didn't have enough energy to grow anymore. And so, it turned to the very earth for power. The robot finally locked in onto one of the targets responsible for the destruction of its brethren. Izuka stared as the robot locked onto him, his eyes shimmering with a glow he needed to win. He had to keep his promise to his friends, he had to win. A mode of light. It was small, one could assume it was a trick played on the eyes. But then came more, it came from the very earth to help him. These lights danced around him, but he paid them no mind. In fact it seemed as though he had not even registered them, his mind focusing solely on one thing. Win. Izuku's right arm extended to his side, the wounds he received from the backlash of his smash slowly healing until there was no evidence of any damage. His arm closed to hold something. To everyone looking it seemed as though he was grasping air, yet Izuka felt a warmth that flowed through his being, a reassurance that he so much needed. It was then Izuka realized that he was in fact surrounded by motes of light, all of them which seemed to play around him. The rest of the world seemed to slow as the motes of light continued to play around him until they covered him entirely. Izuka could feel the power they seemed to give him, and along with it came hope. Izuka's fist tightened. He looked to see a sword construct, one very different from the ones he used. It seemed to be fluctuating, as if it wasn't ready to enter the world, only a vague shape seemed to exist. But he could feel it, deep within the construct, the promise of victory. Time sped up once again, the ten-pointer released its final assault against Izuku, a volley of missiles and weapons. Izuku didn't move from his spot, rather he held the fluctuating sword with both hands and held it above his head. With barely a scant few meters from the attack, his arms descended and came with it the promised victory. A blast of energy engulfed the entire area in front of him. All the projectiles evaporated under the blast. Izuka buckled under the strain of the blow. His entire body protested against the event. And so the blast lessened in strength and finally Izuka was brought to his knees, the sword shattered in his palms. He couldn't even feel his arms after that. His healing factor negated and all his abilities were completely spent. But the last sight he saw before blacking out was the robot falling to pieces, along with all the buildings near and behind it. Izuka's eyes fluttered open as his mind slowly took in his surroundings. Most of his vision was blocked by large blades of grass. He forced his body to stand on its feet. He pushed off the ground, letting his body rest its weight on his knees. After wobbling for a moment, he was finally able to take in the world, he found himself in. Izuka looked around the dreamscape he found himself in, an endless field filled with blades of grass that all but covered his legs. It was a scene that would for all purposes be colored green, yet it was anything but that. A golden sun shone high in the sky as it imposed its own colors upon the land. The field was bathed in golden rays that oozed happiness. He felt a playful breeze ruffle his hair as it continued along the field. He couldn't understand the sense of familiarity that churned inside of him. The very land seemed to call to him. 
he felt his attention slowly shift to the sun. It was massive, but he felt as though he was connected to it. While it should have hurt him to stare at the giant ball of flames, he felt no such thing. In fact, he was mesmerized by the giant orb. He subconsciously extended his arm towards the orb, and to his surprise a tether of flames slowly reached out from the orb to his arms. While common sense would usually dictate someone in his shoes to run, his body refused to budge from that spot, and so his mind braced for the immeasurable pain that should accompany the meeting of flames and flesh, but yet again he was proven wrong when he suddenly felt the familiar warmth that accompanied his quirk. The power that he awoke to save. Suddenly the air felt heavier, the golden ball of ether shone in all its glory, and then the blades of grass showed another color breaking through was a vibrant green much like the color of his mother's eyes. It too seemed to want to make itself known to Izuku. He was transfixed as the sun shifted colors that represented his ether and Oafe. They seemed to smother each other not necessarily fighting, simply trying to exist in the same place yet finding there to be no room. He shielded his eyes as the brightness of his sun finally reached a point where it caused him discomfort, but only for a scant few moments as immediately after he blinked he was met with a much larger sun which bathed the entire area in a much heavier blanket of gold. The tether between him and the sun seemed to suddenly pulse. His mind was bombarded with sensations both foreign yet familiar. He could feel the air, the smallest movements around his being. He remembered this sensation. It happened sporadically an ability that was elusive to him, which raised many a question for him. He could feel life. In fact, he felt the vastness of the domain that life had. But what made it even more confusing is that his mind could understand it, the concept of life. It was then he saw some silhouettes in the distance. He had seen this before in his match with Shinso. He could see one of them extending his arms towards him. Suddenly he felt his body thrust out of his dreamscape. The mere presence of the embodiments of his powers left him with more questions about his, two powers. Infirmary There was buzz in the rather large room that was UA's infirmary. All students that had participated in the test were on the beds, some laying down while others were sitting up and conversing with their neighbors. Recovery Girl watched the scene with a small smile on her lips. It reminded her much of own youth where she had found herself in talks with her comrades. Her eyes couldn't help but drift towards the one student she was most familiar with. Izuka held a special place in everyone's heart, a soul that simply wanted to do what was right. She felt the conviction he carried within him, the way he pushed himself beyond his limits. His very presence had made waves among his peers. Her attention was drawn to the people surrounding Izuka's bed. Young Shoto was listening to the chatter of his classmates. She believed Todoroki to be a lost soul, one who had faced many hardships in life but had found his place with friends at Yue. He had slowly started accepting himself, and in a small start begun the process of healing himself. Bakugo was in a way, difficult to understand he was a contradiction that interested her a great deal. His personality kept him closed off from most peers, his shoot first, ask questions later mentality had also caused quite a few commotions. His battle instincts and all-round prowess in combat left her wondering how far he'd go in the world. He was no doubt top pro hero material. He was also firmly on their side, no matter what others might seem to believe. His conviction and ideals had lead him far in life so far. He also had a great camaraderie with Izuku which she noticed had extended a bit to Todoroki as well. Her eyes focused on his form who was staring at his undoubtedly sore arms. Then of course was Ida who grew up from all his encounters he had in the short tenure of his academic career. He was loyal to a fault, and was a very good friend that Izuku was lucky to have. She could sense the growth in Ida, as he now tried to live up to owe his family name, and the name of, Ingenium. She bit back a laugh as he saw him try to contain the voices of everyone in the infirmary. Then of course was his lady friends, the Yayorosa girl was beside his bed almost immediately after she was back to consciousness she was conversing softly with the bubbly girl whom she remembered was Yurarika. They both seemed to hold Izuku in high regard, and had a lot of affection towards the boy. She herself could see the signs clearly, she mused how it must be to be young and in love. Her thoughts were cut off as Izuku's body started to glow a light shade of gold, she walked at a brisk pace towards him already contacting Aizawa in case he needed to be restrained. It wouldn't be the first time his ether subconsciously activated after a recovery. Her fears were thankfully unneeded as he slowly stirred from his self-induced slumber, looking more than a bit confused as to where he was. 
she felt a pulse of energy escape Izuka's frame, before Izuka nodded to himself almost as if to assure himself to where he was. She saw him smile at the girls who rushed to berate him on his no-doubt self-induced slumber. Izuku, on the other hand, merely laughed it off. She could see the emotions dancing across his eyes as she finally reached his bedpost. Izuka's eyes were on Recovery Girl as she started to run a final diagnostics on him. He was confident that his enhanced healing already took care of any injuries that may have been present yet he could still feel the exhaustion beneath his skin. That last attack had drained him dry but what surprised him was that he was certain that he didn't have that much energy left for an attack of that magnitude. He also found it hard to believe the events that had transpired in his dreamscape as well. Tashinori sensei had explained that he himself had not seen these silhouettes, and it would be the first time he heard of a symbolic representation of his quirk. The giant sun that bathed its surroundings in gold, the green flares that represented OFA and of course the mysterious silhouettes that he suspected were the previous owners of OFA. He had more questions than he had answers for. His attention was brought to Momo who was by his bedside along with Uraraka, Ida and his teammates. He gave them a smile to reassure them that he was alright. It seemed to work for most of them, yet Momo and his teammates didn't seem to buy it. But before anyone could press the matter, the doors of the infirmary opened up to show in Principal Nizu and Aizawa in all their glory. The student body quickly quieted down and waited for the addressing of the test that took place. It was the principal who broke the silence. I must say, I should have expected better than to believe that all of you would do the logical choice and evacuate the area rather than fight the robots head on. Then again I would have been a tad bit disappointed if you had done so. As the principal was met with confused stares, Aizawa stepped forward to clear the confusion. What the principal meant was that you were all idiots to rush and fight those goliaths. At this, he was met with indignant shouts from his class, yet he powered through without skipping a beat. And that he along with others are proud of you all for accomplishing such a task. There were a scant few moments of silence before the entire infirmary exploded in cheers. The students engulfed each other in hugs, while others merely bumped fists or smirked at their victory. While I must admit there were moments wherein we had to restrain ourselves from jumping into the fray, but all in all I feel as though it was a great picker-upper for all you. A great practice for your final examinations and I'll say this now considering the next few weeks might be rushed. All those who fail your final exams will have summer school while the other will head towards summer camp to better train their powers. Aizawa watched as each of his students sobered up regarding their finals along with the enthusiasm shared for their summer camp. His mind wandered to what they had planned for their finals. It was a headache just to think about it. He caught Izuka's eyes and with a subtle nod and a bow to the principal left the infirmary. The principal continued to speak to the rest of the students explaining to them the procedures for the finals and wishing them his heartfelt wishes that they all succeed in passing their finals. Everyone slowly left the infirmary picking up candy from the bowl near the exit along with a wave towards Recovery Girl, all of them ready to tackle their next exam. Time skipped two weeks before final exams. Izuku watched as all of his classmates fret over the finals. While he was a bit worried about the exams as well he was confident that he'd do well. He turned to the side where Ida and Bakugo were arguing over the correct answer to a certain question. He had to admit, Bakugo had grown out of his shell and was now talking to most of everyone in the class. Momo was bombarded with the academically weak students pleading her to help them with their studies. It had been agreed that Momo's house would be a meet-up point for their final year's studies. But it'd seem as they'd have to make room for others as well. Momo had been adamant that they all study together at her place for the exams while Bakugo and Todoroki attempted to skip on those meetings. A few well-placed tears and certain advantages had caused them to cave into her demands. There was also the fact that Tashinori-sensei had left the UA to meet up with his former sidekick for an important meeting, and he'd be missing the finals as such. Gran Torino had mentioned that Naitai and Tashinori-sensei had patched up before the Hosu incident, chapter 12, and were now in the middle of serious talks about all for one. He hoped everything would go well but considering his luck he was sure that it wouldn't. He saw that Ochako was having problems with one problem with the sum, so he moved his chair so that he could help her out. Time skip. The two weeks blitz passed in the blink of an eye. Momo and Izuka spent most of the time tutoring those who needed help. They made sure to focus on important topics and helping anyone with their work. It was also around this time they found out about the extent of Momo's wealth and Izuka's internship at the hospital. 
Izuku had made sure to visit as much as he could, it helped that he was very comfortable with the topics for the examination. While Ida did berate him on not taking his exam seriously it was Katsuki who stuck up for him mentioning Izuku's prowess in both theory and practicals. While it did placate Ida a bit, he still made sure that Izuku didn't slack off. Izuku did appreciate the concern but he felt it was unwarranted, Uraraka was happy that her friends were with her, and in fact motivated her to study as well. There had been rumors that this year's practical portion would vary from the previous ones in both difficulty and structure. It also appeared that the teachers were very secretive about it. And as All Might wasn't present with him, he had no one to even ask his questions to. He sighed as remembered the deadpan expression he received from Aizawa sensei when he had asked to confirm his suspicions, although he had mentioned that they'd have a surprise for the exam. The exams finished on a high note as everyone felt they did their best. They were all ushered into the infirmary the very next day before their practicals, to make sure they were in peak condition. As they were guided to another training ground they met with Principal Nizu who welcomed all of them for their final test. As all of you are here after your checkup will now commence your practical exam, but unlike the previous exams, you will face off against against people of flesh and blood. The doors to the training ground open showing, Eraser Head, 13, Present Mike, Ectoplasm, Midnight, Snipe, Cementos, and Power Rotor. It was at this that some of the students like Kaminari and Mina groaned audibly while others like Todoroki and Izuku shuffled their feet at their disadvantage. The principal continued with a small smirk. We have already divided you into teams. Each team will face off against a predetermined opponent. There are only two ways to pass this exam. One is to escape the facility slash training ground and the other is to capture the villain using your cuffs. And as one of your teachers has taken a leave of absence for his hero duties, we have a very special guest who has taken time off his busy schedule to help nurture the next generation. The principal turned their attention to the side where a silhouette walked towards them, and with each step the figure became clear, until finally the students couldn't keep the surprise off their faces. For in front of them stood the number point two hero. The Flame Hero Endeavor. Izuku could feel the heat that Endeavor exuded, the oppressing aura that demanded respect and showcased his power. In a way it was a personification of what Endeavor stood for, the moment Endeavor stood beside the principal he along with others had to restrain themselves from turning their heads toward Todoroki, who had an emotionless face on display, yet his eyes showed that he too was surprised by the fact that his father was here. The principal concluded that all of his students were thoroughly surprised by the turn of events, and if he was honest with himself so was he. It had been a huge surprise when Endeavor had contacted him requesting permission to test his son's teammates. The principal sensing the opportunity laid out for him, had no issues taking advantage of it. He had made Endeavor privy of all the details and rules that he must follow, but he had been surprised when Endeavor had only asked one thing in return. No matter what happens on those grounds, until the fight is over, those two are mine. I will push them to their absolute limits, but I assure you once I'm done they will, will be stronger than ever before. Of course the principal vehemently denied this especially considering what they'd been through and the knowledge of Endeavor's history with his estranged son had caused him to deny this. That is, until his friend Gran Torino had stepped in and gave Endeavor the all-clear, when the principal had asked his reasoning, all Gran Torino had said was, They need someone to push them past their limits, someone new to them, someone who doesn't pull their punches. And I don't know anyone better to do that than Endeavor. The second best hero in the world— his power was obtained through sheer hard work and determination. While All Might had to train until his body was stronger than anyone, we have to respect Endeavor's ambition to be better than All Might. While he did stray away for a time, he was consistent in his goals. The principal had to agree with Gran Torino's words, but he still felt that they were placing a great many burden on younger generations' shoulders. But with threats like the League of Villains and, of course, all for one. He shook away all his doubts and believed that it was for the best. Endeavor stared at the assembled group of children. From what he saw there wasn't an ounce of potential in any of them other than a handful. He let his eyes wander to his son's teammates. Bakugo Katsuki reminded him of himself at a time that almost seemed foreign to him, to be able to control destruction at his very fingertips. Potential that seemed to ooze from his being, yet all of it was restricted by that pride of his. Then was Midoriya Izuku. In all honesty Izuku made his hair stand on edge the child exuded power in spades, the abilities granted to him were numerous, he had kept his eye on him ever since the sports festival. 
He could remember the defiance that shone in the boy's eyes. He had fought his son and won. He had even made Shoto accept himself. His eyes wandered to his estranged son. He was surprised when his son accepted the internship under his own hero agency. For a moment he wondered of the future that he tore down, the future that. Endeavor shook his head of any further thoughts along the line, and focused singularly on this aim, to test the two teammates of his sons. To see with his own two eyes what these children were made of. He listened to the principal explain to the students of the matchups. Same as can in matchups except. And finally we have young Izuku and Katsuki versus Endeavor. Both Izuku and Katsuki stiffened a bit. They could see Endeavor's stare piercing their very souls. Katsuki in true fashion broke a grin that screamed barely restrained enthusiasm. Izuku while a bit weary couldn't deny that he too was excited at the prospect of fighting the number two hero, even as restrained as he was with those weights he wore. Time skip. The trip to the field was quiet. The tension was thick as both Izuku and Katsuki formed and discarded plans at a rather impressive pace. Endeavor seemed to either not care of his charges or believe that they were not any threat. Either way it ticked Katsuki off. They soon reached the urban training ground where Endeavor finally graced them with his words. As your principal explained the procedure before, you must either flee or fight, and to ensure you have a fighting chance we are wearing these restraints. But I have something further to add on to this. This is a test for you to impress me, and also for me to see what makes you two tick, and after which I shall decide if you both are worth Shoto's time. Endeavor could see the tightened jaws and fists. In fact he was certain that Katsuki would have taken a shot at him immediately if not for his previous altercations with other pros. With that he left the two to their devices until the beginning of the test. I think I can understand why Todoroki has issues with that old man of his. Izuku snorted at Katsuki's words. It was an understatement if anything. Yet he couldn't shake this weird feeling, almost as though this was going to be something that'll be a do or die moment. He looked to Katsuki and knew that he felt the same. Something about all this just doesn't feel right, especially the fact we're going to face off against a person who hasn't given Yue the time of day before now. And I don't know about you, but we'll have to give it our all if we want to pass. Katsuki nodded at Izuka's words. As much as he wanted to whack that smug grin off Endeavor's face, he knew he wouldn't come close. He could still remember the few times All Might had to get serious with villains during their internship under him. The gap between him and All Might was astronomical, and even if Endeavor was halfway decent then he couldn't hope to 1v1 him. They both walked into the training ground at the sound of the bell, both on high alert in case of a surprise attack. The entire ground was eerie the only sounds being their footsteps and the various pieces of machinery in the urban neighborhood. Izuku immediately channeled his ether to search for Endeavor. A moment's search bore fruit as he found Endeavor in front of an apartment complex. Endeavor looked displeased at the fact, but before he could even move Izuku took the initiative and attacked with a blast of ether. The attack struck true as as dust cloud formed on the surrounding area. Both of them didn't let their guard down and we're rewarded when they dodged a beam of concentrated for that struck their previous position. They turned to see Endeavor to not have even moved from his position, and to have tanked the blow head-on with just a bit of dust on his frame. Endeavor wasted no time in engaging them in further combat, releasing a bombardment of flames and rushing to their position using a heated jet of flames. Izuku let loose blasts of ether to counter the bombardment, while Katsuki released a stunned grenade explosion while closing in on an approximate position on where Endeavor would land. Katsuki prepared a large explosion but couldn't even get close as Endeavor expelled heat from his body to defend him against any attack during the duration of the stun. The flames immediately condensed to his fist as he struck in Katsuki's direction. The flames leapt from his fist towards their target. Katsuki reacted with a barrage of explosions that caused the surrounding glass windows to shatter. Izuka threw a barrage of sword constructs at Endeavor's position yet none reached their mark as they were met midair by a blanket of flames. Endeavor sighed as he watched the two children try to land hits on him. He had tanked the first few hits to humor them and he couldn't help but be disappointed. He had expected much more than these pitiful tactics. He could feel his irritation grow. This was not what he wanted. Katsuki suddenly felt a chill go down his spine. His instincts were screaming at him to run. The visage of Endeavor suddenly shifted momentarily. No longer was he man of flesh and bone. His aura blanketed the entire area. An unnatural heat slowly grew until he felt as though there was something weighing him down physically. 
He strained to turn his head towards Izuku to see him cloaked in ether to counter the oppressive aura, but it seemed as though he still couldn't shake off the effects completely. Pain suddenly exploded at his sides as he saw Endeavor suddenly launch a haymaker at his chest. The blow knocked the wind out of him as he flew through the air. Izuku forced his body to shake off the remaining chill on his nerves so that he could catch Katsuki. All plans grinded to a halt when he saw Endeavor fire a barrage of flames at him. Izuku cursed as he countered with Aether. He winced when he heard Katsuki crash beside him. He felt the sudden shift in Endeavor. He was starting to fight seriously. Endeavor suddenly put a stop to the barrage by unleashing a wave of flames that forced Izuku to dodge while grabbing Katsuki. The momentary respite was taken away from him when he saw Endeavor charge up a spear of fire in his right hand. Izuku instinctively summoned a spear of ether but couldn't charge it as Endeavor threw the spear of flames. The spear of ether flew towards the spear with the intent of stopping the advancement. What surprised Izuku was when the spear of flames shattered his spear as if it were made of glass and continued towards him. Izuka put up a hastily made shield to provide some protection for both of them. The resulting explosion knocked them far away with Izuka crashing against the building. Endeavor walked towards them not even working up a sweat as he leisurely made his way. Pathetic. Izuka's bleary mind was surprised at Endeavor's tone. To think that the two of you are considered to be UA's finest, I can see that the title of prodigy is given to anyone nowadays. Izuka ears rang with each thud of Endeavor's footsteps. The dizziness from the explosion hadn't left him yet. He could feel his ether healing his wounds, but he couldn't move. He didn't. No, whether it was because of fear or just the unnerving presence that seemed to ooze out of Endeavor, but whatever it was caused his body to stop listening to him. Tell me something, Midoriya. It is common knowledge that you and your merry band of friends are the closest to all might. But I want to know something, and I can assure you, there is no escape from my grasp. Almost as if to prove his word a vortex of flames in case both of them cutting away all contact with the outside, not even a mark of strain was present on Endeavor's face in the showcasing of power. Six years ago, an unnoticeable change happened. Any signs of his previous dizziness washed away from Izuka's face at those words. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but if you need further clarification. I'm talking about All Might's drop in strength. Izuka broke in a cold sweat. This was his sensei's worst fear. The fear of someone finding out about the cracks present on the symbol of justice. Izuku knew he need to get away. Ether surged through his body. An application of ether burst launched him directly at the pro hero. His fist was knocked back ready to break through whatever guard Endeavor was about to put up. And yet as he got closer he saw no guard, no shield of flames, merely a cold disposition that marred Endeavor's face. His fist raced forward fully intending on causing a significant amount of damage on the pro's person. And then, mere inches away from a strike, Endeavor moved, his entire body shifted away from his previous position completely evading Izuka's blow. What happened next was Izuka's entire body was sent crashing away into same building. His body burned from the strike, the flames encased Endeavor's fists seemed much like his quirk's name sake, Hell Flames. It wasn't easy to notice, but I am not a mere sheep. I could see his powers diminishing, it was present in his stance, his hero duties saw a drop the past few years. The strength of his blows varied from before, almost as if he was exerting himself, as if his body could no longer work at its best. His blows while still capable of feats which are considered extraordinary suddenly became taxing. And then during the USJ incidents, I was able to procure tapes from the various security cameras surrounding the city. It was in one of those tapes I saw it. Izuka's mind worked over time to figure a way out of this mess. Heck knows, 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 heck knows. Endeavor either seemed not to care of Izuka's thought process as he continued. I saw All Might bleed, almost explosively. This was the first time All Might has ever shown weakness. He was an indomitable figure, someone who could change fate with a mere swing of his fists. Yet now, he is no longer the man he once was. He is weak. Izuka felt a flush of emotions race through him. Surprise, guilt, sadness, yet one emotion drowned all the others. What did you say? Rage. A whisper, barely audible yet Endeavor could feel a shift within the boy. He would finally see a glimpse of this boy's true power. Discussions of All Might's drop and strength were for later. He had only mentioned it so that the boy would stop holding back. Now the real test begins. 
A wave of ether exploded from Izuku and crashed into Endeavor, causing the hero to grunt and finally showing a bit of exertion since the beginning of the fight. Almost instantly he could feel his instinct scream at an oncoming threat. Years of training and experience allowed him to dodge a haymaker from a golden-clad figure. Endeavor grinned and lowered the vortex of flames so that he could let the other student also join, and he wasn't the least surprised when the child was already aiming at him with the support item of his. An explosion rocked the area, causing more glass to shatter. The smoke had yet to settle when Izuku let an assault of sword constructs at the smoke. Both held breaths as they waited for the smoke to settle, and yet what met them was an orb of flames that took all the blows leaving an unscathed endeavor. The flames then shifted and raced towards them. Izuku immediately raced backward while simultaneously Bakugo raced toward the flame. Just before contact Bakugo jumped over it with an explosion propelling him. The flames continued to Izuku who raised a barrier and grit his teeth as the flames crashed onto it. Bakugo wasted no time in rushing close quarters with Endeavor. He couldn't let Endeavor gain distance, as he knew the long-range attacks were a bitch to deal with. Katsuki's fists blurred as he entered close combat with the number two, yet each hit was met blocked or slapped away. He roared as used his explosions to give him an edge. The strikes now faster, and much more deadly, yet Endeavor was still faster. Tanking blows and slapping away other, Katsuki could feel his rage build up this asshole wasn't even taking this seriously. I honestly expected better from you. Endeavor spoke. Your quirk is strong, and you seem to have good enough combat ability. Yet something is holding you back. Endeavor shifted to the right to evade Izuku who tried to knock him from the back. And you, Midoriya Izuku, the prodigy. Both of you along with my son are the backbone for the next generation, the next big three. Then tell me, why is it that you have not landed a proper blow on me, Dot? It's atrocious. Ten minutes into this folly of an exam and both of you have not been able to land a blow that would cause injury on my person. Where is this awe-inspiring power that you posses Midoriya? With that endeavor crossed the field in a blink of an eye and met Izuku with fists encased in flames. Does it only awaken when your conscious mind is fading? Or when someone close to you is at death's door? A blast of flames escaped his left hand straight to Katsuki, who used an explosion to counter it. Before they could counterattack, a wave of flames escaped Endeavor knocking them both away. Both of you cannot close this distance. Your close-range attacks are useless. Your long-range attacks are easily avoidable or can be preemptively stopped. Endeavor stated the facts. This was the first time they were completely blocked off from causing any damage to their opponent, and they had to minimize the damage to the city. Shoto was their only reference for this fight, and in the limited number of times he used his flames, they understood it wasn't something to mess with. Yet, Endeavor was a whole other level. The experience, the power, the technique all of this together embodied Endeavor. His irritation at them could be justified, they didn't know how to deal with Endeavor in a straight-on fight. This is pathetic. The tone Endeavor was using made it seem as though he was resigned to the fact. I know your type, both of you excel under pressure. You thought of this as a test, which is why you are not thinking in a manner befitting your positions. An unholy amount of heat shot out of Endeavor, the protector restraints made to limit the abilities of the pros melted and dropped to the floor. Very well, no longer will I consider you two as children. From this moment forth, you are my opponents, and I shall give it my all. With that the world was then bathed in flames. Like a ravenous beast the flames spread everywhere devouring everything in sight. No longer was this a city. It was hell. Izuku and Katsuki were a scant few meters away when the flames erupted from Endeavor's frame. Izuku was the first to snap out from his shock, a chain of light wrapped around Katsuki as Izuku shot to the sky. The ground was no longer an option, Endeavor had made sure of it. The tarmac melted and buildings were bathed in red from the heat he was generating. Izuku's flight allowed both of them to evade rampaging fire, yet the assault had only begun. A large ray of flame shot Izuku down causing both to crash into a building. Endeavor launched a barrage of fireballs not even giving them a minute of respite. The orbs of fire struck true causing a large explosion. After a scant few seconds, an explosion shot from the smoke. Surprise marred Endeavor's face as he was a second late in dodging causing some stray debris to hit him. The smoke blew away to show a heavily blackened Izuku, whose majestic attire shone through the soot and bakugo with an extended palm. Barely after a second ticked, Endeavor charged another ray of flames which was met with a ray of aether, Katsuki rushed in close to get in his guard. 
Endeavor was brought to close combat with Katsuki, who augmented all his strikes with a series of explosions. Yet, Endeavor showcased his prowess by letting only minimal strikes to hit him. It was then Katsuki disengaged for Izuku begin his assault, body cloaked in his majestic attire allowed him access to 20% of OFA without repercussions and the superhuman powers of his ether at a moment's notice. His fists blurred, each meeting a fist of flame. The barrage of fists shot faster and faster until the impossible. Endeavor in a feat of power caught Izuku's fist causing Izuku's eyes to widen. Taking advantage Endeavor buried his fist into Izuku and roared as he let another ray of flames hit Izuku point blank. Thrusting him towards Bakugo who was knocked away trying to catch him. Izuku was in a fit of coughs trying to regain his breath. Bakugo on the other hand was slowly giving in to his anger. Best genus teachings had caused him to lock away his rage yet it was clawing away for release. Izuku was not at battle capacity. It was up to him to make stop Endeavor's assault. No longer could he afford to take a back seat in this fight. This was no different than the USJ. And so with a primal roar he embraced his rage. The emotions fueled him pushing his fatigue away, sharpening his senses. The roaring pain was now just a dull ache. No longer would he hold back. He was gonna go beyond. Plus Ultra. Endeavor braced himself as his opponent rushed at him with seemingly no abandon. He was almost disappointed until the child blinded him with an explosion. It was almost instantaneous. The moment he was blinded he heard the telltale of another explosion and along with it he felt the first clear hit of the day, a haymaker to the face. And from then on it was a continuous barrage of close combat strikes. Each hit seemed to be without technique, yet he could feel it. Each of them were targeted. Each strike was getting stronger and stronger. He was finally being shown the talent buried in this chill young man. Yet, it was his duty to bring out more of this potential. I owe Shoto that much. Katsuki could feel his body slow, yet he pushed against his limits. He had to win. He couldn't lose, he refused to give in. Because, at the end, no matter how bad it seems a hero has to win in the end. Endeavor caught his fist squeezing it with his inhuman strength. A scream tore through Katsuki as the pain built. He bit his tongue as he focused through the pain. Even if it means breaking himself. With a roar he released an explosion with his free hand yet the grip on his hand didn't loosen the slightest. Over. He couldn't release the pin that contained the stored sweat that allowed him to use his maximum power without any risk, yet he knew. And over. As he stared at the silhouette of the number two hero, he knew he wouldn't win against him unless he took risks. I hope you're ready for this endeavor, because I don't plan on losing. Maybe it was the way Katsuki said it, but the moment he said those words Endeavor felt an unnatural chill shoot through his spine. Those words held an unmeasurable weight. It was a statement on how far he was willing to go. Katsuki didn't notice the train of emotions on Endeavor's face as he charged up the largest explosion he could. He could feel the intensity. He could feel his muscles cry against the buildup yet all of it was silenced by his willpower. And over again. Endeavor saw the explosion building up. The way Katsuki forgo his support equipment and focus channeling all that power onto the palm of his hand, Endeavor had read Katsuki wrong. This child had no quarrels in breaking his own body for victory. He knew how to channel his rage. He knew the cost of victory. Take this. Izuku watched as the explosion blanketed the entire area. It was situations like these that made his respect for Katsuki grow. Even against an opponent like the number two Katsuki showed his power and skills with no hesitation. It irked him that Katsuki was outperforming him. He was the successor of All Might. He was the one who was trusted with one for all. Yet, in the face of danger, he couldn't bring out even a speck of that power. Rather, he wasn't letting the power out. He recalled the instances wherein he had showcased his abilities, each time ended with him in the hospital bed. His lack of control and practice clearly showed. The dust settled to show two silhouettes. Kastuki stood tall, his gauntlets clearly displaying signs of breakage. Izuku wasn't surprised. The intensity of the explosion far surpassed the norm. But what surprised him was Endeavor. He was far away from Katsuki. A wall of flames receded to show the hero with more than a few scratches. His armor was damaged and in fact he was bleeding from various injuries. Though the damage seemed superficial, it was proof of the damage Katsuki was able to deliver on his own. Quit staring you idiot! Izuku turned to Katsuki who was staring at Endeavor. The words came out with a weak tone. It's your turn. With that Katsuki passed out, 
Izuku rushed to catch him doing so just before Katsuki's head hit the ground. Izuku's focus shifted to Endeavor, bracing for an attack. He was surprised when he didn't feel a buildup of heat the moment he rushed to catch Katsuki. Lay him away from our fight. His abilities and personality are a far cry from what I had initially thought. He has earned my respect. Izuku was surprised at the words. In fact, he was almost expecting a double cross at that instant. Yet he was further surprised at Endeavor's next words. I have already told you before. I am through with this folly of an exam. My only concern is to see if you are worth Shoto's time or not. And that child has earned his rest. The same cannot be said for you though. So, let him rest while you prove your worth. Izuku knew better than argue against him. He shifted Katsuki's weight onto his back. Each step he took away from from Endeavor, the more he felt the panic set in. Endeavor has completely discarded any rules and regulations. In fact, he was wondering why none of the teachers had stepped in to stop Endeavor. The more he thought about it, the less sense it seemed to make. As he laid Katsuki near a fountain, he took a deep breath to calm himself. His hands were shaking as he thought about his upcoming fight. Endeavor stared at the figure of Midori Izuku, an anomaly if he ever saw one. He could feel the barely restrained power, yet the child showed not but a glimpse of this power. It felt as if he was limiting himself, and frankly it was getting on his nerves. Tell me, Midoriya, why is it that you've not showcased your power? I've heard and read various reports regarding your abilities. The manner in which Endeavor asked displayed real curiosity. You have displayed it before time and time again. You've trained your quirk for a long time as well. So why is it you are holding back? Izuku himself didn't know the answer. He had reason that it was because this was an exam. He was in a city, where he had to restrain himself from causing collateral damage. But deep down he knew why. It was fear. Not the fear of endeavor, not the fear of failing, no it was the fear of his own power. Much like what Kaminari and Mina, he preferred fighting robots than human opponents. Villains were another story, his mind was able to limit the strength he used to attack them but against endeavor who was either a machine nor a villain, he was at a loss of what to do. Gran Torino and All Might had been the only two people he had fought with who fit that special section. Izuka looked ahead at endeavor, who was getting impatient at the silence. He thought about not answering or at least lying, yet something convinced to spill the beans. My control over my quirk is not something that I'm proud of. Each day I learn something new about it. Each day I'm reminded that my power is something that cannot be used without being restrained. And at times I feel it has a mind of its own, but I was wrong. It's just acting on whatever I think of, and I'm scared of the damage it'll do whenever I might slip up. Endeavor stared at Izuku. The reasoning while childish and honestly seemed unwarranted had merit. The raw power he wielded was nothing to scoff at. He could count the number of pros that could match his son, Bakugo and Midoriya in one hand in terms of raw destructive power. And not to mention that people were so indescribably fragile, and considering the child's understanding of healing, it might have been his pacifistic side talking. Yet, he couldn't let this potential to be wasted. And this is your solution? Locking away your power! and unleashing it with your imperfect control hoping that it knocks out the enemy before extracting its toll on your body? Endeavor's voice no longer had the curiousness in fact he seemed to be struggling with restraining his flames. How selfish, or... Should I say how naive thinking that limiting yourself will help solve your problems, when in reality all you're doing is lying to yourself and everyone around you? Izuku felt each word hit him as though they were lashes from a whip, each of them tore at his reasoning. It was then Endeavor said something that he had forgotten about, something he said to one of his closest friends. I believe you were the one who told Shoto that he could not win by using only half of his strength, yet here you are, contradicting your own words. Tell me, Midoriya, do you believe that you can always trust in your power to plow through your enemy? And no, you must understand your power like the back of your own hand. I will make sure you leave this training ground as someone who can control his power. Even if it means I have to break you. There was no tells, no twitches on his body but the moment he finished those words, the flames leapt at him, ready to devour his very being. His majestic attire roared back to life, and within a moment he shot to the air to evade the flames. The flames were hotter than what he felt before, they had focused their fight to a section of the city, limiting the damage, yet Endeavor cared little for all of that. Izuku channeled his reserves of ether to an array of constructs, each of them shone a brilliant gold. All of them shot towards Endeavor's position, the flames surrounding Endeavor rushed to make a spiraling dome of fire which met the construct's head-on, 
and ground away at their shapes. The dome then exploded outwards destroying all the constructs Izuku sent. The smoke from the explosion blinded Izuku from seeing Endeavor's position. He prepared to launch another volley of swords when suddenly a barrage of fireballs exited the smoke cloud. Izuku immediately dodged as best as he could. All the fireballs were small and merely shifting his body would let him dodge. So he was completely unprepared when a blanket of flames shot from the cloud. His ether rushed forward and made a barrier which blocked the flames from striking him directly, but the heat generated caused Izuku to leave the shield and swerve away from the flames descending to the ground. Izuku crashed to the ground, panting as he stared at the figure slowly walking out of the smoke cloud. Flames danced around Endeavor's frame, ready to annihilate his opponent at a moment's notice. Come now, Midoriya, I'm nearing the end of my patience. I've given you countless opportunities to initiate a counterattack, yet you refuse to strike back? Very well if you still don't take this seriously then. I'll make you remember exactly who I am. Endeavor's stance changed, a fist reared back, all the flames that raged around him seemed to like match fires compared to the orb of flames that encased Endeavor's fists, the heat, the power. I am the flame hero, Endeavor and you cannot hope to defeat me half-heartedly. Every instinct screamed at Izuku to dodge but it was too late. Flash fire fist jet burn. The flames came out as a concentrated ray of flames, Izuku's mind raced, the world slowing to a crawl each possible outcome calculated and discarded until finally. Manifest, Ro Ais. The seven petal shield came into reality just in time to block the blast. Izuku grunted as the first petal broke, and bit back a scream as the next three broke in quick succession. The ray of flames ended soon after, Endeavor was surprised at seeing the same defense he saw at the sports festival. It seemed as though the child had improved it even further. He could feel his powers grow a bit dull. The repercussions for using all those taxing moves were finally setting in. He had limited himself on using only long-range moves, a far cry from his close-range fighting style. Yet he felt it was going to be worth it. The look in the boy's eyes was changing. Those eyes of molten gold were rippling with power. Izuka cradled his right arm close to his chest. With a quirk like his, pain was foreign to him. His ether had always made sure to quickly heal any and all wounds, so it was no surprise that pain slowed him down. Yet, it triggered another thing. His fight-or-flight instincts would run rampart when he was in pain. And much like before, his instincts were demanding him to either run or fight. Endeavor was a bit ruffled up, a few scratches on his costume, and his light panting were all that he gave away. He had to fight, there was no question in that. All he had to focus on was trying to control his power. He could feel his desire to win, building. Whenever that happened he would eventually lose control of his power. But he could feel what Endeavor was trying to convey. The same thing he himself had gotten through to Shodo on the sports festival stage. Endeavor was telling him that he could take whatever he was willing to dish out. He could feel his ether thumbing underneath his skin. His powers were at his beck and call. He had to finish this as soon as possible. Dragging this out would just end with him losing. He had to strike. His majestic attire had healed his wounds. Any pain he felt was now just echoes in his mind. He only had to ensure his exhaustion doesn't take over. Izuka blurred from his position, reappearing in front of him midway through a swing. Endeavor didn't seem surprised at the move. In fact it seemed he had expected this move already. With speed that didn't suit his build he met the punch with one of his own. The blast from the collision was unexpected. Endeavor was thoroughly surprised at the display of power Midoriya was showing. It showed that he was finally taking him seriously. The recoil caused both of them to jump back. Izuka wasted not but a second. As soon as his feet touched the ground he blasted right against Endeavor. A flurry of fists were launched at Endeavor. Slowly but surely Izuka gave into his power each strike fueled by his ether, and in response Endeavor fought back as fierce as he could. Izuka could feel a grin take over his face. He was no longer holding back. Each strike was fueled by his desire to win, like before he kept chanting the same mantra in his head. Win. No longer could he hold back, this was a fight for his future as a hero. He would show Endeavor exactly what he wanted to see, the power he had been bestowed. The majestic attire shone as he poured more power into his strikes, wind storms broke through with each clash with Endeavor. Even with his strikes capable of causing serious damage Endeavor displayed his prowess by matching him blow for blow. His upper limit with OFA was 20%, and it grew when used in sync with Aether. 
it was enough raw power to solo a group of enemies. Yet, as testament to why he was the number two Endeavor was taking it all on his own. While Izuku was trying his best to knock Endeavor out, the hero himself was having quite a bit of trouble following Midoriya's moves. He felt the shift midway through battle. It didn't feel as though he was fighting a child anymore. In fact, he felt his own battle lust slowly take over. The rush he was feeling, along with the nagging feeling of similarity between the fighting style of All Might and Midoriya was growing more apparent. The cloak of energy encasing Midoriya's frame was boosting his physical powers to heights that surprised Endeavor. His body was built to tank hits. Even with Midoriya's increase in strength he was sure that he could handle the blows. His pain tolerance and durability were made from years of training and fights would not fall. That didn't mean he was shrugging of the blows. Each blow that struck were getting harder and harder. It was a testament to Midoriya's strength. But there was one fatal flaw. Endeavor weaved through a particularly overstretched blow. With a roar he buried his fist into Izuka's stomach that sent Izuka crashing towards a pole. Midoriya's fighting style is too linear. It was halfway through that Endeavor noticed it. His linearity was the only reason Endeavor was able to read his moves again. His overwhelming physical strength was held back by his rigid movements. Izuka hacked as he tried to breathe again. Endeavor had dealt more damage in that single blow that he himself had ever given to Endeavor this entire fight. Your physical powers are noteworthy, but you telegraph your moves beforehand, not only that your style of fighting is too rigid. All of your strength is being distributed unevenly. Endeavor listed off his weaknesses one by one. You have to dig deeper within yourself, grab a hold of the power that you displayed in the USJ. Endeavor unleashed a red-hot flame that rocketed towards Izuku. Sensing the power in the attack, Izuku fired of a wave of ether and shot back. His mind ran through all possibilities of landing a successful attack, until it landed on one plan. Izuku roared as his unleashed a barrage of sword constructs. Battle Arts, Heavenly Sword Barrage Each sword shot at breakneck speeds towards Endeavor, and like all previous times the flames rushed to protect Endeavor, but he had expected that. Manifest Enkidu The Chains of Heaven made its first appearance in the battle and bound Endeavor's post-ion. For the first time in battle Endeavor seemed surprised and if one looked closely enough a trace of fear. Izuka wasted no times, all his finishers needed time to prepare, it was another weakness in his fighting style. His ether flowed from his body. His majestic attire faded from view as he channeled all his energy into one move. Endeavor knew that move. He knew that unless he did something drastic it would leave him incapacitated especially at this range. The flames roared to life again. It was already too late to stop the blast from launching he had to counter it. He berated himself in falling for the trap as the flames ate away the chains restricting him. I hope you survive this Midoriya. You've really forced my hand. Izuka's ether had a dark gold tint. He was sure it would knock out Endeavor at this range, and with a roar he fired off his most powerful attack. Great Shining Heaven A wave of the densest ether blasted towards Endeavor. Izuka had already made the decisive blow, pouring every drop of power into this attack, and so it was no wonder what happened next caused him to despair. Flash Fire Fist Blaze His ether was stopped by a blast of flames that never let up its heat and power increasing beyond whatever Endeavor had dished out ever before. The heat was enough to melt the tarmac where the blasts met. Izuka couldn't let up his blast. The moment he did he wasn't sure he would survive. Izuka roared as he channeled more and more power into the attack. His mind slowly dimming everything around him. The colors faded around him. His body protested against channeling this much unfiltered energy. He dropped to his knees as the he finally gave in. The ether dropped in power and not a moment later did the beam of fire make its way toward Izuku, yet it didn't strike his body. In fact the attack missed by a wide margin. The wave of heat that accompanied it was powerful, and in the middle was Endeavor finally showing his exhaustion. Endeavor looked tired, his breathing was heavy and his armor was dented by Enkidu. His eyes were unfocused. But he hadn't fallen, he still stood. With a few inhales his eyes once again focused and an undetectable rush of relief washed over his face. He was worried the blasts would cause irreparable harm to the child. He didn't want to cause more harm to Shoto in any manner, not when they were finally building back the old bridge they had. Endeavor made steady steps towards Izuku each one echoing over their makeshift battlefield. Endeavor had finally exhausted Izuku. Now he would make sure to see Izuku control the bottomless ocean of power stored within him. Izuku watched on as the figure of Endeavor continued his pace towards him. 
Endeavor looked a bit tired, that much was a given but compared to his own condition where he could feel every part of his body roar in pain, he couldn't even feel his ether. He had lied to himself by holding back. Maybe the outcome would have been different if he had gone all out from the start. Maybe Katsuki wouldn't have been so spent. Maybe dash. He resigned himself to his fate. He had put up a fight. He poured all of his power in the last few minutes, yet he still knew he could have done better. His vision blurred each passing second. This was it. His final gambit didn't work. He was done. Remember, when you are at your limit. The figure of Endeavor faded. No longer was he in the training ground. He was back in the field and he could see the silhouette of one of the eight change. Color bled into the figure. No longer was it a shadow in his mind. In front of him was a beautiful-looking woman who gazed past him. Her voice seemed to resonate through his head. It demanded all of his attention. His ether grew restless. The sun, in his mind, was sending out flares of light, illuminating the world in a golden glow. And in the middle of it all, the woman looked more angel than human. Remember why you clench your fist. Izuku didn't know what had happened. The moment those words were uttered, the sun bathed the world in all its glory. His power was slowly returning. Green flares of energy raced across his skin, slowly turning golden. Yet he could feel his instincts take over yet again. His subconscious mind had wretched control from him, and continued the fight. Endeavor was only a few meters away from Izuku before he stopped. The boy's body was now glowing. It spared no mind to the wounds focusing solely on one thing. Power. A presence came down on the field. An aura emerged from Izuku. Endeavor could feel himself being weighed down. The pressure being exerted the aura was tremendous. Izuku's eyes were shining with power, yet Endeavor could feel that it wasn't being channeled in the same finesse it was before. This was what Endeavor wanted. He now needed Izuku to take reins on his power in doing so he would understand his abilities and break past his mental barriers. With a twitch of Izuku's fingers a barrage of swords came rushing at Endeavor who immediately retaliated with a tidal wave of flames. The flames covered the entire area, making him lose sight of Izuku. That is until, a golden figure shot to the skies from the flames. Izuku continued with a barrage of blasts. Endeavor dodged most of it, and returned with a volley of fireballs. Izuku was quick to react encasing himself in a sphere of ether. The volley soon ended and from the ensuing dust cloud Izuku rushed to close quarters with Endeavor, his body relying only on the hours of practice that made actions ingrained to his muscle memory. Endeavor was finding it difficult to defend against the barrage. While the moves were telegraphed the strength behind each strike wasn't something to make light of. Endeavor had to work fast. The sooner he was able to make the brat under control the better. His flames were clashing with the golden energy. The boy was no longer in control. It was common with many. The subconscious mind would take initiative and put the body in a flight-or-fight mode. Doing so had caused many lives to be saved. But for a hero it was unacceptable. You must always be in control of your actions. If not you become a threat to both yourself and others. Ducking underneath a haymaker, Endeavor grasped Izuku's head and slammed him to the ground. I know you're in their midoriya. It is an embarrassment for you to be in this situation. The statement was met with Izuku's body releasing an omnidirectional wave of energy. Endeavor's grip held on yet the assaults were getting more powerful each passing minute. If he couldn't bring him back in control, he would have to knock him out. But doing so would cause more harm than good. Endeavor once again clashed with Midoriya. Each move was aimed to lock Izuku's movement. You must take the reins of your body. It's your power, isn't it? Each word was accompanied with a retaliation from Izuku. Yet Endeavor's tactics never changed. He would not get another opportunity like this ever again. Soul Cape Izuku couldn't take his eyes off the woman in front of him. He knew who this was. Emotions swirled in his chest. It was as if he was meeting an old friend. Yet for the life of him he couldn't understand why. The only thing he could remember was a name. Shimura Nana. All Might's predecessor and sensei, yet why was she here? All Might had mentioned her sacrifice in passing, and he had made no mentions of how she looked like or anything of the sort. And now before him, in this field was the seventh user of OFA. His mind was suddenly torn away from the sight when he could feel his ether once again course through his body. His mind latched onto the flow of energy. Yet he had underestimated the speed and power. It wasn't the calm ocean of power he was used to. This was a raging torrent of power. He felt his powers lashing out once again. Scenes from the USJ came rushing back. His powers had utterly destroyed Anemu. 
there was no telling what it would do to Endeavor if it registered him as a threat. In front of Shimmer and Nana was slowly making his way towards him, merely a scant few meters between them. His body felt as if it weighed a ton, it refused to obey his commands and within seconds she was by his side. Izuku watched as she raised her hand. Izuku braced himself for a strike yet all he felt was a gloved hand cup his cheek. Izuku opened his eyes to see Nana with a beautiful smile as she said, Remember your origin. A torrent of memories flooded his mind, each of them were foreign yet he could feel a unique nostalgia to each of them, as if he were there. He could feel each punch his predecessor threw, every hit she received, he could feel her emotions, and as soon as it came it grinded to a halt. Izuku could feel sweat pouring down his face, his mind was racing to store the accumulated memories. When he looked for his predecessor all that greeted him was the empty field. It was the first time he felt it here, but suddenly he felt an inexplicable loneliness. Oriya, it is an embarrassment for you to be in this situation. The booming voice of Endeavor brought back a rush of memories as to why he was here. His powers were lashing out. He could feel it. It was unnoticeable at first but the more he concentrated he could feel it. His connection with his powers were clearer. As if there was no static to distract him, he shook his head to focus on his only hope of regaining control of his body, his ether. Once again he tried to grasp the tendril of either that pulsed with power, he tried to control it, to relink himself with his body yet all of his tries were unsuccessful. His mind was exhausted, a skull-splitting headache reminded him of the last few minutes. He was powerless, he was weak, his mind was in turmoil, he had no idea what was happening outside, his indecisiveness had caused Katsuki to get eliminated early on. His body refused to obey him in these moments. He was a fail. You must take the reins of your body. It's your power, isn't it? Izuku's eyes widened at those words. It's your power, isn't it? The same words he had screamed out to Todoroki were being yelled back to him. In all of this he had forgotten the most important thing. It was his power. Izuku wiped away his blurry vision. This was not what was expected of him. His teachers, his friends, his mother, they all expected him to win, even Endeavor expected this. And he would be damned before he lets them down. Izuka grabbed the pulsing line of Aether, the torrent of power once again trying to throw him off, yet he roared as he held on forcing his will onto the connection, each second felt like a tug of war until finally his Aether gave in. Izuka's vision turned white before the world bled back into color, the entire vicinity was bathed in flames. The fight had been contained to the area demolished by Endeavor before. He didn't know whether it was just luck or not but that didn't matter. His body protested against any movement. His head felt like it was about to split into two, and there a few feet from him was Endeavor who actually looked as if he had taken a few good hits. Endeavor was breathing much more heavily than before. His flames were looking much more ferocious than it did before but gradually lessened as time passed. It's about time you came back. Endeavor barked out his stance shifting to a more relaxed one. While Endeavor was still cautious, the brat was different than before. His ether had stopped pouring out in waves and he also stopped attacking which meant the brat was able to take control again. You wasted too much time. Your body is most likely incapable of proceeding with this fight. Endeavor looked Izuka top to bottom. The kid was struggling to stay conscious. He felt a tad bit of regret for what he was about to do. Too bad you don't have a choice in the matter. Endeavor rocketed towards Izuki giving only a small window for retaliation but to both Endeavor's and Izuku's own surprise he dodged with a fluidity he didn't possess before. Izuku was not given time to dwell on it as Endeavor launched a ray of flames towards him. Izuku's body was suddenly caught in a bind as it felt like he was trying to do two things at once, dodging and for the life of him, punch the flame. The instinct to dodge won out, yet it was haphazard and left him on the ground. Endeavor was surprised at the predicament. He had dodged the almost unseeable rush yet he was on the ground at the slower moving blast of flames. The brat forced himself to stand. Endeavor knew that the brat wasn't gonna last more than a minute. It was for the better. The brat had shown him his potential as a hero. A diamond in the rough. His control was the glaring weakness. He had dealt with the same and saw it again in Shoto. The greater power you are capable of channeling, the less you'll be able to control it. Izuku forced his body to stand. He couldn't back out now. He refused to let it end like this. If he didn't stand up now, the when could he? Maybe it was because his emotions were on the high, and his mind was still a jumbled mess. But for that moment he felt as if he had been in this position countless times before. Each of them fueled his? 
conviction each time he was able to rise above and beyond. His fists clenched, and in less than a second he shot off from his previous position, Lefe and ether flooding his veins for his final assault. The accumulation of memories had caused his fighting style to change. It wasn't as sharp as his old one, yet the new one carried a different air, almost as if he had altered the style after experiencing all the counters to it. It was sloppy, but it would have to make do. Endeavor was surprised when the onslaught begun. The boy was rushing in for the last time. This would be his final barrage till he rests. The cloak of ether was absent. Instead it seemed as though golden lightning was exploding from his body. Each strike was ferocious and carried all that he had to give. The fighting style had changed as well. It was a mix of two different styles. They clashed against each other at some moments, yet otherwise it was a solid foundation to build on. His parallel thoughts grinded to a halt when a punch slipped through his guard and struck his gut. Pain exploded from the point of contact and almost caused him to fall to his knees, and not even a second later the brat turned his body to deliver a spin kick that sent him flying. Endeavor crashed into a building and had to actually take a second to compose himself. That strike was much more fluid it was as if he was getting better after each passing second. This child was more dangerous than he thought. Endeavor had to end this now. Any more and the child's body won't hold, and he might actually have to do something drastic to stop it. The choice was taken out of Endeavor's hands when Azuka shifted to an all-too-familiar stance. Detroit. You wouldn't. Endeavor's shout was accompanied by his own ultimate charging, at the kid's power level. If that move was half as powerful as the original, he would need to take this seriously. Smash. Izuka's fist struck the air in front of him, and the accompanied the blow was comparable to one of All Might's yet much like before his arm could handle only so much recoil resulting in a drop in power. Endeavor roared as he launched his own ultimate move to counter, the resulting smoke cloud blanketed the entire area. Izuka's vision was slowly blurring, yet he forced himself to watch to see if his gamble paid off. It was clanking of boots that told him otherwise, the figure of Endeavor walked through the smoke, the upper right part of his costume in shambles. With each step Izuka could taste the defeat, he could feel his body giving up. Don't you even think of passing out! The shout from Endeavor shocked his body back to reality. Endeavor was right in front of him, arms crossed and flames burning. Izuka struggled to maintain consciousness, and he was glad he was able to. You pass as well. Izuka's mind screeched to a halt, he passed. He had forgotten about what Endeavor said after he regained control of his body. He had impressed Endeavor enough to pass him. He looked up to see Endeavor's face with a rather angry scowl. We will be having words after your recovery. Make sure to bring the other brat and Shoto as well. For now your sensei will take you to the nurse. Izuka was confused about what he was talking about until he felt a familiar energy signature coming towards them. He turned and saw All Might walking towards them, with a face that was a mix between happiness and displeasure. Endeavor, while I'm glad you took an interest in teaching the next generation, wouldn't it have been wise to follow the test rules and held back a bit? The question from All Might was met with a small glare from Endeavor which slowly faded to a poker face. All Might returned the glare with his smile, while simultaneously supporting Izuka's body. It would have been easier, but with brats like them, easy won't cut it. They need to be pushed, in doing so they'll drag the rest of them to their level. You know very well what I'm talking about. Endeavor walked past them after that, leaving Izuku and All Might in the training ground. All Might sighed at his colleague's behavior, it wasn't anything new. Endeavor always became detached when talking to him. He head and looked at Izuku who was swaying on his feet, before softly muttering, Kakin, finally letting All Might take him to the infirmary. All Might sighed at his protege as selflessness, it brought more heartache than he had believed possible. He picked up Izuku and carried him to the infirmary, much like he had done with young Bakugo when he arrived. He had reached around the time Izuku had fired his great shining heaven. It had taken Aizawa and his sensei to stop him from rushing to the field. They convinced him that the, their students were not being challenged and needed this test to grow. He didn't disagree with that statement. It was just that he didn't want Endeavor to be the one delivering the lesson but it seemed like his fears were unfounded as both of them were all well and safe, even when Endeavor made a show of destroying the protector restraints. He had held back as much as he could without making it obvious, something he didn't expect from the flame hero. He watched as recovery girl checking on Izuka after he placed him on one of the beds, 
The other students had witnessed the entire fight on screen. In fact, theirs was the last fight to finish. He could feel the change in Izuku. When he had lost control again, he was certain that Endeavor would stop holding back and mercilessly beat him to submission. Yet, he brought Izuku back under control and made him stronger as a result. Then was the final attack Izuku used, a move that he himself created, Izuku. Repeated the same, in the same exact motion right down to the release and power. If his body was strong enough to withstand the recoil, he was sure that the entire training ground would have been decimated. It showed how powerful Izuku was, and will be. It proved how worthy of a successor he was, yet seeing the burden placed on his shoulder, he found himself wondering, was it worth it? Is this how you felt when you gave me OFA, Sensei? He walked out of the infirmary, head filled with thoughts of OFA and his protege. Katsuki scowled at the black screen near the infirmary. He had watched the entire fight along with Todoroki and Yayorozu. He had woken up in the infirmary in a surprise. It seemed that Endeavor had broken the rules by destroying his protector restraints, resulting in both of them passing but the principal had made it clear that they weren't to interfere with the test. All Might was the one to carry him here. It was around the time when Izuka had lost control of his quirk that he had woken up and continued to watch the rest of the fight. He was surprised at the manner in which Endeavor fought Izuku. He was stressing on the matter of control. He forced Izuku to come back in control. Katsuki clenched his fists. Even with all of that they had lost the fight. Even with the overwhelming strength they possessed, they couldn't defeat the number two hero and to add insult to injury he himself had been taken out of the fight early on. His power was nowhere near that of Izuku, and even Todoroki was more powerful than him. His techniques were enough to defeat a majority of the competition back in their youth, but he couldn't rely on small-scale attacks against titans like Endeavor. It was at these times he was thankful he went to Best Genus Hero Agency if it were in the past his rage would have consumed him causing him to indiscriminately lash out at anyone. But things were different now, his rage was just another source of power for him, with power like his and the other's emotions had a very important role in their life. Which was why Best Genus had stressed on absolute control over these emotions, there he had slowly changed his rage from a raging wildfire that destroyed everything in his path to a rage that swallowed his enemies much like a bottomless ocean. Power struggles may not be his forte compared to the other two, but the stronger the quirk, the more imprecise its attacks. Both Izuku and Todoroki relied too much on their overwhelming power to win, and the situations where they could use their abilities to their maximum were limited. While he had much better control, he lacked the overwhelming power they could produce and he had lesser restrictions in these limited areas. But he still needed to go beyond and become a well-rounded fighter. His goal never changed. Surpass All Might He was the incarnation of power, the tallest wall in the world. He was a person who didn't sacrifice either control or power but rather, he combined both of them. And until he surpassed all might he would keep pushing himself. With that, he walked towards where the others were. Recovery girl stared at the prone form of Izuku. He was her first student whom she was teaching everything she could about healing. It was the first time she had met a person so hardworking and diligent. While she hadn't spent as time with as his other senseis and of course the doctor he spends his time in turning under. Izuka had wormed his way into her heart, which was why seeing him lying on the hospital bed so very often caused her so much grief. His power and ability with so many contradictions, an ability that could not only destroy but in fact heal. It was a quirk that was not restricted by their laws and logic. She had made sure to keep this information under wraps. Only a handful of people knew about All Might, but even less knew about Izuka's power. It was a surprise when she closely studied the quirk Izuka possessed. At the very beginning his quirk factors were unstable. While uncommon it wasn't that surprising, they had expected them to stabilize as he grew up yet the more he synchronized with his ether, the lesser number of quirk factors were detected, she had kept this hidden from him, fearing his reaction. Yet she had been startled to find out that instead of his quirk disappearing, it was changing him. By the end, he would no longer be limited by his physical frame. At times, she wanted to convince Izuku to stop his goal of becoming a hero. Instead, he could become an equally great healer. His powers would let him do so. But it would be an injustice for such talent to be locked away, never reaching its full potential. Not only that, she was sure that Izuku would never agree if she ever brought this up. And so she had to stay strong for the child she looked to as a grandson. He would become the greatest of them all. 
she would do anything in her power to make sure it happens. Her thoughts were grounded when she saw Izuku stir awake. Izuku rubbed his head as he found himself in the familiar walls of the infirmary room. He was glad this time it was just because of exhaustion. Last time he came with a serious injury recovery girl was quite hard to deal with. He turned his head to see recovery girl sitting next to him. He gave her an awkward smile, knowing what was about to come. I think I should stick a nameplate to this bed Izuku since you're so attached to it. I mean you keep coming back as soon as you can to it. Izuku's sweat dropped at his sensei's blunt words. Honestly child, you should stop pushing yourself this much. You're giving this old woman a heartache. Izuku honestly felt bad at that, even though he knew she was joking. He had noticed how his mother also behaved eerily similar to Recovery Girl whenever she was informed of his injuries. In the end, he just gave a small grin and told Recovery Girl that he would be fine. It was then he heard banging on the infirmary's door, he heard Recovery Girl sigh as she said, It's your friends and classmates, you were the last person to finish your exam. Young Bakugo was taken off the field earlier and was already awake midway through your fight with Endeavor. The others have been trying to get in since your exam was over, but I've kept them out. Izuku nodded at the info. His worries about Katsuki were put to rest and he wanted to know about everyone's results. He was about to ask Recovery Girl if they could be let in but was stopped with her follow-up. Izuku, you'll have to stop using your quirk for the next few days. Your quirk factors are unstable right now. It might cause your quirk to go haywire if you try to activate it. Your power is special, Izuku. It's never been documented, not to mention it's a quirk that isn't similar to your family line. So I don't want to risk anything. Please take it easy for the next few days. Spend time with your friends, read a book, and if you want my door is open for our lessons. Izuku looked like he wanted to refuse, but thinking about what happened during his fight he nodded slowly. With that recovery girl pressed a button unlocking the door and not a second later familiar faces slowly drew in. Yuraraka was bolting to where Izuku was with Ada berating her lack of conduct. Momo was also walking at a hurried pace but was also restraining herself from running. Shoto was next followed by Katsuki, both of whom were a bit roughed up but looked alright. Recovery girl watched as they all exchanged how their tests went. She let a small smile and went back to her work. Time skipped meeting with Endeavor and All Might. Izuku sighed as he saw Shoto twitch at an almost alarming frequency. He had not taken kindly of his father butting in and caused this much damage to his teammates. While he was happy that Shoto cared for both of them, he knew that Endeavor had done this to show them what they need to surpass. No matter what anyone said about him, Endeavor was a battle-hardened warrior with absolute control of his power. And that was something that Izuku could respect, especially considering the mysteries that surrounded his own abilities. A quirk that was one for all, capable of being passed on from one person to another. A power that carried the will of its predecessors, but it was much more. No longer was it a quirk, it was a semi-sentient entity that invoked itself as a power meant for one thing, and one thing only. To save everyone. It was never mentioned before, but he could feel it. Deep beneath his skin, down to the very last cell, he understood his purpose, as the successor of a power that had waged war against all evil. He had found the answer to why he had this power. Izuku clenched his fists. It was not only Ofei. His ether raised more questions than it answered. He had learned a lot from his time at the hospital. Treating a variety of afflictions and injuries he had a deep understanding of how quirks affect the body of the user. He had also learned more from Recovery Girl. While his aim was to find a way to heal All Might, he had learned something strange about how Ofei and Ether worked with each other. Both his quirks were unique. They worked together in a strange fashion something which was fascinating as well as terrifying. He couldn't wait to explain his interaction with Shimura Nana to All Might. It was amazing to think that his quirks were able to coexist. His thoughts were brought to a halt when he heard the doors open revealing both Endeavor and All Might. While All Might was having his signature smile Endeavor was a bit annoyed, yet he could see that he was happy that Shoto was here. Endeavor's gaze turned to him and Katsuki, and his eyes hardened once more. Izuka could feel the presence exuding from Endeavor. He had wondered why there was a stark difference between his sensei's presence and Endeavor's. While his sensei's presence was bright and warm, Endeavor was similar to a blazing sun on a desert that beat down on anyone who was near him. But the answer was evident. The aura or presence was the projection of what a person was. It was a tense silence as everyone gauged each other, and Endeavor was the one who set the talks in motion. I understand that this little team you set up is an old tactic one which was boxed away. 
barked Endeavor. The surprise couldn't be kept off their faces while they knew it wasn't uncommon for heroes to take on apprentices. They were a bit taken aback at the fact that this was, in fact, a shelved tactic. Izuku knew that this had Grand Torino's name written all over it. Izuku schooled his features as he listened to Endeavor's words. It's outdated for the sole reason that a single person cannot handle or lead a team of individuals with diverse powers and personalities. Endeavor ignored the outcries from the students as well as ignoring All Might who was about to begin his reasoning and continued. Which is why I shall act as one of the senseis to these three. The end of the sentence was met with an almost awkward silence as the trio was too stunned to speak and even All Might looked like he was at his wit's end. If Endeavor felt insulted his face betrayed nothing. I refuse to let Shoto be brainwashed by your nonsense, and I don't disagree with his teammates. They have potential, which is our duty to cultivate. All Might looked as if he was looking at a different person. It was surprising that Endeavor was saying any of this especially after the conversation they just had regarding his health. At the end of the conversation he had expected Endeavor to scream and berate him, but he had merely nodded and walked out. All Might was glad that Endeavor didn't know of his other form but merely noted that he possessed deteriorating health. It was bad, but it could have been worse. He watched as Endeavor explained to his students of how he was going to integrate his own training methods into their schedules as well as running patrols with him. He could see that Endeavor wasn't like his previous self, yet he couldn't help but feel as though this was all an excuse for something. And if he was right, it was to get a second chance with Shoto. To show to him that he changed. His mind focused again once he heard the door to the meeting room close. It was just him and... Izuku. He couldn't help but choke on the unbearable guilt that built up in him as he looked at the bruised form of Izuku. This child was his successor, the next symbol of peace, the person who will have to bear the weight of the entire world on his shoulders. Those golden eyes that shone with power, yet the same eyes had shed countless tears through all the training sessions where he had been pushed past his limits, over and over again but there was not a single ounce of hatred in them. A soul that couldn't be brought down by the darkness of the world, he had always wondered why Izuku had wanted to be a hero. Obsessing over it to the point, he had tunnel vision. Yet, he was grateful that Izuku was willing to do so. He was the hero this world sorely needed. Even if it wasn't the one it deserved. With these heavy thoughts on his mind, Tashinori listened to Izuku at how he the entire fight went. He focused his entire attention on Izuku's words from the beginning where Endeavor toyed around with them, with each strike simply bouncing off the body of Endeavor. Tashinori watched as Azuka continued to tell of the very emotions he felt as he fought against futility, and how happy he was when he met Hope. Then I met her sensei. I knew who it was even though it was my first time seeing her. I met your master, and it felt like she was teaching me, she told me. Remember, when you're at your limit. Those words, Tashinori's sunken eyes widened, he couldn't believe it. In fact, it was impossible. Remember the reason you clenched your fists. Yet his successor continued to speak the words that his master had imparted to him, and the way he spoke, it was as if he understood, as though he knew exactly what they meant. Remember your origin. For a moment Tashinori wasn't in a room talking to his successor, the scenery warped to a top of one of the many buildings in a city, and he was staring at the face of a woman, one who he considered as his own mother. Her mouth was stretched in a smile. A torrent of emotions washed over him. A small smile came upon his features. She truly was helping him even from beyond the grave. I see. To think OFA was just as his sensei imagined to be. A place where they could meet even if they couldn't in the real world. He wondered about his own time with OFA. He looked at Izuku. This child in front of him would be the one to bring them peace, true peace. It wasn't going to be anyone else. This was the will his successor had inherited from him. They continued to talk about the soul's cape that Azuka would find himself in whenever his powers evolved or in times of stress. All might explain that it might be a visualization of his powers which merged with himself, a common point where the powers met. Tashinori had no idea how to proceed with the developments of his successor's condition. Azuka had shown enormous power dwarfing majority of the pros. In fact, he was certain that Azuka had the capabilities to become a pro on his own. But that was never the end game. It was always All for One. Until All for One was out of the picture, the successors of OFA, including himself, could not rest easy. His thoughts were put to rest when Recovery Girl came in to explain the unstable quirk factors present. 
She further explained that if Izuku activated his combat-oriented moves then his quirk factors would start to tear Izuku's body apart. With that, both Izuku and Tashinori were left to their own devices. Time Skip Classroom Now your finals are over. I'm glad to say all of you passed the written portion of the exam, but we had failures in the practical portion. And because of that, all of you will go for the training camp. Izuku sighed as the rest of the class cheered, he had hoped that would be the case. While Ida complained about the frequency of his logical ruses, Eraser had merely gave his viewpoint and explained that those who failed would have extra training with him. The class was given a list of essentials to bring for the camp and was left to their devices. Soon enough discussions ended with the class deciding to go shopping together. Izuka had wanted to spend time with his mother but it seemed this would have to finish this first. He had been meaning to get a few clothes and some gear so it wasn't all that bad. Shopping Mall The majority of Class 1A had assembled to buy their equipment together. They had many people recognize them because of the sports festival, especially seeing as Izuku had been the winner. The crowd was a bit placated after a bit of pictures and soon enough the shopping went underway. They had decided to split up and meet later. Izuku was flanked by Momo and Urarika dragging him to one shop after the other. Izuku had been meaning to spend more time with them and really didn't mind the girl's exuberance. He had to admit, it was not like the others had mentioned at all. The other guys were worried that Izuku might snap at being dragged around by the two girls yet he felt almost privileged at the two asking for his input in everything they bought. Izuku also didn't spare any expense in purchasing anything that caught his fancy. His mom could be considered well off with her job and it's not a surprise that Izuku himself earns a rather large sum during his part-time work at the hospital. He had to make sure to visit the doctor during his break. They were very understanding of the developments in his academic life and had granted him a leave during his semesters at UA with only a request that he try and dedicate as much time as he could to further his own knowledge and return to work whenever possible. His other explained that it was because of his special talents and circumstances that he was allowed to work and the reason they were so keen on having him back. It was then he felt an accumulation of darkness. He knew this energy signature. Even though it felt like it was ages ago, he couldn't forget this feeling. The same one at the USJ, the one which accompanied the Numa. He dropped the shirt he was holding and rushed to the door. His mind was in a frenzy. His feet carried him as fast as they could. His thoughts were centered on the plans of being able to apprehend his target here. He nipped the butt at the tip. The entire plans of the League of Villains would crash to a halt. All Might, his sensei, would be safe. With a flurry of emotions he reached the place where he felt the concentration of darkness, his eyes searched everywhere until it rested on a shaking Aoyama. As he drew in closer he bit back a curse as his eyes met that of his target, Shigaraki Tamira. Neither of them moved a muscle, Izuku's body tensed at the shaking figure of Oyama next to Shigaraki. Shigaraki tightened his grip on Oyama's neck. A smile spread on his face as he saw the wonder position he found himself in. Don't worry, I won't kill him here, even though my fingers are itching too. Let's talk peacefully. The way Shigaraki had said it didn't ease Izuku a bit, yet he was powerless in this situation. With Oyama as a hostage, he couldn't make any careless moves. You can't kill him unless you were willing to get captured yourself. Izuka had said this with more confidence than what he actually had. It wasn't quite true about what he stated especially with the possibility of Kurojiri being here. His only hope was for someone from the UA or a pro to stumble upon them. I told you before, all I want to do is talk. Shigaraki drawled. And believe me I would have plenty of time to vanish if all I do is disintegrate his throat. These civilians won't notice me until it's too late. And at this range, my quirk will activate faster than yours. Izuku went pale at the threat. It wasn't just activation time. His quirk factors were still unstable. He'd tear himself apart by the time he got himself up and running. He threw a discreet glance at Aoyama and couldn't help but get worried when he saw that Aoyama was shaking like a leaf. But let's not do any of that. Izuku glared at Shigaraki as he continued talking as if they were old friends. All I need you to do is answer one question. Why is it that none of my actions are being noticed by the world? That trash of a hero killer is making headlines, while my numbers aren't even on the front page. I never even allowed Stain to be in the league, but the media seems to think otherwise. The fingers around Aoyama's throat twitch dangerously. Tell me why I'm being brushed aside. Izuka had to restrain himself from rushing in. At this range he wouldn't be able to do anything, so he took a deep breath as he repeated Tamira's question in his head. 
Izuku didn't understand the exact meaning at those words, but he had to buy time which meant answering the question. I don't know, at least I don't know the real reason, but for me, I can understand the motivation behind stain, even if I can't accept them. For us, it all started with all might. Stain was living by his ideals, but I don't know about you. I can neither accept you nor can I understand you. Izuka could see a shudder passing through Shigaraki. He tried to move to get closer and rush, but the fingers tightened around Oyama and started to choke him. That's it. That's why I hate both of you. It's because of all might. That insolent grin that makes it seem as though he can save everyone, yet it all makes sense now. It was at this time the pedestrians saw the three of them a few curious eyes staying focused in them longer than needed. Izuka hoped that none of them would recognize Tamira. It would lead to a bloodbath that he wasn't prepared for. Deciding to risk it, Izuka focused on the flow of ether and slowly channeled it to his entire body. His gamble was successful as the ether was able to strengthen his body for a fight, but he had to grit his teeth as he felt his body being slowly ripped apart. His senses slowly picked up on Momo and Uraraka coming towards him, he had to work fast. Turning to Shigaraki, he saw the grin on his face making sure to memorize as much as possible before speaking. You got what you needed, Shigaraki. Leave this place before you get caught. Shigaraki's expression changed to that of anger causing Izuku to berate himself on screwing up, but it was put to rest when Shigaraki nodded and released his hold on Aoyama. Remember, if you follow me, you'll have at least a dozen dead bodies on your conscience. With that he started to wave through the crowds disappearing right around the time Momo and Uraraka showed up. Izuka shuddered as he let his ether die down when he felt the remains of the darkness warp away, leaving the mall empty of his presence. He rushed to Oyama who hadn't budged from his spot. He could see that he was really shaken up. He felt Momo and Uraraka sit right next to him. They too tried to comfort Aoyama. In the end, he explained the situation to both Momo and Uraraka causing them to become as white as a sheet. They were about to call the police when Izuka stopped them, telling them that it would be useless. He instead went to his cell and called Aizawa-sensei and explained everything. He placated his sensei's worries by confirming again and again that Shigaraki had indeed warped away with the help of Kurojiri and that they weren't in any immediate danger. Even so, Aizawa and present Mike had come to accompany the students back to their homes explaining the situation to each of them. Aoyama was immediately taken to Recovery Girl where he was given a thorough checkup and was scheduled private personnel for any trauma he may have gained during the event. Aizawa told him that he was glad that Izuka kept his cool in a what was a hostage situation. After a few questions about Shigaraki and whatever info, Izuka managed to get he was dropped to his house. It was when he entered the kitchen he saw his mother stirring a hot pot on the stove. After a tense few moments she turned to Izuku her eyes a bit red with tear stains on her face. Izuka wasted not but a moment as he engulfed his mother in a hug. He knew that his mother supported his dream, but the call from his sensei must have shaken her soul. He felt his shirt dampened with his mother's tears. Izuka lost track of time as he slowly heard his mother's sobs die down slowly. Next Morning Classroom I'm sure all of you heard the developments that happened yesterday. Because of this we are changing our summer plans entirely. The entire class erupted into murmurs at the information. The fact that one of the villains would be capable of targeting you in the open has caused us to accelerate our course plan and made this training camp all the more necessary. Izuka stared ahead with a blank look if he had been able to capture Shigaraki all of this hassle would be unneeded. He bit his tongue. His mother's state had dealt an emotional blow he was unprepared for. He could understand his mother's concern, but this was bigger than just his own life. He was the inheritor of a power that was the only hope against the greatest of all evils. He had to become the next symbol of peace and save everyone. His life was inconsequential in the bigger picture, this power, this body. It was made to save. A chalk piece made contact with Izuku's head causing him to return to reality. Izuku, did you listen to anything I just said? Aizawa had said it with an annoyed voice yet his eyes showed concern at the boy who was in the middle of everything. Izuku gave a nervous chuckle, causing Aizawa to sigh. Your vice president will bring you up to date. With that the semester is over and get ready for the summer camp. Soon enough the only ones left were Izuku and the gang. A moment later they all huddled together around Izuku, each of them with varying levels of concern. Momo took the initiative and explained the changes in the summer training camp. After that, an awkward silence filled the room as they all waited for Izuku's reply. It was when Shoto was about to speak that Izuku finally looked up. 
Guys, no matter what happens, we have to get stronger. Strong enough to be able to protect anyone in danger. The others were surprised at those words yet they couldn't find themselves to utter a word. They nodded at the words and continued to converse about the plans to train at the camp. Time skip first day of summer. Everyone please form a single file. Izuku shouted as he walked around. They had been informed that their training would be handled by a special team of heroes helping them break past their limits. Izuku watched as Momo and Kendu converse with each other. They'd hit it off pretty quick and Momo had taken to introduce them to her. All in all, she was a great person to hang out with, of course. Manoma had been persistent in annoying them. It was when Aizawa-sensei had finally arrived they stopped their talks. The bus was lively with everyone having fun and playing games. Uraraka and Momo had taken the seats beside him and quickly dozed off a bit into the trip. Them leaning on him had got no small amount of catcalls from the others. Although Izuku had a healthy blush on his face he ignored the noise and went back to his hero analysis notebook where he continued to write down the developments in his quirk. He remembered all the things that happened in the first semester. He had to admit he had told Shigaraki that everything began with all might. Truer words couldn't have been spoken. It wasn't just the inheritance he had received from All Might. Even his earliest memories was that of him watching the very first rescues by All Might. His dreams, his ideals, all of them were things he received from All Might, and that is why he was determined to repay All Might. He gazed outside of the window, the scenery warped past them as they started to climb up to the hills. His eyes started to droop until he finally dozed off. I leave the rest to you, Sorahiko. I watched as Sorohiko took Toshi away. I could feel the coldness crawling up my skin. But I couldn't run away. Doing so would be mean that all I did was for nothing, and I couldn't accept that. I watched as Toshi cried out my name. I could feel the tears, the sorrow inside me well up. But I can't show that to him. It would be too cruel for his final memory of me to be one with a sad face. I was surprised at how my face easily spread into a smile. But thinking about it, this smile is everything that defines me, I glimpsed at all for one, he was still charging up his quirks, a few seconds might be all I have. So, I turned to the shrinking figure of my protege and my best friend. My arms raised to a final thumbs up. It's your turn now. My voice must have reached him, I stared at Toshi's face. I'm sure of it, this kid will be great. A worthy successor indeed. Do your best, Tashinori. I turned my gaze back to all for one the final flames of one for all blazed in my heart and soul. This power entrusted to me by my predecessors, the power which we spent countless hours cultivating fought the coldness. My arms dropped to the side as I took a deep breath, this is the final. I had the powers cackling around all for one's figure, there was no doubt about it, this would be the final fight of my life. I will sacrifice everything. My mind. Well, a course through my body damping the pain from the wounds I accumulated from this battle, my vision focused on the onslaught of attacks coming towards me. My body. My muscles released an explosion of power pushing me to the limits. The gap between me and all for one was decreasing bit by bit. Yet I knew it was futile. In the end, he was still just playing with me. He didn't consider me a worthy foe. But I was alright with that. I had already resigned myself to knowing that I couldn't defeat him which is why I had to give Toshi as much time as I could so that he could escape. I lost track of time as I continued to dodge the barrage. Each and every moment was taxing. But I powered through. The flames within me were dying out. So I had to make them count. A scant few meters separated the two of us. I readied my body for a final strike. I roared as I threw my last punch. For a second I thought it connected but then I felt the entirety of the blow come back to me. It threw me back and my body rolled until it crashed into a wall. I could feel the blood dripping down my head. I must say. I looked to where all for one was leisurely walking towards me. Despite everything, you did give me a good warm up. I tried to move my body, but it was useless. I was utterly spent. I could see the end right before me. The coldness was back with a vengeance, yet in the face of death, I refused to go down quietly. You can kill me, but you're gonna lose in the end. I spat blood as he closed in on me. I felt my lips pull into a smirk. It was bizarre, how I'm able to be so calm about the end. All might will be your end. My successor will bring your kingdom down. All for one seemed to pause at that, his features softening. For a moment no one would think that this was the mastermind that was the world's greatest threat. 
but then he started chuckling until it was a peal of full-blown laughter. Ha, now that was funny. All for one wiped away some tears before he raised his hand, black energy condensed in his hand. You think that dog, that ran away with his tail behind his back will be my end? The energy roared as it reached maximum output. Hilarious. I closed my eyes, they would have been able to get far enough by now. I felt my mind wander. My life was playing out before me, each and every moment right down to my emotions and thoughts were brought to the surface. But then I saw where it was all headed, this was the only weapon to kill this corrupted god. Even the tiniest of embers were still connected to the grand blaze that was OFA, a power that was transcendent, something that built upon the sacrifices and wills of those who cultivated it. I hope to meet you again Toshi, what you inherited from me is everything, your inheritance is no small thing, the power within you is everything. A power that carries the greatest thing we can offer. Our souls. Even if it is an echo, a remnant of something greater. I will live on within you, along with all my predecessors. Thank you for such a wonderful comedy. I felt myself become engulfed by whatever attack all for one released. I could feel the cold leave me, and suddenly a comforting warmth spread through me, much a lover's embrace. And so I could feel myself drift off, to a deep slumber anxiously waiting to meet with my successor. Even though this was my end, a symbol of peace shall rise, and he will battle the darkness. One hero may have fallen but another will rise. This is only the beginning. This is one for all. Izuku woke up to the bus slowly come to a stop. He sighed as he remembered the memory he witnessed. It wasn't the first time he had experienced this, and he was sure it wouldn't be the last. He had been reliving the memories of Shimura Nana, bits and pieces of her life. Everything she had experienced down to the rush of emotions and thoughts were what he faced whenever he slept. The memory he had seen just now was special. It was a recurring memory. He had watched it happen countless times ever since the fight with Endeavor, and almost two weeks after he still couldn't help but flinch at the enemy Shimura Nana had faced. And yet, she never gave up, up until the end she was sure that all for one would fall. And even after her death, she stood there inside the core of OFA, waiting and hoping to meet her protege. His sensei had been silent when he had mentioned it to him. He had ended the training session early that day. Izuku had been respectful and didn't pry too much into it. He was helpless at how to handle this. But All Might had told him that it wasn't something to dwell on. In fact, he had expressed his joy at the fact that Izuku himself could learn from his master. That he was happy that Izuku had been given something that would protect him even if he himself wasn't there. He felt something soft wipe his face. It was then he noticed that it was Momo was wiping his face which was now full of tears. He gave her a smile which was returned by her squeezing his hand. He looked to the sleeping face of Urarika and gently tapped her awake after wiping his face. He knew that Momo wasn't the type to pry into his secrets. She was also the only one among his friends other than Katsuki to understand that his quirk wasn't normal. She had expressed her interest in his quirk and both had an engaging discussion which is why she was giving him time to explain it on his own. They all exited the bus to a small rest stop. Everyone's eyes wandered over the vast expanse of the forest below them. Izuku's eyes were then brought to the two heroes Aizawa-sensei were talking to, who suddenly struck to oppose when the attention was brought on them. Izuku's golden eyes shone with recognition as he eyed the cat ornaments decorating them. We are the wild, wild pussycats! The pose and their introduction got many of his friends to know of them to shake their heads. Now kids will be the ones instructing you over this entire course of your training. Your lodging is there at the foot of the mountain. Mandalay gestured as she pointed to a far-off mountain. It's around 9.30, I'm guessing around noon, maybe? Many of the students broke out in cold sweat at the ominous tone she used, as well as the fact there was a lot of ground to cover. It was Kurishima who swallowed his spit and asked. Then shouldn't we be back on the bus? Pixie Bob and Mandalay giggled at the innocent question before replying. Where's the fun in that? Besides your training started the moment you stepped off the bus. Everyone suddenly felt the entire ground warp and lift themselves towards the forest. Izuku tried breaking free but his concentration was broken when he crashed to the ground. You all have three hours to reach the lodge by foot. They suddenly heard Mandalay's voice in their heads. Izuku marveled at the telepath quirk. This is our private property. So don't hesitate to use your quirks. And as an added incentive, those who don't reach by the allotted time won't get lunch. Do your best, kids. You know, Aizawa said as he looked at the figure of Mandalay. 
They're gonna reach by that time unless you step it up. You should have given them a deadline of an hour, two at most. Mandalay looked absolutely surprised at Aizawa's proclamation, before giggling at the absurdity. I know you like those kids eraser, but our own team would take three hours to reach the lodge by foot from here. Maybe more, if Pixie went all out. And she wasn't kidding, it was a monthly ritual for them. Their best time was three hours, and it was absolute hell for them. And Aizawa expected these kids to do better than them? Aizawa shook his head at Mandalay's words. You're just five heroes, these are twenty heroes. Mandalay was surprised at Aizawa's words heroes. Izuku did a head count of everyone and was relieved that everyone was here. A roar from the front caused their hands to stand on end. Mineta slowly walked to a bush to relieve himself. That is until a massive creature jumped out. Siro acted quick enough and pulled Mineta out of the beast's range. And Koda immediately tried to calm the beast to no avail. Izuku nodded to Katsuki and Todoroki as they took his flanks. Without a doubt in their mind they attacked. And they're being led by one of the most powerful group of youths. Pixie Bob let out a yelp causing Mandalay to look at her. A barrage of attacks destroyed the entire monster. Izuka looked to his classmates and bellowed. Everyone! Stay together! We're gonna work together and get through this! With a roar of affirmation, Izuka blasted to the sky, finding the direction of their destination. Izuka prepared to descend but suddenly sensed the hostile. His ether formed an orb and shot to an earthen beast that was flying towards him. He looked at the rest stop and saw a thoroughly perplexed Pixie Bob and Mandalay, along with a smirking Aizawa who was looking at the pros with an I told you so expression. His eyes then met with that of a small kid who he never noticed before. Izuka gave a small smile to them all and shot to the ground crashing onto a beast that was stalking them. Aizawa smiled as he looked at their shocked faces. So yes, I believe my class will reach within that time. With that he climbed to the bus as the driver took them away. Guys, we are going to gun it towards the lodge. Short-range fighters split yourselves into two teams. One team will guard the rear and protect the long-range fighters while the others with me and Katsuki will cleave a path forward. Charisma flowed through Izuka's words and was met with no complaints as they formed a spear formation and pushed. Through. Izuka smiled as he punched another beast, slowly falling into a rhythm as the monsters came one after the other. Jiro and Kota along with Izuku himself were able to easily detect the beasts before they entered combat. Everyone was able to tag team with someone else and was able to beat them easily with some like Bakugo and Todoroki handling multiple beasts by themselves. Their attention was brought to some trees that suddenly fell to the sides. Izuku's grin widened as he laid eyes on a goliath beast. His body shot straight to the beast's chest. The torrent of power in his veins urged him to take the initiative. Meteor Smash Ever since he had started his internships with All Might and the fight with Endeavor his power grew exponentially, as seen as the blow was strong enough to disintegrate the entire upper half of the beast. Izuka dropped down to the cheers of his classmates, as they fought with a renewed vigor. Time skipped three hours. A rush of pride entered Aizawa as he saw the forms of his breaking through the forest cover, each and every one of them looked as if they were a second from passing out. But the fact they were able to make it within the time frame given to them spoke volumes of their prowess. Class 1B had barely reached a third of the way from their starting position. It was a surprise to see Katsuki and Ida leading them. He suddenly became worried when he saw Izuka being supported by Shoto and Kirishima walking in the middle of the pack. It was only when he reached halfway through did he understand that the rest of the students kept him in the middle to protect Izuku who was the only on having someone supporting them but what was thoroughly shocking was that some of them were actually having faint outlines of gold, specifically Kaminari, Ida, and Kurishima. Izuku was at the edge of unconsciousness when suddenly the mentioned three came and spoke with him. He saw Izuku nod and then the traces of gold left them and entered Izuku's frame. Izuku's eyes suddenly gained a glow as if his vitality was restored and wasted no time in catching the falling bodies of his friends. Aizawa knew what happened, he himself had experienced the same thing at USJ. Izuku's ability to empower others at his own expense, supercharging another's quirk and body to levels close to their prime. Izuku had been requested by Recovery Girl to not use that ability until his quirks finally synchronized. He shook his head at his most puzzling protege. He was about to greet them when he was suddenly knocked aside by an excited group of pros. I can't believe it! exclaimed Mandalay who calmly walked to Aizawa whom Tiger was helping up. These kids managed to tie in with our best time. Even if you're twenty people, 
The fact you were able to pass Beast Forest in three hours speaks volumes of your potential. Everyone broke out into smiles at that. And to think we'd have the chance to train the cream of the crop. Now that everyone's here, let's introduce ourselves. It was almost instant as the four pros suddenly went to a formation and bellowed. We are the wild, wild pussycats. The students were enthralled with the introductions of Ragdoll and Tiger who explained their individual quirks. It was then their attention was brought to Pixie Bob. To think you kids were able to beat my earth beasts so easily, whined Pixie Bob. And you? Izuku was surprised when Pixie Bob invaded his personal space. You were amazing. You were like K.A. Pal, and then you went B.M. Izuku's sweat dropped at Pixie Bob's childishness. It was nice to see them so laid back. I'm marking you right now. You're gonna be mine in three years. Izuku's eyes widened at the proclamation and saw that she was being restrained by Momo and Urarika. Don't worry about that, sighed Mandalay. She's just worried about remaining a spinster her entire life. Spinster? You're not that old, right? exclaimed Izuku. I mean, right? Everyone laughed at Pixie Bob's denials and as they walked to a hall which was lined up with various treats and dishes. Dig and kids, this is our treat for you guys who absolutely broke our expectations. Although keep in mind this is just a one-time thing. Everyone tackled the feast with no abandon. The hall was filled with shouts and songs. All in all, it was the picture-perfect victory feast. The pussycats were hovering around Izuku and his friends as they were the most interesting among the new additions. It was after they all cleaned themselves off at the natural hot springs and changed themselves did they head to the lodgings and finally to the grounds to begin their training. The pussycats had expected you to be too tired to begin training and wanted to begin tomorrow. Aizawa threw a softball to Shoji and said, But I say, there's no time like the present. Shoji, your record at the cork apprehension test for this was 652.6 meters. Let's see how much it is now. Shoji, while surprised, gave a nod and prepared himself. With a grunt he threw the softball as hard as he could. The softball flew far away until it was away from their eyes. Shoji looked at Aizawa who showed him the device, 657.8 meters. It was a shock to everyone who had expected a great development in their powers, Aizawa smirked. It's no surprise here, even though you've been through a lot these past months. Most of your growth was on mental and technical levels. Everyone looked surprised at the given information. This also means that your quirks haven't been able to keep up with the progress made by your sudden growth which is where this camp comes in. This camp is to improve your quirks and get you your provisional licenses so that combat the threats looming in the shadows. Aizawa's grin spread and slowly seemed a bit maniacal. We are gonna push you to the limits, so much so that you'll feel like dying. So, welcome to hell. Izuku groaned as he fought both Kurishima and Ojiro. He was wearing the same protector restraints to help develop his physique. He groaned as he tried to raise his arms to block an overhead strike from Ojiro's tail. He had a total of eight restraints that wouldn't even let him stand. Only by channeling his power throughout his entire body would it let him move around. And to make matters more difficult he was to engage in a three-way fist fight for him to integrate Shimura Nana's fighting style into his own. Shimura Nana's fighting style was a bit similar to his own, but this style was tempered and adjusted by thousands of fights. Small alterations caused the style to be a formidable weapon, Izuku groaned as he felt Kurishima power through his guard. This helped all three of them to form a well-suited fighting style. Everyone was training with all they had. The hours passed by until it was six. The darkness had already set in. It was when they were heading back to the lodge did they meet the class of 1B already in the hall scarfing down food as if their lives depended on it. Everyone was at a stare-off as class 1A was surprised that they had only reached now, while 1B was silent at the fact that their rivals had already managed to squeeze in training on the very first day. Before a scuffle could emerge Izuku and Momo went to talk with Kenda who had knocked out Monoma, while Kurishima went towards Tetsu Tetsu. Soon enough the awkward silence was a thing of the past as everyone interacted with their year mates. The pros had a small smile on their faces as they saw the kids interact with each other. Aizawa was especially happy as he was counting the cash he received from a grumbling Vlad. This generation was gonna be the very best UA would ever produce. The big three of this generation were determined in their very first semester. It was also noteworthy that they only separated from each other when it was a team exercise, they went out of their way to interact with their classmates, and their friends reciprocated in kind, not shying away from their help and friendship. It was something he was thankful for, 
he had found no one in his class unworthy to the title, hero. Even if he refused it vehemently, he knew that these kids had wormed into his heart. But now, there was something he had to do. Tucking away the money into his pocket he walked towards the students with remedial and mentioned the directions towards their extra classes to be held after they freshened up. Meanwhile, Izuku was focusing his attention on one specific person. The small kid he had seen in the beginning, Mandalay had mentioned that he was her nephew but for some strange reason, the kid reminded him of someone. He put it to the back of his mind as he felt Katsuki grab him by the scruff of his neck and drag him to where everyone was heading towards, the springs again. After a great many deductions and theories, I have finally formulated a plan to reach my goals. Everyone sighed at Mineta's pigheadedness. They were spared in the noon, mostly because of training. But from sounds coming from the other side, Mineta had already made up his mind. He was going to reach the heavens, or die trying. Izuku watched as Ida berate Mineta on his conduct, and Izuku couldn't deny the faintest bit of rage that dwelled at the thought of Mineta having lecherous thoughts about Momo and Urarika. Izuku was caught by surprise when he saw Ida rush out of the pool. It was then he saw Mineta climb up the wall shouting out their school credo. Izuku was about to summon Enkidu when Koda interfered and pushed Mineta off. Izuku snorted when a naked Mineta crashed into Ida, but it was Koda's scream that caused him to move. Oefei coursed through his veins as he moved with a surreal grace. His mind thought to the accumulated fighting prowess he had inherited from Shimura Nana, had given him what he sorely lacked a fighting style and reflexes honed from countless battles. Yet, his mind could only process a small part of Shimura Nana's entire fighting history. So, even with an accelerated pace, it would take years before he could use it entirely and his own fighting instincts had to integrate with the accumulated memories. But as he looked at the unconscious form of Koda in his hand, he knew he had other things to worry about. Time skip. Poor kid must have fallen unconscious from the fall sighed Mandalay as she put a wet cloth on Koda's forehead. I can't thank you enough for catching him. Pretty good reflexes you have there. Izuku waved away the thanks as he explained. I'm just glad no one got hurt. I guess Koda must have been put on guard duty. I sensed him beforehand, but I didn't think that he'd get caught in the entire thing. If I'd known I would have handled my net alone. There's no need to beat yourself over it, besides like you said. Everyone's all right, so there's nothing to worry about. It was Pixie Bob who spoke as she entered the room with a tray of tea. Izuku accepted a cup from Pixie Bob as he slowly wrapped himself in a blanket of ether, hiding his partially naked physique from the ladies in the room. Pixie Bob pouted at the loss of eye candy, while Mandalay was surprised at the fine control Izuku possessed. She had read the various reports of what Izuku had involved himself in. He had an impressive repertoire of special moves, and along with his teammates, they've apprehended many villains altogether the most noticeable being Stain and a special Numu Izuku had fought in the USJ. I know it's not my place to ask, but was one of Koda's parents a hero perchance? Izuku's query brought Mandalay out of her thoughts, and she slowly nodded her head. Both his parents were heroes, fine ones at that. Koda looked up to them much like kids his age do. It was no wonder that his world shattered when they fell in duty two years ago. Izuku's eyes widened at the words. They died while protecting a group of civilians from a villain. They died an honorable death, giving their lives to save another's. There's no better way for a hero to go, but to Koda, it was anything but that. To him, it was like they left him all alone. When the public sent their condolences and praised them for their deeds as noble and great. He didn't care for any of that. In fact, he grew to hate everything related to a hero. Mandalay watched as Koda's unconscious face contract as if he were having a nightmare. She reached out to grasp him but retracted before making contact. I don't think he likes us much either, but with no other relatives he cooperates. To him, heroes are people he can't understand. Izuku watched the interaction and let his ether slowly flood the room. Mandalay and Pixie Bob watched as Izuku's hand glowed a bright gold and rested itself on Koda's forehead. Almost instantaneously, Koda's face relaxed. Whether Izuku noticed or not was debatable as his gaze was unfocused as he thought of Koda's views on heroes. To him, it was a foreign thing. Heroes were people who risked their lives so others don't have to. They were people who gave their lives away for upholding one thing, an ideal shared by no one. To save everyone. Izuku could feel a hand rest on his shoulder. He didn't need to turn around to know who it was. He had never expected Shimura Nana to play such an important role in his life 
reliving her battles, her training, it forged a bond that went beyond logic and reason. Yet, he couldn't help but feel he was stealing something from all might. Shimura Nana was never waiting for him but was, in fact, waiting for his sensei. To give him the gift he received, the entirety of Shimura Nana's fighting skills, her tactics, her fruits of labor, just so that all might would never have to waste time learning them, so that he could hone other skills. So that, didn't need to make the sacrifices she had to make. So that he could defeat all for one and live his life to the fullest. To have a child that needn't fear of the demon in the shadows, he wanted to tell Tashinori Sensei, to cry at snatching away something so precious. But he remembered his sensei's face as he expressed his joy at the fact that Izuka would learn from Shimura Nana. He wiped away some stray tears and gave a small smile to the ladies and walked out of the door, towards his own room. The ether died from his frame as he reached his wardrobe, quickly changing he laid on the bed. He vowed to repay his sensei, with the help of Izuka's two medical teachers, the doctor and recovery girl. He would cure his sensei of his ailment, and let him live his life to the fullest and Izuku himself would bear the burden of number one just so his sensei could finally take it easy. Time skip. Class 1B gazed upon the training grounds which had patches of it covered with different equipment for each individual power, but as they saw the entire thing it resembled a scene from hell. They watched as their yearmates duke it out with each other, massive explosions ripped through the sky, screams echoed from the darkest caves, and then their eyes went to a fight between Izuku and Tiger, the very earth rippled with each step Izuku took. Each strike from Izuka wobbled as if they were under strenuous weight, but the speed at which they fought brought many to gulp. Tiger grinned as he fought the child Dash, know the man in front of him. Even when weighed down by the protector restraints, he was able to go head to toe with him. Each strike from the child was getting better, with each and every hit Izuka's skills were slowly being honed. They had been at it for an hour, yet Izuka wasn't done. Tiger extended his fist at breakneck speeds at Izuka's head who dodged it by a hair's breadth. Without a moment's hesitation, Izuka's fist blurred as he went for a body blow. Tiger folded his body together to dodge the blow. The accompanying wall of wind didn't surprise him anymore as he landed on his feet for the umpteenth time since the fight began. Tiger suddenly saw the audience and signaled Izuka to stop. Izuka looked around and gave a nod as he wobbled away towards Tokoemi for a session with him. As Tiger gazed upon the disappearing figure of Izuku, he looked at the newest recruits and gave them a bloodthirsty grin. Izuku walked over to the mouth of the cave which was guarded by Aizawa and Pixie Bob. Tokoemi was training to control the more powerful forms of dark shadow. Izuku wanted to train with Tokoemi such that he could further refine the control of his divine construct creation. It had been Aizawa's sensei to suggest it. The entire camp was for them to strengthen their quirks pushing beyond their limits and growing stronger to fight threats that were prepared to claim their lives. So what better way than to break limits than testing the malleability of their quirks, using them in ways they had never thought before. Under the guidance of All Might and Gran Torino, he and his teammates had already undergone quirk enhancement training. They had been given a strict regime to follow, while simultaneously figuring out different ways to use their quirks. Bakugo had already gone to create an all-new close-range combat style which had strikes powered by his explosions to land devastating strikes while Shudo went with a similar path like Izuku and focused on creating constructs such as spears and shields to aid him in combat. Izuku, on the other hand, wanted to mimic Dark Shadow, he had already understood the process of shape creation with his various constructs. And then were creations such as Ro AIAs which were imbued with concepts, a conceptualized weapon. Now, he wanted to take them to their utmost limits, to create an entity similar to Dark Shadow. His interest was piqued when he had fought Pixie Bob's Earthen Beasts, he immediately asked for help to develop his own variation of beats. Pixie Bob had mentioned that her beasts were different from Dark Shadow as they weren't made from a form of energy, but were merely puppets that she could control remotely. She had explained the various processes she used for the creation. Izuka was grateful for all the help she provided. Izuka would have had to spend years to create such a beast, as he would have had to be self-taught, but with Pixie Bob, he would be able to accelerate his training. Tokoimi finally exited the cave, sweat dripping from his body almost as though he ran a marathon. Aizawa sensei spoke to him in soft tones before finally dragging Pixie Bob away as they left to help others with improving their quirks. It wasn't the first time Izuku had spent time with Tokoimi. He was always fascinated by Dark Shadow, a spiritual entity that coexisted with Tokoimi that allowed him to combat enemies. He also found a lot about Tokoimi himself. 
But the most interesting thing about him was his belief in fate or destiny. He was hesitant at first, but he gradually warmed up to Izuku. Slowly but surely, they were found having multiple debates on their own views of something. Tokoyami watched as Izuku's ether slowly dominate the area. It never failed to surprise him. Izuku was the same age as him, yet his power was leagues ahead of him. It was only after seeing many fights that Izuku fought did he understand something. Izuku was born to fight, not many could see it, but he could. It wasn't that Izuku was born brave, or born strong, but he was born to fight and it'll be tested this cosmic metal of his, he will face countless trials and be broken and damaged in countless ways. To Tokoemi, it was a miserable existence, a pawn of fate, of destiny. Yet, what he saw when Izuku stood utterly alone against the tyrannous might of the Goliath, he couldn't help but bow his head when he felt the energy that erupted from the depths of Izuku's soul. Unlike the others, his quirk allowed him to manifest dark shadow, but it also allowed him to be in touch with the dark energy his quirk was bathed in. Hence he had been mere seconds from turning back and rescuing Izuku from the robot, but then the most breathtaking event in his life occurred. A symphony of lights, birthed from the planet itself, covered Izuku from head to toe healing all his wounds and bestowing him the most beautiful illusion, one that is most noble and sacred. The pure energy, the celestial force of the planet woke from his slumber at the call of her most favorite child. Tokoemi could still feel the torrent of energy that washed over him as he watched the motes of light rush over to Izuku. It was then he understood that their powers were so similar yet so different. One was the embodiment of light, blessed by the heavens to wield the power of the universe, and himself, blessed by the darkness to protect the light. He knew of the violent powers that existed in both their bodies, heavily chained by their iron wills. He had seen how powerful dark shadow was, and will be in the embrace of the night. So, possessing an iron will was a prerequisite to him. He watched as Izuku formed a vague body of a beast, dark shadow floated around Izuku an excited expression on his face. Tokoyami watched on as the golden energy warp in itself attempting to be born into the world. Yet, much like the previous times, the ether dispersed into the world. Wisps of it slowly fleeting into the sky, dark shadow let out a whine of disappointment but was immediately quick to wish Izuku more encouragement on his quest for a battle partner much like himself. Tokoyami passed a bottle of water to Izuku as he sat beside him. The glow of ether never left Izuku's frame, working tirelessly to relieve the pain from Izuku's body. I still can't do it, groaned Izuku. It's just too hard to create this complex of a construct. Izuku emptied the bottle and placed it on the ground beside him. All this time Tokoyami remained silent. Tokoyami was one who could understand the deeper meanings behind his quirk. Tokoyami, much like Izuku, was always in contact with the foreign energy granting dark shadow life. But, he had never been able to create other such constructs like Izuku, nor was he capable yet of expending the energy in blasts or by augmentation of his body. Give it time, you shouldn't tear yourself apart. Tokoyami gave a sideways look to Izuku, who stared at him with wide eyes. All of us here will be there to help you fight against the evil contaminating the world. There's no need for you to take this burden alone. Izuku gave a smile to Tokoemi, yet it didn't fully reach his eyes. Izuku changed topics to Tokoemi himself, asking about how his quest to gain control of Dark Shadow's higher abilities were working out. Both of them slowly turned back to their training. Tokoemi had requested that Izuku to not venture into the cave while he was training. Izuka had gone towards the beast forest where he laid against the trunk of a tree. He stared at the sky, an empty look in his eyes. There's no need for you to take this burden alone. Tokoimi's words resonated in his mind. Izuka knew that those words were meant to quell his desire to get stronger. But none of them knew about All for One, a tyrant who controls the vast darkness of the world. Izuka had gained first-hand experience from his predecessor of the strength All for One possessed. From shrugging off blows that carried kilotons of force, to changing landscapes to his whim, all for one was a monster in every sense of the word. As Ofei's successor, he had to be strong enough to defeat all for one. He couldn't let anyone else interfere, he had seen the countless heroes losing their lives to a casual strike from that monster. Heroes whose names struck fear in the hearts of villains were mere ants to the tyrannical might of all for one. This caused Izuku to promise himself to never let anyone else get involved in the battle against All for One. Ofe had given him the accumulation of power from eight generations with the hope that this power would defeat All for One. Izuku was brought out his thoughts as he felt Aizawa-sensei, 
and the other pros enter his bounded field sensory range. He knew what was next, ever since the fight against the Goliath, he had never been able to summon that sword. He could sense it as clear as day, but it was always a step away from his grasp. As if telling him that he wasn't ready yet, so he had requested Aizawa for help. Aizawa true to his word had brought Ragdoll and Pixie Bob to help him. As they entered the beast forest together, Izuka steeled himself for the upcoming battle. Time skip. Now everyone. It's chow time, but if you want to eat, you gotta cook it yourselves, dot. The groans of the students caused Mandalay and the others to laugh. Of course, they'd passed through the same torture, so they could understand what they're going through. Slowly, the students gathered the utensils and started their quest for cooking their dinner. Among them Sato, Izuku and Momo were feeling as if they were at home with themselves. Their cooking prowess garnered much attention and joy. Soon enough the students were chowing down with reckless abandon. Izuku laughed as Siro was beaten down by Jiro for a bad joke, yet his eyes followed the figure of a boy going farther away from them. Soon enough, night had fallen and the campfires were put out as the students returned to the comfort of the lodge. Yet, Izuku silently went to the kitchen and took a small container filled beforehand with the leftovers of the day's dinner and slowly walked towards where he could feel the presence of Koda. He found himself on top of a hill with an ample plain that overlooked the entire forest. He had put off meeting Koda for a while, mostly because he had no idea how to actually interact with him. He had long since found out about his identity and past, but he couldn't relate to him, for Izuku who had grown up with endless love showered upon him by his mother, the respect and admiration from his peers, he had nothing in common with Kota. But Izuku couldn't sit still watching a soul suffer alone, it might be because of Oafe, but he finally had a dream, to others it would be ridiculous but for him, it was everything. A dream that was trained by the heart alone, the strongest fantasy. To save everyone. Izuka felt this was his inheritance, a successor to a dream that was shared by every one of his predecessors. And today, as he fought against the army of rock golems he found a way to reach Koda's heart. He gazed at the exhausted figure of Koda who rested against the rock. You'll catch a cold if you sit here without a blanket. Izuka's voice was gentle as it carried over to a startled Kota whose face shifted to one of anger. Why are you here? How did you find me? Izuku stopped in his tracks. He slowly took a step forward and raised the bento in his hands. I thought you might be hungry. Izuku was as careful as he could be. He knew that if he scared Kota, he would never open up to him. I don't want your food, sneered Kota. And stay away from here, this is my secret base. Contrary to Koda's expectations, Izuku merely smiled and looked around the place his eyes slowly returned to Koda. Izuku understood what Koda meant for him. This place was a sanctuary and gave him peace and strength. Izuku sat down on the ground and watched Koda's body tense up. I know that you feel it's none of my business, but I'd like to talk. Koda ground his teeth as he stared at the hero in front of him. With a small twitch of Izuku's fingers the bento floated towards Koda. Soon it landed right in front of him. Koda's eyes darkened at the display. All of you are the same. Izuka's eyebrows raised at that. Flaunting your power, calling yourselves heroes or villains, and then just going around killing each other. All you do is brag about your quirks. All of you are just idiots. Izuku watched as Koda's body shivered in frustration at how he actually despised the very foundation of heroes and villains. It was heartbreaking. For a child no older than five to have this much anger and rage and the more Izuka stared at the eyes of Koda which were ablaze with hatred his fists clenched. Everyone views quirks differently. There are many who wish for these gifts to have never existed. There are others who praise them as the saving grace of the world. Among all of these views, none of them are absolute. Midway through Izuka stood up and looked at Koda with his golden eyes shifting through a turbulent wave of emotions. But if you keep rejecting everything, all you're gonna do is hurt yourself and I'm pretty sure that's not what your parents would have wanted. Koda stiffened at the mention of his parents, and spoke in a low voice. You don't even know who my parents were. Izuku watched as Koda's eyes channel his entire hatred towards him, but it was useless as he continued to speak. I know who they were Kodaku and Waterhose, a team of great heroes who laid down their lives to protect a group of civilians from a villain. And I know that they hoped that you would also be safe Dash. Izuku was stopped halfway through as he had to dodge a torrent of water that rushed to him. He watched as Koda breathed in with almost palpable rage. Hope that I would be safe. 
Great heroes? Coda's voice cracked. It was barely a whisper. And look at where that got them. Ashes in the wind, that's what. Izuka bit back a retort when he saw the tear-filled eyes of Koda. Instead of fighting these villains, they should have survived and been here with me. Izuka felt a shiver run down his spine as an image of his mother overlapped Koda's frame, with the same tear stains in their eyes. I never asked them to be heroes. All I wanted were my parents at home, taking me to school, teaching me how to ride a bike, having picnics. I wanted us to be normal. Izuka had to strain his ears to hear the words that came from Koda's mouth. There were many things Izuka wanted to say, words that were filled with logic and facts. But staring at the tear-filled eyes of this child, those words never left his tongue. After a moment, he conjured a blanket made of ether which immediately wrapped itself around Koda. The purity of the energy released by the blanket caused Koda to lessen his anger. His hands which were raised to remove the blanket slowly fell to the sides. Izuka at that moment had closed the gap between them and hugged Koda's figure to his chest. He could feel Koda stiffen in his arms, but the ether slowly started to lull him to sleep. Those words you spoke, there's something no kid should ever have to say. Koda struggled against the warmth that broke down his defenses and tried to shut away from the words Izuka said but it was useless. I can tell you that they were great heroes, but they were even greater people because they were selfless and gave their lives so that others could live on. And you, Koda, are the son of those two heroes. You are their last gift to this world, the inheritor of their power, of their dreams. And I assure you, while they were fighting against each and every villain, their sole thought would have been of you. To make a better world for you, because that's what heroes are for. Izuka watched as a stream of tears left Koda's eyes before he finally fell asleep. Izuka wiped away the tears on Koda's face and carried him to the cabin and handed him over to a stunned Mandalay. Izuka paid no heed to that as he exited the cabin and shot towards the sky. He broke through the clouds and gazed at the full moon that showered him in light. He took a deep breath but let out a choked sob as he remembered the image of his mother, with tears in her eyes, and hugging him as if otherwise he would vanish into the mist. Mom! He stayed for the better part of an hour before he silently descended onto the window of his room and tumbled onto his bed, his mind finally resting after the day he had. The next morning came and with it, the training camp continued to go full swing. The students who had reached a bottleneck slowly broke through, and others were perfecting their abilities to a higher level. Their routine training had allowed them to shed their weaknesses and come out stronger. Kurishima and Sato roared as they traded blows with Izuku, Ojiro took the initiative and whipped his tail at Izuku who was in a deadlock. Izuku grunted before releasing a burst of energy to overpower the deadlock, causing the tail to miss him by an inch. But without a moment's respite, Ojiro swung his leg towards Izuku's head. Izuku's arms shot to a guard which successfully blocked the blow. Izuku's arms caught the leg before Ojiro could retract it, and with a bellow, he threw Ojiro towards Kurishima who tumbled under their combined weights. Izuku let out a breath but suddenly heard the wind splitting as a first cut through it. Izuku's frame burst with power as he caught Sato's full-powered punch by the wrist. His grip never let up as he landed a body blow onto Sato that caused him to go to the knees. Izuku let out a breath as he finally sat on the earth. They had been at it for an hour. In the beginning, it was him who'd richly be beaten into the ground. But now, after a whole two weeks, he had finally gained the upper hand. He looked to the others much like him Todoroki and Bakugo were also placed with handicaps and were made to fight. Kaminari and Tokoemi had also become much more proficient in their own fighting styles. Kaminari was able to limit his total output considerably giving him three shots before short-circuiting as well as developing a close-quarters combat strategy. Tokoemi had been taken out of his comfort zone and made to fight in close quarters with people. But now, there was an undeniable confidence in their steps. While they weren't the best, they were certainly better than most. Izuku had been put through the ringer as his ability not only gave him a heightened physique, he was a jack of all trades. And so, Aizawa had made Izuka go through every possible combat situation possible. Izuka had been restricted to certain aspects of his quirk, some situations involving no use of his majestic attire, others where he wasn't allowed any construct creation, and in some, he was made to use only his body to survive. He had it tough, but Aizawa had no reservations in slowly bringing others to these combat training. The first was Bakugo, then Todoroki, and then Kurishima, Kaminari, and Tokoyami joined together. 
On the other hand, Mandalay had taken over the girls' training and with the help of Pixie Bob's earthen beasts, made them improve greatly. Along the way, the camaraderie between the two classes improved beyond expectations. It became a ritual to hold games in the night. Slowly there was an unbreakable friendship between the classes. Izuku rested his head against a tree as he waited for Pixie Bob and Mandalay to reach. He had to hold back on his destructive abilities along with Todoroki and surprisingly Bakugo. Bakugo had finally broken through his bottleneck and exuded an aura of destruction. His damage output was now on the same league as that of Todoroki when using his flames. The sudden jump was mainly due to Bakugo's obsession with absolute control over his quirk. He was capable of unleashing seven to eight high-end explosions capable of destroying Mandalay's earth and beasts in one go. Each day one of them would go to the forest of beasts and let loose, and under the supervision of the pros, they grew stronger and stronger. Izuku's eyes watched as the two members of the Pussycats reached along with Koda. He smiled at the child who only huffed in response. But one could see the corners of the lips were tilted up. Izuku lightly laughed at that. He hadn't fully got through to Koda, but nowadays Koda would be willing to spend some time with him. He was sure that by the end of the training camp he'll get through to Koda. He sighed at the thought of the camp ending. The past two weeks were the most practice he had been able to get all year, and after another week, he'll be stuck with classes and other stuff. Other than trying to construct a battle partner, Izuku solely focused on refining his already existing abilities and powers. Shimura Nana's inheritance had pushed him to new heights. His mind had experienced countless battles, ingrained with countless tactics, imbued with conviction. He could never repay this gift. At the same time, his ideal became his obsession. He could feel the slow turning of gears. He was wholly prepared to pursue his inherited dream. Izuku walked into the forest of beasts, his arm extended to the side. After a minute or so an assembly of lights sprung from the planet, in the middle of the forest, Izuku was the lone soul in it. The motes of light seeped into his body, rejuvenating it. Much like his mother's embrace he could feel the comfort and trust in each speck of light. He looked to his hand, and it was a sword, one that was so very different from the ones he could make. This sword was a gift. As strange as it sounded, he knew that it wasn't something that could have created by him. At least not yet. It was made entirely of light, but its edge was sharper than anything he had ever seen. A beast entered his view, with a roar it shot towards him. Izuka stood his ground, slowly tensing his arms and legs, ether flowed unrestrained throughout his frame. The beast was a scant few feet away and that was when he moved, there was a flash of gold that came with his signature high-speed movement skill. Ether burst allowed him to increase his speed at an almost explosive level. The sword in his arms sliced through beast without an indication of resistance. It was no exaggeration in saying that his strength was jaw-dropping and with the experience of a hero in his head, there was one word that could explain Izuka's battle power, monstrous. His powers really did not befit his age, in fact, it was solely because of all might and the backing of the UA that he was able to walk around without any restriction. He knew that without them, he would be heavily monitored and restricted. It was a common thing where people with this much strength were always under the scrutiny of higher powers. But it was due to his sensei's overwhelming power and charisma that he was able to be so free, the same carried to his teammates. The three of them in terms of pure power were superior to many of the pros. His movements were precise and it almost felt like he was a natural with a sword. He weaved through attacks and every brandishing of sword caused many a beast to fall. It was surprising to Izuka at first, he had never held a European sword before. He was overly familiar with kendo and martial arts due to the many classes he attended from when he was six before he joined the UA he was considered a battle genius in many dojos. But the moment he held this sword, it felt like it was a part of him. The only reason he restricted its use was because of its overwhelming power. Each strike carried an explosive amount of power, and when used in tandem with his ether, it was a weapon that could bring harm to the gods. A weapon that once unsheathed would bring about absolute victory, this was his final trump card a sword that promised victory. Izuku was shaken out of his thoughts when Pixie Bob glomped him, he finally registered the chopped up beasts around him. This was the power of this sword, even without the application of its ultimate attack there were few who could resist its might. Izuku let out a smile and let the sword vanish back into the earth. The motes of light swirling around him was a sight that caused the two ladies to blush a pretty pink. It was a sight that was worthy of being painted. As Koda watched as the motes playfully float towards him, he extended his arm to catch them, but they spun around and played around him. 
A warmth spread to his entire body. It was a feeling that he was unaccustomed to, yet it was so familiar to him. His eyes shimmered with tears, the lights danced in a symphony showing him a memory, something he thought he had long forgotten. Coda laughed as he felt his mother tickle his tummy, he could see the purest of smiles on his mother's face. His father let out a grand peal of laughter as he tackled both of them into the bed with a bear hug. He could feel the happiness of this moment. He relived this happiness. Both of his parents looked at him, their smiles full of warmth, full of love, love for him. His eyes were wet with tears as they slowly spilled down his face. His mother gently cupped his face and wiped his tears away and looked at him. He was surprised at the tears glistening in her eyes, but for some strange reason, he understood. His mother's lips moved, and his eyes widened at the words and the tears flowed again, but he wiped them away and nodded his head. His mother kissed his forehead and hugged him to her chest. He felt another pair of arms hug him and knew without a doubt that it was his father. Coda's frame shook with sobs. He was happy, happy to feel this warmth, happy that he remembered this love. Their figures slowly broke into the motes of light and entered his body. This warmth would never leave him. This love that transcended beyond life and death. Izuku watched as the motes of light seep into Koda's body. This was why he understood that this sword was special. It was the ability of it to connect hearts, bringing out everything that was good and letting it spread throughout the soul. This was why he was scared of it, an ability that didn't stem from any desire of hatred. It was wholly pure, but it was imbued to a weapon, a sword. A blade only had one purpose, but as he watched the smile of Koda's face, he knew deep down it was worth it. He moved forward and lifted Koda onto his shoulders. The peal of laughter surprised Mandalay and Pixie Bob once again. They had long since become used to the cold and detached Koda, yet for the past week, they saw the changes in him. They would catch him smiling, he became kinder, more, happier. Mandalay had no idea whether to be happy or scared, on one hand, Koda had finally started to open up to them, but on the other, there was a child who was capable of swaying hearts left and right. She knew that if he were a few years older Pixie Bob would never let a single girl near him. It was the first time she had been like this. It was only the assurance of Ragdoll that allowed her to trust Izuku. Izuku brought Koda to the lodge where he ran towards Ragdoll to help with shifting the food from the pantry. Izuku was about to help them when something caught his eye. His eyes saddened at the sight. There, far off from the rest of them was Momo, looking at him with a rather sad expression. His heart shook at the scene, a burst of ether escaped his feet, and carried him towards Momo in a single go. Izuku stood in front of Momo, both their eyes stared at each other. Momo was startled at the closeness but made no effort to move, Izuku understood why she was sad. He could count with one hand the number of times they had actually spent time with each other, Izuku had ignored his friends as he dove into his training and watching the rather fragile look on Momo's face, he felt as if he were a villain. I'm sorry. Izuku wiped away the tears streaming down her face. I'm at fault for ignoring everyone, it's just that I have to get stronger. There's so many villains and too many crimes that happen. And I want to be helpful and I just dash. Izuku was stopped when Momo placed a finger on his lips. Izuku subconsciously registered the softness of her skin. He looked into her eyes which slowly filled with mirth. A healthy blush covered her face as she giggled at his rather red face. Izuka faintly noticed that he liked her laugh. I know you want to get stronger, Izuka Dash. Momo slowly let her finger fall from his lips and slowly took one of his arms. I know there's a lot of things going on in your life right now, but I want you to rely on us as well. Don't get swept away by this monotonous life of training. Talk to us. I, we miss you. Izuka felt like he kicked a puppy after that. He had never been more than a few feet apart from his friends till the stain incident. Yet, after that, he had slowly pushed them away. Their interactions were limited, and he understood that it was disheartening for them. Izuku was also very aware of what Momo and Ochako meant to him. He had been aware of it ever since the integration of the accumulated memories. Izuku's abilities were a world apart than before. His sensing abilities had to be deliberately locked down to a smaller radius because of the amount of data his mind had to process was sky high. He could feel the happiness overflowing whenever he was in their company. It was also why he made space. A selfish part of him couldn't afford any distractions. With the looming threat of all for one he poured his all into training. He had promised himself to confess his feelings on a later date when there was no threat to his loved ones. When he was powerful enough to not worry about any danger. 
He was a bit concerned about how they would take it. While polygamy wasn't common, a majority of harems were found when people were born with certain quirks that emphasized on the more sexual part of their lives. In fact, some pros had multiple wives and as long as both parties were willing there were no drawbacks to their lives. But for Izuka he was unsure whether they would agree to it or not, and he was at a loss on what to do. They were one of his most precious people, he remembered the pure rage that flowed through him during the USJ. The bruises on their bodies, the dried up blood and their weakened auras had caused him to pour out everything he had. It didn't take a genius to understand what that meant, but he couldn't bring himself to focus on that part of his life. Right now, if he brought any one of them into his life, they might become targets for all for one. His very own house was continuously monitored by a group of elites, to ward off any villains who'd attempt to kidnap his mother. It was a security concern that was managed by his sensei himself, just so that Azuka could gain peace of mind. All of this fueled Azuka's desire to get stronger, to finally repay everyone for their kindness, for not taking advantage of him, for nurturing him. Maybe after all of that, he could focus on himself and carry out Shimura and Nana's dream himself. Izuka shook his head as he tightened his grip on Momo's hand and walked towards where their friends were. The entire field lit up in a golden glow as Izuka unrestrainedly channeled ether to the surroundings, empowering everyone in the radius. Soon enough, war cries were heard as everyone dropped their training and went for a free-for-all competition. The sound of laughter was high in the air and it was hours later did the cheer finally die down. Soon enough everyone was in the cabin with high spirits and one could even spot Aizawa nursing a drink with a small smile on his face. On the nearby hills? It's sickening. A dark cloaked figure. To think that they send us to take care of a bunch of kids. Shut it compress, the head honcho would obviously have his reason sending us in. The figure carried a large set of blades that was bound with cloth. Tomorrow, they'll find out that how fragile this piece of theirs really is. A blue flame lit up in his arms. Then this entire world will face reform, and the word, hero, will be cleansed once more. The next day. Now kiddies, today marks the beginning of the last week of your training camp. Pixie Bob was all smiles when she spoke, but there was rather a melancholy when one looked at her face. It's hard to think that you guys were those small brats that came to us at the beginning of the month. The students themselves were holding back their sadness. Each and every one of them were thankful for the two weeks these pros dedicated for them. They were all leagues ahead of their past selves. One could see the confidence in their very bones. Their bodies were covered in grime, yet the entire students together formed an unshakable aura of power. None were more surprised than the pros themselves. Within the span of two weeks they had reconstructed themselves into hardened fighters, the daily spars, and contests had shown a remarkable change in their souls. So, today we're gonna do something special. We're gonna have a test of courage where the two classes will face off against each other in the forest in an attempt to test each other's nerves of steel. The winner, of course, gets bragging rights for the whole year. Manoma and Kurishima wasted no time in shouting out their intentions of winning the entire event, but a few capturing tapes later both of them along with the four other students were instructed to accompany him for the final week of classes, which unfortunately would cut into their fun time. The students continued their training with a renewed vigor and soon after the stars once again shone in the night sky. Class 1B was the first to enter, they were well prepared in their tactics, and there were quite a few screams from Class 1A. Izuka sadly got the shorter end of the stick and was forced to have no one as a partner, but luckily Koda had expressed his interest in the game, and tagged up with Izuku. The entirety of Class 1A had gone in except for Ida, Mineta, Ojiro, Koda and finally Izuku and Koda, yet none of them were prepared for the next set of events. The burning smell that wafted through the air was the first sign that something had gone wrong. Izuka's mind was inexplicably blank as his ether's bounded field suddenly burst into being. Izuka's eyes widened as he shot a line of ether towards Pixie Bob, but his reaction was a split second late. Izuka watched as Pixie Bob get knocked out with a bang, a chill swept throughout his body. He grabbed Koda's hand and pushed him behind. His body lit up as his majestic attire burst to life. He could sense the villains in the area. There were at least six of them nearby, and the auras of many of his classmates were horrifyingly low. His majestic attire was because he could feel the concentration of darkness in each of the villains and among them. Three had auras of absolute darkness. It felt like it was staring into an abyss. Get everyone going, Midoriya. Keep them safe. And do not engage in combat. 
The villains, Magna and Spinner, had just introduced themselves and immediately after Mandalay's shouts reached everyone's heads as her quirk activated, Izuka's body stiffened under the command. But he didn't fall back. Ida, take Koda and the others. Run along the path where we came from there's no one blocking it, Mandalay tells Sensei to head into the woods as soon as possible. There's a lot of our classmates in danger, make sure he gets them to safety. Ida's and Mandalay's face was covered in shock as Izuku ignored a pro's order and instead gave out commands of his own. Mandalay's face turned ugly, but before she could reprimand him Spinner took the initiative. She tried to block the attack but was surprised to see it getting intercepted by a barrage of golden swords. Mandalay, there are at least six villains here. You need to trust us, me, Katsuki and Shoto are your best deterrents against a battle of power, and there are three villains that are more powerful than any of the others. And one of them is behind Magna. Almost as soon as he said those words a bone-chilling laugh echoed in the area. The figure discarded his cloak and a writhing mass of muscles were shown under the moonlight. The remaining pussycats and Koda immediately registered who the villain was. There was a heaviness in their chests, as if they were weighed down by an invisible force. The villain shot towards the downed heroes while a fist pulled back. Izuka's ether reacted immediately and countered the pressure, and with a burst, Izuka let loose his most powerful physical blow. Meteor smash! The villain was unprepared for the sudden counter from Izuku, and was unprepared for the overwhelming power of the punch which sent him crashing into a tree. Ida! Run now! Get them to safety and stay safe! Izuka let loose a roar as he rushed towards the downed villain who was no longer laughing. Instead, all the muscle fibers exploded outwards and covered his body. This time the clash caused a wave of wind to originate. That was a good punch, kid. Muscular's face was twisted into a bloodthirsty smile. I'm gonna enjoy breaking you, before handing you over to the head honcho. Izuka's eyes widened when the villain grabbed his arm and threw him deeper into the forest, breaking a dozen trees with his own body. Mandalay cursed herself at stalling but she couldn't deny the truth in Izuka's words. Against villains of muscular's caliber, they were utterly useless. Their only hope was Pixie Bob, who was unconscious and then the three students who could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. Mandalay couldn't believe the risk she was taking. Ida, go listen to Izuku. At this stage, we can only hope for help to arrive. Ida spared a final glance at the direction where Izuku and muscular went off to, before grabbing Koda and running away. The others soon following, Mandalay exchanged blows with Spinner, while Tiger kept Magna on the defensive. With Izuku. Izuku's entire body shook as he clashed again with Muscular. He knew what did was stupid. Facing off a villain of Muscular's caliber was synonymous with suicide. But he had no other choice. The pros other than Aizawa Sensei could never hope to restrain him. Muscular was nothing short of a demon. And against a three-on-three -three fight, the remaining pussycats and Izuku would be too overwhelmed. That was why Izuku decided to take Muscular to a secluded place. Izuku's plan was simple. Get all of Muscular's attention on him and run directly to camp and intercept Aizawa Sensei. Currently, all he had to do was keep Muscular occupied until he could sense Aizawa Sensei nearby. He was stretching his mental abilities to the thinnest, readying himself to escape at a tip of the hat. But Muscular was not making it easy. Each strike was vicious. Each one carried an intent to kill or at least to cripple. Izuku was pushing his body to the limit, Olefe and Ether flooded his veins till each strike was capable of breaking down mountains. Muscular was laughing the entire time, every strike was accompanied by a flurry of curses. Each one of them goading him to get stronger and stronger, else he would rampage through the forest killing anyone he saw. He couldn't feel the presence of Aizawa Sensei, and his entire plan revolved around Aizawa Sensei and his quirk. This is amazing! Muscular was roaring with battle lust as he fought Izuku. He was giving it his all in this kid dash. No, this warrior was giving as good as he got. The blood in his veins was flowing with adrenaline. This was what he signed up for. To be able to fight unrestrained, to hold nothing back. Midoriya! You're amazing! You piece of shit! I can't wait till I beat you! This is the best fight I've had in my entire life! You better not lose any time soon! I want to enjoy this as much as possible. Izuka could feel his bones grind against each other. Each and every strike was like a double-edged blade. His ether was healing his muscles and bones faster and faster. Each strike was causing him to lose the feeling in his arms. 
This monster in front of him refused to leave him even a second of breathing space, forcing him to fight in close quarters the entire time. Izuku was restricted from using any of Aoi attacks due to the forest, and the ill chance of him accidentally striking someone who may have escaped his sense of perception, but there was also the fact he actually couldn't gather the time to actually unleash such an attack. Each and every second was filled the earth-shattering sounds of fists colliding and the roars of the two combatants. Izuku's heart was beating a mile a minute, there was no way for him to continue such a high-level battle for more than a few more minutes. The only glad thing was that the aura of his classmates had stabilized. He prayed to every deity that they could weather this storm. Izuka sensed his reserves of ether declining at an inconceivable rate. His bones and muscles were breaking apart and snapping back together almost instantaneously. His roars were a mix of pain and adrenaline. The ether was no longer contained by his mind. Each drop of it was squeezed to every nook and corner of his body slowly mixing in with his majestic attire. While the healing was negating any drop in his battle power, the echoes of pain were slowly becoming unbearable. He knew he had no scope of winning in this fight. All he could do was hold on. It was only when he felt a second presence of evil did he realize he'd been duped. Izuku swerved past one of Muscular's punches and prepared himself for an escape until he heard the telltale cries of Koda. He looked to see a man with a patchwork face, holding Koda by the neck. Izuka had to restrain himself when he saw the bruises that littered Koda's frame. An oppressive aura descended onto the field. At its origin stood Izuku. Golden wisps of energy escaped his body. To anyone, it was clear that Izuku resembled more of an angry god than a man. TCH, don't get cocky, kid. Make one move and we'll see how fast this kid can turn to ashes. With that he tightened his grip around the back of Koda's neck, causing a whimper to escape his lips. Muscular looked at the man with a sneer on his face. Oi, Dobby, what's the big deal? I thought this was my target until you finished up all the other pests. It was easy for anyone to see that there was no camaraderie between the two of them, yet Izuka noticed none of that as he formulated as many plans as he could to escape the current situation. He was worried about Ida and the others, he didn't know whether or not they were all right. Moreover, he was worried about Koda. With a single look Izuku understood that Koda was roughened up much worse than he let on. Looking between the two villains, Izuku was at a loss on what to do. Keep it quiet you muscle-brained idiot. This kid isn't some toy you can break and throw away. We have special instructions to make sure he was brought back in one piece. Dalby glared at the frame of Muscular. Izuku at the same time was cursing his luck at the situation. Muscular on the other hand was angry. This was the first fight where he could let loose. This kid was the best opponent he faced in his entire life. He walked towards Dabi whose eyes never left Izuka's frame. Look here, Midoriya. All you have to do is accompany us towards where Shigaraki is staying. We assure you, the moment you give yourself up we'll retract all our forces and we'll free this brat. Izuka's mind slowly thought about what Dabi said. In a position like this there was no way for him to gain victory over the two of these villains. He was about to speak when he suddenly heard Muscular again. I back off pipsqueak. I'm not done with the brat yet. And until our fight is over you gonna stay the fuck away. Muscular grabbed Dobby's head and started to squeeze. Dobby's eyes widened but it was useless as his head burst like a bubble and his body returned to mud. Muscular wiped the remaining mud away from his hand and looked at a shell-shocked Izuku. He snorted before looking at the kid that scurried away from him towards Izuku. Muscular raised his arm to catch the brat but was suddenly caught off guard by a blast of gold. He saw that the kid had actually blasted him show that the horned brat could reach. Why? Why did you kill your teammate just so you could continue to fight with me? Izuka's ether was already healing the various injuries present in Koda's body. Sparing no expense he flooded the small body with ether allowing a peaceful smile to rest on Koda's which heavily contrasted with the tear-filled eyes. His mind slowly registering the dullness of his ether, he bit his lip as his body began to feel sluggish. Hey, you think that zombie would die that easily? He's one of the strongest bastards on the team. I just didn't want him to spoil our fun. The only way you're getting out of here is over my dead body. Muscular's words caused a shiver to run down his spine. Izuku watched as Muscular dip his hands into his pockets and pull out a blackened eye. Play time's over. We're against the clock so I'm gonna get serious now. Izuka's eyes widened as the aura around Muscular suddenly changed. No longer was it a raging wildfire. Instead, it was like a still lake. Izuka's body broke into a cold sweat, 
this time muscular was a hundred times more dangerous than before. He'd seen the same expression on Katsuki. This was the look of a man who'd caused the devil to take a step back. Koda! Run! Run as far as you can away from here! Get Aizawa sensei to come! No matter what happens, don't stay here! Izuku didn't wait for a response, as he saw muscular rush at him with an insane level of speed. Izuku flooded his limbs to the uppermost limits of his power. He could hear the grating of the bones against one another. Each movement was placing more of a burden on his already failing healing factor. Yet the power trade-off was well worth it. Twenty percent of OFA's stock of power, in tandem with the celestial force of ether. Izuka blurred from his position and met the strike head-on. That's right, Midoriya. Fight me head-on. Let's find out who's stronger. Me or you. Izuka understood that Muscular had lost all reason. He wasn't paying attention to any of his injuries. His mind was only focused on beating Izuku. This is the best. Do you know how fucking fragile these worms that call themselves heroes are? Izuku spat blood as a punch broke through his guard. Muscular didn't let up as his arm reared back for another haymaker. But you're different from them, aren't ya? You can take it. You're not like those wussies. The punch was barely deflected by Izuku's own strike, causing it to miss his head by a couple of inches. Izuku let loose a roar as he went in for a body blow. He felt his punch land solidly against the softer part near the kidney. The resulting force caused Muscular to fall to his knees after stumbling a few feet away. You're a monster, aren't ya? Muscular's face was twisted into a bloody grin as he spoke. That's right, you're just like me. Our strength isn't just because of our training. You're a natural-born monster. Those moves were things that would take years to see, more years to develop, and even more to perfect. Muscular roared with almost deranged laughter. But you, you managed to do it at this age. Izuku's breathing was heavily labored. Every breath felt as if it would be his last as he stared at the monster in front of him. The sole reason he was able to survive all this time was due to the accumulated memories that took over his body. Each time his body fought, it was being invaded by the accumulated memories of a hero. With each strike his abilities were being tempered. He would never be at this level without the help of the others. But I want more. Last time you were fighting for the sake of your friends, weren't you? Should I go kill them first? Muscular immediately charged towards the frozen form of Kota who had not moved a single step since the beginning of the fight. The oppressive aura, the meeting of his parents' murderer, and the fact that his idol was fighting for his life was all too much for the five-year-old. Kota! Izuka's body blurred from his position, the very earth cracking beneath his feet. Izuka slammed himself against Muscular's body crashing him against a tree. Your enemy is me! I won't let you harm anyone else. Izuku was slowly losing his grip on his rage. It was a sore point whenever a villain or anyone mentioned harming the people he cared about and harming children. His rage that he always controlled was slipping. That's right, get angrier. Get stronger and stronger. Let's have some real fun. Muscular had long since abandoned any semblance of sanity, completely losing himself in the pure thrill of the fight. He would do so until he annihilated the person in front of him and until doing so he would use any methods needed to squeeze out every bit of strength from the warrior in front of him. Izuka couldn't help but take a step back. This psychopath had no regard for his own life. If Izuka was honest with himself, this person scared him. He was ruthless. He would use any means necessary to reach his goals, from beginning to end, not caring about anything else other than the goal. Izuka knew that if he fell in battle today, there wouldn't be anyone else who could stop muscular. Koda watched on as Izuka fought against the murderer. Each time they clashed, the resulting shockwaves would be deafening, each one carrying enough force to sway the trees that stood tall for decades. Even though he stood behind the largest one of them, he could still feel the monstrous strength behind the blows. He had lost track of time ever since the fight began. This clash between them may have well been hours or even a scant few minutes. He wouldn't know the difference, even though he saw countless heroes and villains fight on the TV. The difference was as far apart as the sky and the earth, the clothes he wore stuck to skin, sweat poured down his face, his heart was beating in such an erratic manner, and even breathing placed a tremendous strain on his body. But no matter how hard he tried, no matter what he did, he couldn't move. Fear had locked him into place, the fear of dying, the fear that the monster that fought against Izuka would chase after him. But what he was most fearful of was losing his hero. He was someone who saved him, 
who brought light to the darkness he was surrounded with. In these two weeks, Izuku had utterly saved him from himself. Koda didn't care if it was because of his abilities or because of any cheap tricks. The moment he saw his parents once more, the moment he heard his mother speak to him, it was enough. In this forest, where he had no idea where they were, or where anyone else was, he was prepared to die with his hero, he would not hesitate. Because if Izuku died, then what was left? None of the others had gotten through to him before, but Izuku did, and that was why Koda considered him his hero, not because of his power, or his connections, solely because Izuku cared enough, was stubborn enough to climb over his walls and save him. Izuku needed more. His power, as astonishing as it was to the others, was being evenly matched and surpassed by muscular. With each clash he could feel it, he was slowly losing ground. Each strike was losing energy bit by bit, it didn't surprise him one bit. He had been using his abilities non-stop since the battle began, he had been operating at his peak for the entire duration of the battle, simultaneously using 20% OFA and his ether, then the continuous breaking and healing of his bones and muscles had finally got to him. His muscles were burning, each movement was accompanied by an indescribable torrent of anguish and pain. His ether was trying its utmost to repair his body, but the accumulation of damage was far greater than his healing factor. If not for the dull glow of the majestic attire one would see the countless ugly bruises and scratches that dripped blood. Izuka had long since given up on a battle of attrition, he was trying his hardest to knock muscular out. But, against absolute strength, all manner of trickery and techniques were meaningless. There was no grace in muscular's attacks and movements, he was a rabid berserker that traded his rationality for pure unstoppable power. Izuka made no mistake in thinking that he would remain standing if one of those blows struck. Even if his body was a thousand times more durable, and his powers restored back to their peak, against the tyrannous might of the blows muscular launched he wouldn't remain standing. He was slowing down more and more, slowly it began to show. Izuka's offensive crumbled and soon enough Izuka was focusing on defense alone. This, of course, got muscular's attention. What happened, Midoriya? Don't tell me you're winded from this. Though he said this, muscular himself wasn't faring much better. Numerous pains shot all over his body, yet the pure battle lust drove him forward. Izuku didn't speak, his chances at winning were already stretched thin. His only hope was to catch Muscular off guard and finish him in one blow. His mind had already decided the actions he needed to take, yet the sheer stupidity of such actions left him hesitating. But he steeled his heart and prepared his final stand. All the ether on his body shone with a renewed life and rushed towards his left arm encasing it a cocoon of gold. Muscular paid the change no mind as he swung his right arm towards Izuku. It was only when the punch was caught and the golden aura locked the arm to Izuku's did a small speck of fear ingrain itself in his heart. Izuku paid no heed to the thoughts of his opponent. In a fight like this every second mattered. While Muscular was immobilized, for now, he didn't know how long it would hold. It all depended on his next strike. Izuku's right arm burst with power like a surging river OFA flooded his arm. This was his final trump card, this would be his last stand. Muscular could see that this strike would be different from the rest, yet it was all too late as the strike connected. Meteor smash! The entire area was buffeted with a solid wall of air that uprooted everything in the vicinity. Trees that towered over them and withstood the test of time were utterly powerless against the effect of Izuku's most powerful strike. Koda was lifted from his feet and was about to be launched far off, but was saved from that future by Izuku whose broken left arm hugged the boy close to him. Koda stared at the broken down frame of his hero, who stood with a broken left arm, and purple bruises that lined up everywhere, the blood which was predominant everywhere and worst of all was Izuku's right arm which was mangled beyond belief. Blood poured down the arm and to the ground without stopping, in fact, it looked like the blood vessels burst from inside of the skin. It's all right, Koda Kun. Koda looked to see a tired smile on Izuka's face. It might look bad now, but I'll be right as rain tomo dash. Izuka stopped midway through as a chill worked its way down his spine. How? The sound of twigs breaking rang as a figure walked through the dust clouds caused by the aftermath of Izuka's last ditch effort. The form of muscular soon made its view in the fear stricken eyes of Koda and Izuku. Muscular's mouth was still dripping blood as the front of his chest was dyed red with a visible imprint of Izuku's fist. That was a good punch there, Izuku. 
Muscular's words were enough for Koda to fall to his knees, eyes wide as if he had just met the devil. Izuka fared no better as his mind couldn't grasp the fact that Muscular, even after the entirety of the battle was able to survive a 100% smash, that was no less powerful than one of All Might's blows. You've been holding back on me, Izuku, if it were anyone else that punch would have done them in. Muscular steps were slow, but each one caused Izuka's heartbeat to slow, the situation as hopeless. Izuka's eyes dulled, the golden orbs that shone with power were now utterly spent. His ether was so spent that couldn't even feel a sliver of it, the pain was the only thing keeping him awake. His mind was blank, at this stage there really was nothing to do, their fight would have attracted enough attention to show their location yet none of the teachers or the villains arrived, which meant that the fight was still going one with each of them preoccupied with the other. A whimper caused Izuka to look back. A flicker of light returned to his eyes as he stared at Koda. Izuka couldn't let him die here. He had his entire life ahead of him. Izuka back straightened as he stood in front of Koda. Both Muscular and Koda were surprised at this. A torrent of power was unleashed once more as Izuka's muscles bulged. Muscular grinned as his fibers covered him once more he prepared himself for their final round. Izuka's mind was exceptionally clear now, there was doubt in his head. He was a hero, and now he had someone to save. He couldn't fall now until Koda was safe he'll struggle against Muscular, he'll use everything to delay him. And maybe someone would save them. Why? The tiniest voice escaped Koda's throat. Please stop this. We can't win against him, let's both just run. We'll hide in the forest, or at my base. Anywhere is better than fighting that guy head on. Koda's shouts carried with it a sense of pleading, begging Izuka to listen to him. Izuka ignored the cries as his eyes never left Muscular who seemed to be preparing himself. It's not a matter of running away Kodakun if I leave now, the rest of my friends will die. And that would be on my head, if my actions were to save even one of them, then I have to do it. Koda gazed at the back of Izuku, his eyes blurry with tears saw the silhouettes of his parents right beside him. Please, not again. I can't lose someone again. Please listen to me. Muscular at that moment engaged Izuka with a full-powered punch. The tendrils of muscle fibers were like snakes as they writhed against each other. The power behind that punch was colossal. Izuka wasted no time as he reared his right arm and flooded it with all the power he could channel. Run, Kota! Run back to camp! Just run! The following clash drowned away all sound. Izuka couldn't hear anything other. He could only see the writhing tendrils of muscles that threatened to swallow him over. The sounds slowly filtered back in as heard muscular shout. What happened, Izuku? That's weaker than before. The mass of tendrils was both a shield and a spear. The damage of Izuku's strike was being transferred over a large area, lessening the damage. Izuku had no idea how much longer he could hold out. His arm was straining to hold muscular back. Each passing second was agony. The pain resonated to every nook and corner of his very soul. Muscular's roars drowned everything out. Izuka could feel his consciousness begin to fade, his body gone well past its limits. It was a battered mass of bruises that it could no longer support itself. Show me your blood! The intensity of the punch finally threw Izuka to the ground, a cloud of dust debris lifting into the air, but even still both sides didn't let up. Muscular wanting to absolutely destroy his opponent and Izuka resisting with his weakening body. Izuku's mind was struggling to push out any semblance of power into the body. The soul's cape usually lit by the sun was now embraced in the cold, unfeeling darkness. Izuku was closer to death than he ever was. His power had been thoroughly spent. This fight had taken everything out of him. He could feel his body becoming colder and colder. At this moment amidst all the pain and coldness, his thoughts were jumping to the people he held close to his heart to All Might and the inheritance his sensei had given him. The surging river that was OFA slowly reduced in intensity causing Muscular to gain more ground. To his friends who he had spent the best year of his life with. The force of the blow slowly burying him deeper and deeper into the ground, his arms desperately and subconsciously fighting back. To the image of his mother, eyes red, as she hugged him for dear life. The final flickers of OFA finally died, even though his mind desperately fought against it, the darkness crept up swallowing him whole. Stop it, you monster! On hearing those words, Izuka felt a drop of water on his forehead. His hazy mind unconsciously focused on what he was hearing. Don't worry, you brat. You're next. 
Izuku's mind through the pain and anguish finally connected the dots. Koda. He was still here, Koda was still here. In the bleary darkness that threatened to consume him, a single thought relentlessly pushed itself to the surface. Koda is still here. Izuku's eyes shot open, focusing on the bloodthirsty grin on Muscular's face. Both of his arms were suppressing Izuku to the ground. Izuku knew, he knew what Muscular was thinking. He could see the bloodlust clouding his eyes, he was going to kill Kota. Izuku tried to concentrate on his power, he desperately searched for a speck of it. Anything that would help him, anything could force his broken body move, to fight, because he still needed to save Kota. Save him, Midoriya Izuku. There was no grand rush of revitalizing energy. His ether didn't rush forward to his aid. Instead, inside his soul's cape, in the absence of his ether, the sky which was darkening lit up in a flurry of colors. High above the sky, far away from his sun, was a myriad color that slowly descended downwards before stopping at different positions. From each was the birth of another star, a chain creation of eight stars each one giving off its own vibrant color. And from the farthest of stars, a beam of fire shot out and connected to the next sun and added more power before coming to the next until finally, it crashed onto his own Sunday. The dying embers were revitalized and a warmth spread throughout his body. OFA amplified whatever remained of his reserves of ether but more importantly, it gave him power. The darkness that threatened to swallow him was pushed back. The pain that tormented him was forced into submission. Strength flowed through his limbs and his mind finally regained control. Through it all, he heard a voice, one that was tired but determined. This power was meant to save. Muscular was about to move when suddenly he felt movement underneath his arms. Nothing could mask the surprise that showed on his face. This kid who had broken himself over and over again still had something left to give. The split second he took to think was all that Azuki needed. A roar tore through his sore throat as the flood of energy forcibly reopened his pathways. His broken body under the rush of adrenaline and power stood up to the tyrant that wanted to kill. It was a scene that reenacted the stories of old, where the hero fought against the monster that stood before him, where he called forth all of his strength to vanquish the monster and protect the innocent. There was not even a second for Muscular to even process the drastic change that occurred on the battlefield, a violent punch that surpassed all others. It was a straightforward punch, yet it carried the strength of a thousand men. Megaton smash. The punch completely broke through any guard that Muscular put up, and as he sailed through the air crashing through the trees, he gazed on the figure of his opponent, one covered in blood and bruises, one that carried the most severe of injuries. He remembered his name. Midoriya Izuku. There was a loud bang as Izuku watched the body finally stop after breaking through a dozen trees. His feeble senses alerted him that Muscular was still alive. He waited for a few seconds, his body tensed ready to counter-attack, yet the body didn't budge. He won. And that's a wrap, my luminous legends. If you enjoyed this electrifying journey into the world of What if Deku had light powers, the movie final part? Smash that like button, share with your fellow hero enthusiasts, and comment down below with your wildest, what if, scenarios. I want to hear em all. Big thanks to Mugen Erisher for being the real MVP of today's video. If you're new here, join the squad by subscribing and hit that notification bell, so you never miss our next adventure. Until next time, keep being the radiant, unstoppable force that you are. This is Kronos, signing off. Stay legendary.